Section 15 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4, Richelieu, by Stanley Leeds, Part 1. On the death of Henry IV, his far-reaching designs were laid aside, and the energy of the government of France was expended for some years in shifts, expedients, and temporary measures of self-preservation. The proposed invasion of Navarre was ignored by the tacit consent of both states concerned. The attack upon Milan was abandoned, and the ambitions of the Duke of Savoy were frustrated. The French government contented itself with affording him so much support as preserved him from the vengeance of Spain. The War of the Ulich Succession, which has been narrated in a previous volume, was dexterously confined to the narrowest limits. The great army, which Henry IV had assembled for purposes of which he alone had been fully cognizant, was in part disbanded, and a small force of 8,000 foot and 1,200 horse joined the Dutch and German contingents in the siege of Ulich. When the town had surrendered, September 1st, 1610, this force was withdrawn, and the disputed territories were left to Brandenburg and Neuburg, the princes in possession. In stipulating for the maintenance of the Catholic religion in the pacified duchies, the French government followed perhaps the course which the late king would have approved, and certainly that which was most likely to preserve the peace. Meanwhile, measures had been taken to carry on the affairs of France. Immediately on the death of the king, his ministers, too cautious to take a definite decision on their own responsibility, appealed to the Parliament of Paris, and that body, nothing loath to exercise a political function, at once declared the Queen Mother, Mary de' Medici, to be the lawful regent. This decree was confirmed on the following day, in a lit de justice, at which the little king, Louis XIII, appeared, May 15, 1610. The new regent retained her husband's ministers in their appointments. The routine business of state was transacted by Sierry, the Chancellor, Villoy, and Ginon. Sully, on his master's death, bethought him of the many enemies whom he had made, and retired for safety to the Bastille. Reassured as to his personal security, he afterwards joined the government and retained his posts. His unpopularity, however, told against him. His overweening temper alienated his colleagues, and early in 1611 he was forced to resign his financial control, though retaining his offices of Grand Master of the Artillery and of Commissioner for Ways and Communications, with his government of Poitou. The finances were then put in commission under a board of which Jeannin was the head. But the old ministry, competent and even excellent under the direction of a strong king, was incapable of governing or of inspiring a weak ruler with method, resolution and wisdom. The princes of the blood and other magnates cabaled against the regent, against each other and against the ministry. The ministers, in their turn, could devise only transitory palliatives. Discontented interests were appeased by gifts of money, of places and of pensions. Such appetites grow by what they devour, and the hordes of Henry IV began to melt away. A chronic deficit appeared in the place of an annual surplus. The ministers endeavoured to please everyone, and no one was satisfied. In these conditions, a vigorous foreign policy was out of the question. Opposition to the Habsburg powers, Spain and Austria, could only lead to undesirable complications. The Queen's ministers aimed at an understanding with Spain. Early in 1612, plans for a double marriage between the royal houses of France and Spain began to be seriously discussed. In August of that year, it was settled that Louis XIII should marry Anne, the eldest Spanish princess. This indication that old hostilities were abandoned smoothed, for the time, the path of the French ministry. The governments, acting together, maintained a precarious peace in the north of Italy in spite of the restless ruler of Savoy. But the Protestant and independent allies of Henry IV, the United Provinces, the German princes, Venice, and the minor Italian powers, were alarmed and alienated. The Huguenots feared and resented the reactionary influence of Spain, and their assemblies at Saumur, 1611, and La Rochelle, 1612-13, 
pressed for an extension of safeguards and privileges. The weakness of the government invited contempt. Its policy of doles excited cupidity. Real grievances were not wanting. And, early in 1614, some of the most important princes, the Prince of Condé, the Duke of Nevers, the Duke of Mayenne, son of the famous leader of the League, the Duke of Longueville, the Duke of Vendôme, and the Duke of Bouillon, withdrew from the court and issued a manifesto against the government, charging it with incompetence, maladministration, and unconstitutional conduct, calling in question the policy of the Spanish marriages, and demanding a meeting of the three estates. The League of Princes was a formidable combination. The Prince of Condé, though dissolute, inexperienced and worthless, was yet the first prince of the blood of the Governor of Guienne. The Duke of Nevers was Governor of Champagne. The Duke of Longueville, descendant of the royal bastard Dunois, was Governor of Picardy. Vendôme, the illegitimate son of Henry IV, was Governor of Brittany. The Duke of Bouillon was the most experienced soldier of the kingdom. He was still a power amongst the Huguenots, and his sovereign principality of Sedan was conveniently in touch with his German friends. The government determined to treat. Terms were arranged at saint Manahul, May 15, 1614. Money compensations were freely distributed, and a meeting of the estates was to be summoned, which assembled at Paris in October. In the interval, an armed expedition to Brittany against the Duke of Vendôme had shown that the government still held the master cards if they dared to use them. In September, the king reached the age of 13 and his legal majority, but the queen continued to exercise the royal power. The Assembly of Estates, of which such high expectations had been professed, led to little or no result. The Third Estate, still mindful of the murder of Henry IV, and of the doctrines set forth by Mariana and Bellamar in books condemned by the Parliament, put in the forefront of their carrière a declaration of fundamental law. The King, holding his crown of God alone, there is no power on earth, spiritual or temporal, which has any right over his kingdom, to deprive thereof the consecrated persons of the king, or to absolve their subjects from the fealty or obedience which they owe, on any ground or pretext whatsoever. The clergy resented this encroachment upon their sphere, and some, perhaps, the direct attack on papal authority. A violent quarrel ensued in which the parliament also took part, and the government was compelled to close the discussion without deciding the question. The nobles and the clergy demanded the abolition of the Paulette, thereby striking at the hereditary rights of the official members of the Third Estate, who constituted the great majority of its representatives. In retaliation, the Third Estate demanded the suppression of pensions and the correction of abuses in the Church. The clergy demanded the publication of the decrees of the Council of Trent, which the Third Estate opposed. Confronted with the urgent need of financial reform, for it appeared that the normal expenditure was 35 millions against 32 millions of receipts, and that the pension fund had increased from 3 millions to 5.5 since the death of Henry, and the general expenses by 4 millions, the estates proposed to suppress the Paulette, which involved a loss of a million and a half per annum, to reduce the tie and abolish the sale of offices. But no means were suggested to meet the existing or the resulting deficit except the institution of a chamber of justice to deal with the malversions of financiers. The Spanish marriages were generally approved. After waiting until March 1615 for an answer to their representations, the estates were dismissed with a promise of consideration and a pledge that pensions should be diminished, a chamber of justice set up, and the venality of officers abolished. But none of these promises was put into effect. The Paulette was suspended for a time, but was soon restored. The last assembly of the estates summoned before 1789 had been intended by some to embarrass the government, by others perhaps to relieve the real disorders of France. The embarrassment was less than had been hoped. Relief there was none. Disappointed in the results of the meeting of the estates, the opposition continued their intrigues. Immediately after the dispersal of the delegates, the Parliament of Paris issued a decree inviting princes, dukes, peers and officers of the crown to attend a meeting of the parliament 
and discussed measures to be taken for the service of the king, the relief of his subjects, and the good of the state. This bold intrusion into the sphere of government was promptly resented by the ministers, and a prolonged dispute followed in which the parliament was not altogether worsted. In the course of the discussion, May 22nd, the parliament called for the exclusion of foreigners from the government of provinces and from military officers. This demand gave the note of the ensuing struggle. The attack was now unmasked. It had become an open assault on the position of the Queen Mother's principal confidants, Concino Concini and his wife Leonora Gallagai, through whom his power and influence had been obtained. Leonora had come to France in the suite of Mary de' Medici at the time of her marriage. As her lady-in-waiting, she had won and successfully retained an unrivalled power over her mistress. The Italian adventurer whom she married in 1602 had shared her ascendancy and had used his powers during the first years of the reign chiefly for the advancement of his private fortune and that of his friends. It was reckoned later that the pair had accumulated in seven years nine millions of livres. One of the first acts of the regents was to purchase for her favourite the Marquisate de Vancres, the governments of Peron, Roy, Montdidier, and the office of First Gentleman of the Chamber. Later, he had received the government of Amiens and the post of Marshal, 1613. This accumulation of offices and dignities and patronage had aroused jealousy, and the Marshal was gradually forced, in order to protect his private interests, to take part in politics. His position in Picardy had brought him into collision with the Duke of Longueville, whom he wished entirely to supplant in that province with an eye, perhaps, to communications with the Spanish Netherlands, and he was personally odious to most of the discontented princes. Thus, when the princes in August once more openly raised the standard of rebellion, they designated Concini openly as the principal object of, of their enmity. The court, in spite of the gathering storm, had decided to start for the south to solemnise the Spanish marriages and to exchange the princesses. While the royal cortege and its protecting army slowly moved on its way, Condé and Bouillon marched through France, watched but hardly impeded by the Marshal de Buidauphin to Poitou. Meanwhile, a Protestant assembly, authorised for Grenoble, had, without warrant, removed to Nîmes, whence it was later transferred to La Rochelle. The jealousies of Sui and Bouillon had destroyed the influence of both with their party, and a new leader had come to the front in Henry, Duke of Rohan, who had married Sui's daughter and shared his influence in Poitou. Upright, generous, eloquent and capable, Rohan is perhaps the most sympathetic figure in Huguenot history. He now, for once, as he confessed later, took up arms in an unworthy cause, the cause of the Prince of Condé. But, although he succeeded in rousing rebellion in Guienne, the Cévennes, and Languedoc, he was not strong enough to oppose the passage of the royal escort. The marriages were solemnised by proxy in October at Bordeaux and Burgo, and on November 9th, the princesses were exchanged. When the court at length turned northwards again, they had to face an armed, a successful, but not a resolute rebellion. Poitou was in the hands of Condé and of Rohan, who had now joined him. The ministry once more chose the path of negotiation. A conference was called to meet at Loudun. After deliberations which lasted from February until May 1616, a peace was at length arranged on the usual basis of general amnesty, a distribution of public money, and concession to the principal leaders. In the settlement, Protestant interests were almost completely ignored. Concini left Picardy to Longueville and received Normandy instead. It was secretly agreed that Siri, the Chancellor, and one or two less conspicuous ministers should be sacrificed. Concini's escape had been a narrow one, and he felt that vigorous measures were needed. He determined to set up a strong ministry on which he could depend. Not only Siri, but Jeannin and Villeroy were to be suspended. The head of the new government was Barbin, a man of obscure origin, closely attached to the Concini, capable and courageous, and, 
Condé was persuaded to return to Paris, that either his moderation might assist the government or his arrogance might give them a pretext. The pretext was not lacking. The prince's insolence suggested that he was aiming at the throne. He ostentatiously withdrew his protection from Concini, who with retired to Normandy. But the counterstroke quickly followed. On September the 1st, the prince was arrested at the Louvre, and shortly afterwards he was imprisoned at the Bastille. The new ministry had shown its courage. Its capacity was still to be proved. Concini returned to Paris, where the mob had sacked his house. The arrest of Condé was followed by the general exodus of princes. This time, the Duke of Nevers in Champagne, abandoning his favourite project of a crusade against the Turks, with Bouillon and Longueville, formed the centre of resistance. Babon was the man to meet such emergencies, but he needed stronger backing. The ministry was recast, and on November 30th, 1616, Richelieu became Minister of State, charged with the departments of foreign affairs and war. Jean Armand Duplessis de Richelieu was now in his 32nd year. On his father's side, he was noble, of a Poitevin family. His mother was the daughter of an advocate in the Parliament of Paris. His father had done good service under Henry III and became Grand Provost of the Royal Household and Knight of the Holy Ghost. After his death in 1590, Armand, his youngest son, was at first educated as a layman. But in 1602, he was called upon to leave the academy where he was receiving the usual soldierly training of his class and fit himself for the family bishopric at Luçon. In 1606, he was formally nominated to this bishopric. In 1607, he went to Rome and was dispensed by the Pope from the canonical rule of age. And in 1608, he took up his duties in the see. Here, with a vigilant eye fixed on the court and on politics, he performed his pastoral duties, studied, wrote and reflected, and formed some of his few friendships. Here he met the Capuchin, François de Tremblay, better known as Père Joseph, with whom he was to be so closely associated in later years. De Vergier de Rouen, later Abbé of saint cyrin whom he afterwards found it necessary to imprison, and the family of Boutillier, his faithful servants. His friends procured his election in 1614 as delegate for the clergy of Poitou, and he was already so far distinguished as to be chosen to make the final address on behalf of the clergy when their career was presented. His first court office was that of Grand Almoner to the young Queen Anne, which he took up on her entry into Paris in 1616. He was employed in the summer of 1616 to induce the Prince of Condé to return to Paris. In six months, he must have won the confidence of the Queen Mother and of Concini, as whose creature he makes his entry on the great stage. But in the acts of his five months ministry, his own individuality is strongly marked. Abroad, the situation was more menacing than it had been since the death of Henry IV. Venice was at war with Archduke Ferdinand of Styria, Milan was threatening Savoy. Before the end of December, Le Dijuier, governor of Dauphiné, acting on his own initiative, crossed the Alps with an army to aid Savoy against the Spaniards. A breach of Spain seemed imminent, and, on the other hand, the old allies of France had been alienated by the Spanish marriages. Into these complications, Richelieu had not time to introduce order, but his first acts are significant. He sent envoys to Germany, Holland, England and Switzerland to explain away the Spanish marriages. He asserted, with more vigour than judgment, French interests in the Valtelline. He tolerated the action of Le Dijuier. Subservience to Spain was at an end. At home, equal energy and determination were shown. Three armies were quickly mustered and directed against the Confederates in the east. A stinging manifesto set their action before the public in its true light. It was pointed out that in six years, Condé had received three millions and a half, Nevers a million and a half, Longueville one million two hundred thousand, Mayenne two millions, Bouillon one million, 
Vendôme 600,000 leaves from the royal treasury. The policy of the regency was vindicated, and Richelieu, as in duty bound, formulated a defence of Concini, a more difficult task. The presence of the Duke of Rouen with the royal troops showed that nothing was at present to be feared from the Huguenot. The real weakness of the Confederates was soon seen. Pushed back, and with their principal strongholds beleaguered, they would soon have been compelled to surrender at discretion when the Barbain ministry fell with a crash. The king, under the influence of his favourite, Luin, asserted his royal will. Concini was murdered, Barbain imprisoned, and the Queen Mother ordered to retire to Blois, April 1617. Richelieu had been sufficiently adroit to win some favour or indulgence from Luine, but there was no place for him in the new regime. He decided to follow the fortunes of the Queen Mother and became, for a time, the accredited head of her council at Blois. The sudden stroke which overthrew the favourite drove the Queen Mother from power and brought the King to the exercise of the royal authority was the work of a poor gentleman, Charles d'Albert, afterwards Duke of Luynes. Born in 1578, he was introduced to the service of the king by Concini, who thought that his humble position would make him powerless for harm, while the difference of age rendered any dangerous intimacy between him and the young king improbable. But his skill in all the arts of falconry won him the king's affection, which was strengthened by his engaging manners, his handsome person, and his supple tact. He soon obtained that absolute ascendancy over the young king which a man can sometimes obtain over a boy. Louis was now old enough to resent the humiliating control of his mother and the still more humiliating control of Concini. He made Louis the confidant of his grievances and learnt from him the way to power and revenge. The plot was secretly contrived between them and successfully carried into effect. The young king showed considerable resolution and reticence in this, the first responsible act of his public life. Vengeance did not cease when Concini was dead. From his wife also, the utmost penalty was pitilessly exacted. On receipt of the news of the Concini's death, the rebellious princes laid down their arms and were admitted to pardon, or, rather, their meritorious conduct was duly recognised. It was soon seen that, though the principal personages were changed, little else was altered. The old ministers were recalled to the council. The policy of shifts and expedients was revived. The quarrels of Savoy and Milan were once more allayed by an unstable peace. Treaty of Pavia, October 9th, 1617. An assembly of notables was called to give some official recognition to the results of the revolution and to the new order. The old reforms were recommended and the old promises were renewed, but nothing was done. Condé was kept in prison. However, the time was at hand when expedients would no longer meet the situation. In 1619, the Bohemian Revolt gave France the opportunity which Henry IV, or Richelieu, would have seized, if not to strike a telling blow against Austria, at least to interpose an effective mediation. But the influence of France was so used that, by the Treaty of Alm, July 1620, between the League and the Union, Austria and Spain were left free to throw their whole force and that of their Catholic allies on Bohemia and the Palatinate. The initial advantage thus surrendered was not recovered by France until after many years of war and negotiation. At home, the family of Luin alone benefited. The favourite became a duke and peer. He succeeded to the dignities and to the spoils of Concini, even to his plans of aggrandizement in Picardy. In 1621, he became constable of France. He married a beautiful lady of the House of Rouen, afterwards famed as the Duchess of Chevreuse. His brothers shared his prosperity and rose in their turn to ducal rank. The old jealousies and discontents were thus awakened, and rebellion was always in the air. Private animosities and disappointed interests were reinforced by religious passions. For one of the first acts of the new rules was to issue an edict restoring to the church the ecclesiastical possessions in Bern, which had been, for half a century, in the hands of the Protestants. In 
This was a measure that could only be executed by force, and the king had to acquiesce for a time in the open disobedience of the provincial authorities. All discontents found a focus in the little court in Blois. The contemptible intrigues of a discredited woman and her worthless adherents would deserve little notice had they not served as Richelieu's opportunity. The only hold which the Bishop of Luçon still retained on power was through the influence he had established over the mind of Mary de' Medici. He hoped, by dexterously using his ascendancy, to win the confidence of the king and of Luin. But he soon saw that this double game was dangerous. He left the court at Blois to its own devices and retired to his bishopric. He still continued to correspond with the Queen Mother, but with caution and reserve. When a correspondence became known, which she had imprudently carried on with Barbin in prison, Richelieu, though not directly implicated, fell under suspicion. And in April 1618, he was ordered into exile at Avignon. Hence, he was suddenly recalled in March 1619 to deal with a new situation. Under the influence of the adventurers who swayed her mind in Richelieu's absence, the Queen Mother had taken a step which inconvenienced the government. She had appealed to Epinon to release her from the species of captivity which she endured at Blois. While the old courtier was hastening secretly and by forced marches from his stronghold of Metz to meet the Queen Mother in his government of Anjoumois, the plans were laid and on February 22nd Mary descended by night from a window of her castle, and on the same day was with the Duke at Loche. It would have been easy to cross the revolt by arms, but the king and the favourite preferred a less invidious course. Richelieu was summoned to bring the queen to reason. His share in the long negotiations that followed at Angoulême Ange- proved how indispensable he was. Everything was arranged to the satisfaction of the government. The Queen gave up her nominal government of Normandy, received Anjou for her residence with Ponce de Sé and Chinon, and Richelieu was established as her principal adviser. The councillors who had prompted the escapade were removed. In September, the King and his mother met, and a formal reconciliation followed. Luine and Richelieu continued on terms of veiled hostility. Luine on the defensive, Richelieu on the watch for an opportunity. Condé was released to serve as a make-weight against the Queen Mother. The shadowy hopes of a cardinal's hat, which had been held out to Richelieu, remained, and seemed likely to remain, unfulfilled. But no opposition was offered to his predominance at Angers where all chief posts were filled by his relatives and friends. Thus, in May 1620, when the periodical rising of princes recurred, Richelieu found himself dragged into rebellion. The malcontents appeared at the Queen's court. They controlled Normandy through Longueville and Brittany through Vendôme, while Anjou commanded the Loire. South of the Loire, Rouen in Poitou, and Eponon in Angoulême, joined hands with Mayenne in Guyenne. There were hope of Montmorency's accession carrying Languedoc, and the Protestants were expected to be sympathetic. It was a promising rebellion, on paper, and Richelieu did not, or could not, prevent it. But the king had the troops and the power, and he was not afraid to use them. He marched straight on Angers, the forces of the Confederates were crushed and scattered in a single battle near pont de Sey, August 7th, and the whole house of cards fell to pieces. But Richelieu knew how insecure the position of the favourite was, and snatched victory from defeat. In the conference at which he represented his mistress, he procured for her and for all concerned a complete amnesty with restitution of captured places, merely promising on her part friendly relations for the future with Louine. Richelieu had not been far from the scaffold. He emerged from his disasters with increased prestige and the definite promise of nomination as cardinal, which Louis, so so long as he lived, was careful to render nugatory. But the marriage between the niece of Richelieu and the nephew of the favourite indicated at least a desire for better relations between the pair. In 
The settlement of the dispute between the king and his mother set Louis free to intervene in Bern. His ardour for military enterprise had been stimulated by the rapid success of his recent expedition. He now marched into Bern, where he met with no armed opposition. The fortress of Navarrienne was surrendered without a blow. The edicts for the restitution of church property were enforced. Bern was united with Navarre, and both with the territories of the King of France. The Protestants were angry and alarmed, but no open resistance was attempted for the moment. However, in December 1620, an unauthorised assembly of the Protestants met at La Rochelle to consider their grievances and propose measures for their redress. The assembly determined to sit in permanence until their demands had been met. Their demands were presented, turning chiefly on the fulfilment of stipulations of the Edict of Nantes, but also requiring the restoration of the former conditions in Bern. They were, however, rejected by the king on the ground that the assembly had no permission to meet. The delegates then proceeded to divide France into eight military districts, to each of which a leader was to be assigned. Their weakness then became apparent. Les Dijuiers supported the court. Bouillon would take no active part. The other leaders suggested were without credit or talent. Among all those named, the Duke of Rouen alone had capacity, resolution and zeal. The court was eager for war. In April, the king took the field. Moving westwards, he seized the Huguenot fortresses north and south of the Loire. Saint-Jean d'Angely, Rouen's own command, resisted under the Duke of Soubise, his brother, for three weeks, and then surrendered. Meanwhile, other armies, under Condé in the centre, Mayenne in Guyenne, and Epernon in Bern, were operating, and everywhere the Huguenot strongholds were rapidly reduced. The first serious check which the royal arms received was at Montauban, where a regular siege was begun in August 1621, Rouen had made all the preparations necessary to enable the town to withstand a siege, while he himself collected men and supplies for its relief in Languedoc and the Savon. His efforts were successful, and in November the siege was raised. This was a great blow to the credit of the constable, who endeavoured to repair it by attacking the little place of Monheur. The place was taken and burned, but two days later, December 14th, Luynes, died from a fever which he had contracted during the siege. An obstacle had been removed out of Richelieu's way, but he was still far from the attainment of that high power on which his ambitions were immovably fixed. During the period which followed the death of Luynes, the king relied principally on the old ministry Siri and his son Puisseau, who had won the support of Condé. But Richelieu took a definite step forwards, when the Queen Mother was admitted to the council, where, acting under his advice, she observed an attitude of dignified reserve, taking advantage, however, of suitable opportunities to put forward propositions of policy, carefully framed and supported by argument, in which the hand of Richelieu might be easily discerned. Yet another stage was marked in Richelieu's progress when the long-standing promise was fulfilled and he became a cardinal. September 1622. Meanwhile, the war with the Protestants was renewed. Soubise was decisively beaten at the Ile of Riez in Poitou, April 1622. The danger threatened by the advance of an army under Mansfield into French territory was successfully avoided. And, after a number of minor successes, the siege of Montpellier was begun. Here, royalist prosperity ceased. But both parties were ready for peace, and on October 9th, a formal treaty between the king and the Protestants was concluded. Montpellier surrendered, and its fortifications were demolished. Protestant assemblies were forbidden for the future. The exercise of both religions, where it had been previously permitted, was restored. Of the 200 strongholds conceded to the Huguenots by the Edict of Nantes, only two, Montauban and La Rochelle, were allowed to remain in their hands.
The old Huguenot, Les Desjuiers, saw that the game was up, and in July he had purchased the constable's sword by reconciliation with the church. End of section 15. Read by Luke Hamilton, Hobart, June 2022. Section 16 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick Seaman. Chapter 4. Richelieu by Stanley Lees. Part 2. An inglorious war was now followed by a period of still more inglorious action. Sillery and Poiseau were the most incompetent of the old cabal. Burning questions were pending abroad, and the ministers were men of protocols and not of action. At length the king grew weary of them, and tried a change. In January 1624, La Vouville, who had been introduced to the finance department by Sillery's influence, succeeded in ousting and replacing his patrons, and became chief minister. But his period of supreme power did not last long. He soon found himself forced to make advances to Richelieu, who was unable to dictate his own terms. In April 1624, the cardinal entered the council and his cardinal immediately claimed precedence over the other ministers. In August, La Veuville was dismissed and imprisoned, and Richelieu became chief minister. Many years later, Richelieu, reviewing the course of his policy, declared that when entering on his office, he promised his master to employ all his industry and all the authority bestowed upon him and destroying the Huguenot party, abasing the pride of the magnates, and raising the king's name to its proper place among the foreign powers, a triple task, each part of which would task the wasted resources of the kingdom. Nor could the several elements be isolated and separately handled. Discontented magnates would not sit idly by while the government was at grips with the Huguenot, those whom religion or ambition had made rebels could rely on help from the foreign enemies of France. External dangers pressed, and measures to meet them could not be postponed until France had restored order and authority at home. Fourteen years had passed since the death of Henry the Fourth, and the policy of shifts and expedients had allowed trivial questions to become serious and serious questions to become dangerous. The House of Habsburg was united in its policy. Its enemies were isolated, enfeebled, discouraged. Spanish troops held the line of the Rhine from Strasbourg to Ries. The Rhenish Palatinate was in the hands of their Bavarian allies. The Dutch truce had expired in 1621, and the United Provinces were hard-pressed from the Spanish Netherlands. The old allies of Henry the Fourth looked with suspicion upon France, regarding her as the confederate of Spain. In Germany, there was no military force to face the Habsburg coalition, except the levies of Mansfield and his associates. The efforts of the opportunist ministers of Louis had been devoted to curbing the ambitions of the Duke of Savoy, and had forced him to conclude the Peace of Asti in 1615, and that of Pavia in 1617. The marriage of Louis XIII's sister, Christina, to the Prince of Piemont in 1619 had shown a desire to preserve this valuable friendship for France, but in default of more material benefits. Charles Emmanuel was discontented with his French allies, and ready, if occasion offered, to make common cause with Spain. Most urgent of all was the question of the Grisons and the Valtelline, where all the currents of European policy met 
The valley of the Valtaline, as shown in a previous chapter, was under the control of the three Grisen Leagues, whose alliance with France exposed them to the constant and watchful hostility of Spain. In 1620, a revolt of the Catholic inhabitants of the Valtaline gave Spain her opportunity. The valley was seized, the Grisons were invaded, and the Convention of Lindau was signed, 1620 to 1622. France again met force by negotiation, with the result that when Richelieu came to power, the Valtaline forces had been entrusted to the custody of the Pope pending a settlement. But no peaceful settlement was likely to result, which did not leave to Spain the right of passage through the Volta line. Richelieu at once began to strengthen the French position. Even before the fall of La Vouville, aid and money and men had been promised to the Dutch. Mansfield was subsided, and an annual grant was promised to Christian IV of Denmark on his taking up arms in Germany. All this was part of a deliberate policy of thwarting the Habsburgs without committing France to open intervention. It was part of the same scheme to detach Maximilian of Bavaria from the Habsburg coalition, and to win him for the French cause. Negotiations were at once set on foot to procure this result, which in spite of repeated failures, Richelieu never seems to have despaired of attaining a marriage was arranged between Henrietta Maria of France and the Prince of Wales, who, when the marriage was solemnized, May 1625, had become Charles I of England by the death of his father. In the Volta line, diplomatic methods were not by themselves sufficient. The Marquis de Cove was accordingly sent to collect Swiss troops and with their aid in the last months of 1624, he seized the fortresses of the Valtaline and drove out the papal garrisons. Richelieu could now negotiate with a vantage ground of possession. Savoy, Venice, and England were leagued with France. Desultory operations took place in Savoy in the direction of Genoa, but the real campaign was waged on paper and in May 1626, under the influence of Pope Urban VIII, a treaty, the Treaty of Monzen, was concluded between France and Spain. The forts constructed by the Spaniards in the Volta Line were to be handed over to the Pope for destruction. The old treaties were revived, whereby France recovered her sole right of passage to the valley. The treaty was favorable to French pretensions but her allies were not even consulted before its signature, and Richelieu's first important act of policy left Venice, the Grisons, and especially Savoy, profoundly mistrustful and justly discontented. Whatever other considerations may have hastened Richelieu's action in this matter, he had in fact obeyed the law of necessity. Troubles crowded upon him at home. The finances were in complete disorder. Temporary relief had been obtained by means of an inquiry into the conduct of the financers, who were forced for fear of worse things to disgorge ten millions. But in June 1626, when the Marquis de Effet took over the surintendants, the revenue of the current year had already been spent. The revenue of the succeeding year had already been largely anticipated, and a floating debt of twenty seven millions demanded liquidation. In january sixteen twenty five, the Huguenots renewed the civil war by seizing the port of Blavé in Brittany with the royal ships that lay there. Soubise, with the fleet thus acquired and the navy of La Rochelle, ranged the western coast and intercepted commerce. Rowan Acastus was raising troops. Montauban was in revolt. La Rochelle loudly demanded the destruction of Fort Louise, a fortress intended to hold its harbor in check, whose demolition, as the citizens alleged, had been informally promised at the time of the Peace of Montpellier. Against the navy of Soubise, Richelieu collected English and Dutch vessels, which he manned with French seamen. By their help, 
Montmorency was enabled to scatter the forces of Soubise, September 1625, and to seize the islands of Ri and Olerin, which commanded the harbour of La Rochelle. Soubise was forced to seek a refuge in England. The districts about Montauban and other rebellious places were ruthlessly devastated. But English and Dutch opinion resented, and the use against Protestants of the vessels lent to France, the ships were recalled, and Richelieu was fain to use the good offices of the English ambassadors to conclude a treaty with the Huguenot, February 1626. Little was conceded, but the English were thereby in some sort constituted protectors of the Protestants in France. This danger passed, Richelieu thought it opportune to vindicate his own authority by a vigorous demonstration. The conspiracy which he chose to discover centered around the Duke of Anjou, the king's brother. The government intended to marry this prince to Mademoiselle de Montpensier. The prince himself was disinclined to the match, and he found friends and supporters among the discontented magnates. This attempt at opposition to the cardinal's will was represented as a dangerous, even as a murderous, enterprise. The prince's governor, the Marshal de Arnano, was thrown into prison, where he died. The Duke of Vidome and his brother, natural sons of Henry IV, were seized and imprisoned. A young noble, Chalais, who under the influence of Madame de Chevreuse had taken part in the cabal, was brought to trial and executed. Madame de Chevreuse was driven into exile in Lorraine. The Duke of Anjou was forced into the marriage originally proposed and received the title and appanage of Orleans. It was proved that opposition was a crime, an intrigue, a game dangerous even for the greatest. Gaston of Orleans made his peace in characteristic fashion by betraying his friends. But the Count of Soissons had to retire to Turin for safety. The Assembly of Notables, summoned in December 1626, was inspired to propose new measures against rebellion. No communication was to be allowed between French subjects and foreign ambassadors. Even the nuncio was not accepted from this ruling. The mere fact of taking up arms was to be sufficient cause for forfeiture of all offices. Seditious libel, a form of literature which the cardinal himself had patronized when in opposition, was now to be severely punished. No one was to be permitted to collect arms or munitions, or to levy funds from the king's subjects without authority. These proposals were gladly received and speedily registered as edicts. The cardinal's position was further strengthened by the suppression of the office of Admiral of France compensation being paid to the Duke of Montmorency, and by the creation in Richelieu's favour of a new office of superintendent of navigation and commerce. With this charge, the functions of the Duke of Vodome as Admiral for Brittany were united. On the death of Lesdiguer in September 1626, the office of constable was also suppressed and thus the supreme direction of military forces devolved also upon the minister. Even favourites were not tolerated, and Baratus, a young gentleman on whom the king's too conspicuous favour had rested, was driven from the court. Richelieu had composed his difficulties with Spain, and in April 1627 a treaty of alliance was concluded with this power, in view of the strained relations between England and France. The secret conditions of the English marriage had proved impractical. Charles and Buckingham were not strong enough to protect the Roman Catholics in England. Trouble arose between the royal pair, which resulted in August 1626 in the ignominious expulsion of the Queen's French household. The parliamentary situation in England made some action on behalf of the French Protestants a desirable political move and Buckingham's own wounded pride prompted a similar policy. As an envoy to the court of Paris at the time of Charles's marriage, 
the favorite had not hesitated to make open love to the Queen of France. Consequently, his proposals for a further visit were coldly received, and he was made to understand that his presence would not be welcome. Thus, he was ready enough to court popularity by a French war. The friction caused by the marriage, contract, and the oppression of French Protestants supplied the occasion. The aid of Lorraine and Savoy and vigorous support from the Huguenots were expected. Accordingly, extensive preparations were made, and in June 1627, a great armament set forth from Portsmouth. On July 20th, the troops were landed on the island of Ree off La Rochelle. The island was protected by two fortresses, St. Martin and La Prie, and the garrison was commanded by Torreira, a brave soldier though ill regarded by the cardinal. Before Buckingham moved up his troops to attack, these places were hastily put in a state of defense, and the English were forced to proceed to a regular siege of St. Martin. Meanwhile, the king had fallen ill, and the cardinal, distracted by fears for his own safety, had to direct from his bedside measures of defense and relief. An army was sent to hold in check La Rochelle, which did not at first declare itself for Buckingham, but afterwards openly adopted the cause of the invaders. Had the city granted the request of Buckingham and admitted his army within their walls, the issue might have been different. But the citizens were fighting for independence, not to change one master for another. In 1625, the king had been forced to wage war with borrowed vessels. In 1627, Richelieu had already created a fleet, whose headquarters were at Rouage. Moreover, shipping from boats were collected from all parts to aid in the task of transporting men and provisions. The cardinal advanced money from his own treasury to meet the necessary expenses. At length, the king was well enough to travel, and on October 2nd, he arrived in the camp before La Rochelle. Torira's provisions were almost exhausted, and October 7th, St. Martin made proposals for surrender. But the very next day, a convoy fought its way in with provisions for a month. The reinforcements promised from England did not arrive. On October 30th, a first detachment of French troops landed at La Prie, and on November 6th, Buckingham delivered a last assault on St. Martin, which was repulsed. He then gave orders to embark his forces, but meanwhile, the enemy had assembled an island in considerable strength. The English were attacked while retreating by our narrow causeway by their ships and suffered heavily. On November 18th, the fleet sailed for England, its original complement reduced to less than one half by battle, capture, and disease. Richelieu was now free to push his project for annihilating the political privileges of the Huguenot. Just grounds for action were not wanting. La Rochelle had openly assisted Buckingham. Rowan had raised troops in Languedoc. Walter Montagu, an English agent, accredited to Savoy and Lorraine, had visited Rowan and had been seized by the cardinal with all his papers on the soil Lorraine. The objective was also plainly indicated. La Rochelle had been for several years the center of all Huguenot disaffection. Virtually independent, it offered ready access to the heart of the kingdom for foreign enemies coming by the sea, and was protected by a powerful and piratical fleet. So long as this city remained unsubdued, the king could not regard himself as master in his own house. Condé was sent with an army to hold Rowan in check. The cardinal and the king undertook the operations against the Huguenot capital. In November, the siege was opened on the landward side. The royal fleet was brought up under the Duke of Guise to assist in the maritime blockade. And from either side of the harbor mouth, the laborious construction of a stone dike was begun, with the intention of closing the port to all supplies and succor from the sea. The Spanish navy came up to give some formal satisfaction to treaty obligations, but Richelieu wisely determined to place no reliance on its support, and trusted wholly to the fleet which he had created and collected. 
All through the winter the blockading lines were closely guarded, and the dikes were steadily pushed forward. When the king grew tired and returned to Paris, February 1628, the cardinal was obliged to choose between two risks. He determined to hazard the effect of any hostile influences on his master, and to push the siege in person at whatever cost. In April, the king returned. The dikes were by this time well advanced. The passage between them was blocked by sunken ships and guarded by palisades and moored vessels. And the dikes themselves were protected with guns. In May, the long-hoped-for aid from England arrived. A fleet of thirty vessels under Lord Denby. The rumor of its coming had driven away the Spaniards, but Richelieu had not depended upon their support. The English fleet was ineffective and ill-found. The seamen were unwilling, and after a futile demonstration against the guard ships and the forts, Lord Dinby sailed off again, leaving the city to its fate. In July, another armament was begun, and in spite of the assassination of Buckingham, September 2nd, N.S., it set sail on September 17th under the Earl of Lindsay, but no serious attempt was made to force the passage, and the citizens, wasted by extremist famine, and despairing of succor, concluded their capitulation on October 29th in sight of the English fleet. The city lost all its privileges, its walls were destroyed, the Catholic region was restored to its rights, but the persons and the property of the citizens were spared, and the free exercise of Protestant worship in the city was permitted. On November 1st, the king rode into the city. On November 11th, the English sailed away. Meanwhile, warfare had been proceeding in Languedoc. But so long as La Rochelle held out, the king's troops attempted nothing decisive, and Rohan, whose vigor, devotion, and ability alone maintained the existence of his party, was not strong enough to take a vigorous offensive. Such forces as remained to the Protestants were concentrated in the district between Toulouse and the Rhone. Partly by persuasion, partly by conviction, partly by compulsion. Montauban, Nimes, Uze, Castres, Milhau, Privas, beside a number of lesser towns still held for the Huguenot. And the strong defensive position of Cévennes afforded a place of muster and equipment, an arsenal, and a final retreat. But Rohan's authority was precarious and he failed in an attempt to surprise Montpellier. On the other hand, Condé, who had become a firm adherent of the cardinal, had received the promise of Rohan's confiscated estates and commanded the king's troops in this district. Could not or would not force the Protestants to a serious engagement, and operations were confined to petty sieges and systematic devastation of Protestant districts, with occasional reprisals on the part of the Huguenots. When La Rochelle had surrendered, the suppression of the remnants of Protestant liberty was no longer the most urgent task that demanded the cardinal's attention. On December 26, 1627, Duke Vincent II of Mantua had died, leaving no nearer male heir than Charles de Gonzaga, Duke of Nevers, a French man by education and sympathy. Vincent, before his death, acting under French influence, left his duchy by will to Charles, and married the daughter of his brother Francis, who had died in 1613, to Charles's son, the Duke of Rethel. Charles at once took possession of his duchy, but Spain was not willing to acquiesce in the establishment of a French prince in Italy. Other claimants were encouraged to put forward their claims. The Duke of Savoy was glad to have the chance of reviving his pretensions to Montferrat. The Emperor refused his investiture and formally sequestered the duchy, and Savoy and Spain, acting in concert, occupied Montferrat, with the exception of the important fortress of the Casale, to which Gonzalez de Cordoba, the governor of Milan, laid siege. So long as La Rochelle held out, France was unable to act except by diplomacy, and force was needed. But Cassel outlasted the Protestant capital, and so soon as La Rochelle had fallen, Louis and Richelieu determined, if possible, to save Cassel. 
the Duke of Savoy was requested to allow passage for the French troops. He bargained, but did not conclude. And on March 6, 1629, the French army crossed the frontier in his despite and seized the town of Susa. The Duke of Savoy then came to terms and made an agreement which allowed the French to relieve Casale. The Spaniards retired, and the immediate object of the expedition was achieved, but much still remained to be settled, and the French retained Susa as a guarantee. A league was formed between France, Venice, Mantua, and Savoy for the defense of Italy. The hands of France were freely by the conclusion of peace with England, April 24, 1629. Lee returned to France, and the cardinal remained for a while at Susa with considerable force to watch over the Duke of Savoy, whose intentions were highly dubious, and to guard the interests of the Duke of Mantua. The king was now at liberty to deal with the Huguenot. In his despair, Rowan had been forced to appeal to the enemies of France. English promises had proved elusive, and about the time when England made peace with France, the king of Spain consented to accept Rohan's offer of service and promised him an annual subsidy. But the promise came too late. Operations began by the siege of Provas, at which the cardinal joined the king, having left the Marshal de Cui in command at Susa. And the conclusion of peace with England was announced, May. Deprived of his last hope, the Huguenot might yet have sold their liberty dear. A discord was rife in their party, and resistance was irresolute. Privas surrendered, and was pillaged and burnt, contrary to the capitulation. The fortresses of Seven were soon in the king's hands. Rowan was forced to treat. On June 28th, peace was made. The Huguenot submitted. The fortifications of their remaining strongholds were raised, and the last remnants of independent military power given up. There could never again be a militant Protestant party in France. Rowan was treated with indulgence, the property of his family restored, but he himself was sent into exile at Venice. On August 20th, the cardinal made his triumphal entry into Montauban and the wars of religion in France were formally concluded. Toleration for Protestant worship was maintained. The Chambre and Patis, the Edict of Nantes, continued to sit. But the conversion of the Huguenot, which had already begun, proceeded hereafter more rapidly, and was the object of the efforts of numerous Capuchin missions, in which Father Joseph took great interest. At no time in his career did Richelieu manifest greater qualities of resolution, promptness, and resource than during the years which immediately preceded the landing of Gustavus Adolphus in Germany, June 1630. While La Rochelle still held out, the cardinal was preparing for an extension of the field of his activity and meditating plans of attack, direct and insidious, on the Habsburg power, then at its height. When La Rochelle had fallen through armed rebellion, was still on foot in Landoc, Cassel was hastily relieved. This accomplished, the Huguenots were taken in hand without delay. Meanwhile, Christian IV of Denmark had been reduced to negotiating for the peace which he concluded in May 1629. It was impossible for Richelieu to prevent this defection, but he felt that its consequences must be by some means counteracted. Charnace who was sent as an envoy to influence the peace negotiations, was also charged to visit Bavaria and endeavor to detach Maximilian from the Habsburg coalition, and finally to mediate, if possible, a truce between Sweden and Poland. This last part of his mission was successful, September 1629, and the way was thus cleared for a new and more dangerous enemy of the Habsburgs in Germany. While this move was maturing, and while the final operations against the Habsburgs were proceeding, the temporary settlement of the Mantuan affair had broken down. The Duke of Savoy did not fulfill his engagements, seeing better prospects of gain in the Habsburg alliance. The imperial troops, freed by the favorable turn of events in Germany, entered the Valtaline in May 1629. 
In October, Spinola was in Milan, and shortly afterwards he led the Spanish troops into Montferrat, while imperial forces invaded the Mantuan territory. Casal was besieged by Spinola, Mantua by Volstein's lieutenant Colalto, and the Duke of Savoy occupied his allotted share of Montferrat. The resistance of Casal and Mantua gave Richelieu a scanty respite, and enabled him to deal with urgent troubles at home. No factor in Richelieu's career is more difficult to estimate than the exact influence of Louis's character on the minister's policy. Louis was not a non-entity. He had a large share of obstinacy. His determination, once formed, had to be respected. His moods were variable and dangerous. Possessed of good average ability, some industry, and a sense of kingly duty, he could be convinced and influenced. But he could never be neglected. He appears to have long resisted the introduction of Richelieu into the ministry for fear of his commanding personality. To the end of his days, he chafed under Richelieu's predominance, but he loved military glory and success. He hated to feel the burden of his functions pressing on his capacity. So long as Richelieu provided the king with success, so long as he made the burdens seem light, so long as he showed him the way and found for him the means to meet every difficulty, so long, in fact, as Richelieu was indispensable, so long he was safe. But had events ever proved too strong for the cardinal, had he ever failed to find the solution of the enigma, the magic for dispersing danger, the way to a conspicuous and intelligible end, then his day was over. His life was forfeited. For such a man could not be allowed to return to private life. He was too dangerous. Meanwhile, Louis regarded him as a schoolboy regards his schoolmaster, with a certain awe, with a certain dislike. Above all, it may be guessed, with a certain humiliation as one who was greater than the king. The longer the cardinal's ascendancy lasted, the safer he became by proved success by indispensable competence, by use and want. But the king's moods were always to be feared. The cardinal had seen him with his favorites, exacting as a woman, inconstant, petulant, intolerable. He was careful not to become a favorite, but to preserve a certain distance and austerity to avoid the friction of intimate relations. But yet he could never feel secure against a sudden act of temper, a momentary betrayal. His rivals helped him here. Their incompetence was conspicuous, their exactions harassing, their claims humiliating. Above all others, the Queen Mother had become his rival. Richelieu had climbed to power by her aid. He attended to wield it alone. Moreover, there were differences of policy. The Queen Mother represented the Catholic party, with whom the interest of religion came first. Richelieu followed the tradition of Henry IV and with him the interests of the state were at all times paramount. This difference began to be marked from the first. The English marriage, the temporizing treatment of the Protestants, the Dutch alliance, these showed the spirit of the cardinal. The queen mother, after one, knows not what scenes and recriminations with her former favorite broke definitely with him, and threw herself into the arms of the cardinal de Beru the founder of the oratory, the leader of the Catholic faction. From the time of the siege of La Rochelle, her enmity could never be ignored. Fortunately for Richelieu, Mary de Medici was neither practical nor tactful. She could not show an alternative to his policy, or find a substitute for his guidance. She wearied the king with her complaints, her assertion of maternal authority her tempers and her reproaches, but she was a danger. Gaston of Orleans was another danger to the king, no less than the minister. Louis was childless as yet. His wife's hopes of offspring had been twice frustrated. His own excellent health had been ruined by harassing medical treatment. Gaston, as his heir, looked forward to the succession, and meanwhile made opposition after the fashion of heirs apparent. In himself he was not a dangerous opponent, and the preference shown to him by the Queen Mother weakened their joint influence. Dissolute, inconsequent, faithless, he had a name and a position, 
and could hazard rebellion without risking his life. Nor had his followers yet realized that he could not and did not care to confer similar immunity upon them. In 1627, he had lost his first wife in childbed. He turned his eyes on the Mantuan princess, resident at the French court. This match did not please the queen mother who disliked the Mantuan house, and while the king and cardinal were in Piedmont, 1629, she thought it necessary to imprison Mary de Gozonga. Foiled in this whim, Gaston thought to take revenge upon the cardinal. He intrigued and gathered adherents. In September 1629, he left the court and retired to Lorraine, whose duke had already shown some willingness to take advantage of the difficulties of France and to join her enemies. Time, which should have been given to preparations for intervention in Italy, had been spent in quieting this malcontent. He was at length persuaded to accept the government of Orleans, and an increase of pension. In December, the cardinal was able to turn his mind to the Italian war, though Caston was not formally reconciled to his brother until April 1630. The cardinal's personal supervision was needed to forward the lagging military preparations. The army was ready in March 1630. After negotiations had failed, the cardinal led it to Piemont. On March 25th, by unexpected stroke, Penarola was seized, and the approaches to this important fortress were then occupied in force. In May, the king invaded Savoy. Chambery was taken, and the whole of Savoy was occupied by the end of June. In July, his forces passed Montchenis and joined the army of Piedmont. On July 26, Charles Emmanuel died. His son and successor had married a French princess, and might be expected to be more favorable to French projects. But on July 18th, Mantua was occupied by the imperial forces, while Spinola had occupied the town of Casal, and was pressing the citadel hard. Complicated negotiations followed during the course in which Spinola died. Father Joseph had been sent to the Diet of Ratisbon, June 1630, to influence the electors against the proposed election of Ferdinand's son as King of the Romans. In this he was successful, but as a proof of good faith he agreed to a treaty dealing with the Mantuan question, October 13th. This treaty stipulated that France should give no aid, direct or indirect, to the enemies of the emperor, and Richelieu rejected it as made in excess of powers. Eventually, by the intervention of Giglio Mazzarini, the papal envoy, an arrangement was made by which Casal was to be evacuated by the Spaniards, while the French troops were withdrawn from the citadel. The last provision was secretly evaded, and 400 Frenchmen were retained as garrison in the pay of the Duke of Mantua. The French troops in Savoy and Pedimont remained to secure the restitution of Mantua, and the formal investiture of Duke Charles. During this lull, the relations between Richelieu and the Queen Mother reached their crisis. In September, Louis had fallen seriously ill, and it appears that during his illness his wife and mother had persuaded him to hold out hopes of the Cardinal's dismissal. On November 10, 1630, the Queen Mother and Richelieu met in the King's presence. A violent scene followed with no decisive result, but when on the following day the King retired to Versailles, the Cardinal's enemies were convinced that his fall was certain. However, whether spontaneously or by arrangement, the cardinal followed him, and, before the day of the pay was ended, was completely restored to favor. On this day, the cardinal's ultimate victory became certain, but a final blow was still needed. Meanwhile, the garde de Chaux, Michel de Meriac, who had lent himself to the cabal, was dismissed and exiled. His brother, Marchand Louis de Meriac, was arrested in the midst of the army of Piedmont, in which he held a command, brought to trial for malversation, condemned and executed. No plot against the cardinal was allowed to pass without a victim. End of section 16《セクションナンバー seventeen of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume four, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick Seaman. Chapter 4 Richelieu by Stanley Lees. Part 3 In the course of 1631, by treaties concluded at Cherasco, the affairs of Mantua were brought to satisfactory settlement. The Duke of Mantua received his investiture and recovered his duchy. The Duke of Savoy received a small territorial compensation. Montferrat was evacuated, and the French troops were withdrawn from Savoy and Piedmont. France, however, retained Pinerolo in its approaches. The gateway of Italy, by arrangement with the Duke of Savoy, became her ally. This favorable settlement of a question in which the honor and credit even more than the material interest of France were involved was an indirect result of Gustavus's successes in Germany for events at home which had prevented Richelieu from acting vigorously beyond the Alps. Had his opponents in northern Italy been in position to raise serious difficulties? In January 1631, Gaston took upon his mother's quarrel and acting in concert with her, left the court for Orleans. Richelieu determined to proceed to extremities. The king left Paris for Compiègne, and ordered his mother to follow him thither. On arriving at Compiègne, she was asked to sign a written engagement, to give no countenance to opponents of the established authorities. On her refusal, the king sent orders for her to retire to Moulin. This she declined to do and after remaining for some months under supervision at Compiègne, she escaped, July, to the Spanish Netherlands. Here she received honorable entertainment and remained for eight years. She then removed to Holland and afterwards to England, and died in 1641 at Cologne, to the last a bitter though impotent enemy of the man whom she had raised to power. Meanwhile, the king had moved towards Orleans, March 1631, and on his approach, Gaston once more fled to Lorraine, where he had remained for some months courting the duke's sister, Margaret. A warfare of manifestos and pamphlets followed, and the Parlement of Paris, which protested against the summary condemnation of Gaston's adherents, without form of trial, was made to feel that no constitutional or legal safeguards would prevail against the king's will. But other measures were also needed, and in December the king was at Metz with an army, while Gustavus, having in his victorious progress reached Mainz, was said to have thought of invading Lorraine, whose duke had raised men for the emperor's service, and had allowed imperial troops to occupy and fortify Muyenvik in the Bosphoric of Metz but France reserved to herself the right of coercing her neighbor, and invading Lorraine drove the garrison from Moyevec. The Duke hastened to make peace, June 6, 1632, ceding Marseille to France. But on January 3rd, Gaston had been secretly married to Marguerite of Lorraine, who was not, however, safe in the proximity of a French army and was thus obliged to leave his bride and join his mother in the Netherlands. In June 1632, he was again in Lorraine, whence he entered France with a scanty force, and marched through Burgundy, Bombonnier, Avenue, Rueil, to Landoc, where at length he found an important supporter, the Duke of Montmorency, August. The arrival of Gaston coincided with an injudicious attempt of the cardinal to abolish the ancient privileges of Landoc and to take the collection for all local contributions out of the hands of the estates by the establishment in the province of the royal officers known as Ilu. The estates had already refused to accept his arbitrary measures, and Montmorency, who was previously pledged to Gaston, must have hoped to carry his province with him. A few notables joined the rebellion, and among them five bishops, but on the whole, in spite of provocation, the province remained quiet, and Montmorency brought to Gaston practically no more than his own paid military following. The enterprise of Gaston had been precipitated by the knowledge that the king was once more advancing upon Lorraine. In June, 
for Lee had put his army in motion. The places which he passed on his route opened their gates. The forces which he met were dispersed, and on June 23rd he was before Nancy. The Duke once more hastened to make peace, surrendered Stenay and Jemets, and his disputed claim to the county of Clermont. The king did not need to take the field himself against his brother. Schomburg and La Force were detached from the army of Lorraine to keep the rebels in check. And while the king was preparing more substantial forces, Gaston's little army came into collision with that of Schomburg near Castellandale. Montmorency, charging rashly and almost alone, was wounded and captured, and Gaston's forces at once began to disperse. He was admitted to terms, renounced all his foreign alliances and the cause of his mother, abandoned all his followers to the king's mercy, and on these conditions received a contemptuous pardon. Montmorency and the unfortunate gentlemen taken in arms were left to pay the price. The trial, condemnation, and execution of the generous duke, the head of one of the most illustrious houses of France, was a merciless act of policy, well calculated to strike terror into all rebels and to expose the character of Gaston in its true light. On the news of Montmorency's death, which he had not attempted to prevent, Gaston took fright for himself. The Lorraine marriage, which he had denied, was a dangerous matter. If a Montmorency's head could fall on the scaffold, even the king's brother might not be safe. He fled once more to Flanders, November 1632, where he remained for nearly two years. His despicable intrigues fill a larger place in history than his character or capacity deserves. For it was not until his power to harm had been completely destroyed that Richelieu felt free to develop a vigorous course of action abroad, and his relations with Lorraine determined in great measure the line which that action took. The death of Montmorency and the third flight of Gaston were quickly followed by the news of Gustavus's death, November 16, 1632. His brief career in Germany is treated elsewhere in this volume. So long as it lasted, European events remained almost entirely out of the cardinal's control. Richelieu had facilitated Gustavus's expedition by promoting the Polish truce, partly with a view to furthering it. He had rejected the treaty negotiated by Father Joseph at Radisbon, and above all, he had in the Treaty of Barvalde, January 1631 by a promise of financial support, endeavored to control the progress of the conqueror. He had been his own scheme, which he pressed upon Gustavus to detach the great Catholic states of Germany, and especially Bavaria, from the Habsburg alliance, to procure for them, by his influence with Sweden, recognition and respect for neutrality, and thus to discharge the whole weight of Gustavus's attack upon the power of Austria by extracting from Gustavus the promise that the Catholic religion should be maintained, where previously established in the places he might conquer, the cardinal hoped to secure that the war should not become a war of religion. But in all this he achieved but a limited success. For the Catholic princes, only the elector of Trier, already intimately attached to France, accepted the French protection. Parties ranged themselves almost entirely on religious lines. The heaviest blows fell not on the emperor, but on the elector of Bavaria, whom Richelieu was specifically anxious to save, and the new danger brought the incalculable Wallstein back to authority and to fresh prestige. On the whole, the redistribution of power consequent on Gustavus's successes was beneficial to France, and she found profit especially in Italy, Lorraine, and Trier. From this intervention, while her principal adversaries, Spain and Austria, were correspondingly weakened and hampered, nevertheless Richelieu must have been relieved by the death of his great ally, as by the extinction of a mighty force whose action he could neither control nor predict. Gradually, Richelieu had been gaining strength. The Protestants had been crushed in France. His enemies at home had learned his power and dreaded his implacable resentment. His action abroad, cautious and reserved at first, in the matter of the Valtaline, 
and the Mantuan succession had become gradually more confident and effective. In the death of Gustavus, he became more and more certainly the arbiter of Europe. His will fanned the flames of war from the Oder to the Ebro, dangling before his deluded allies the prospects of a general peace in which all interests should be secured, ceaselessly impressing on all concerned that a separate arrangement could be neither profitable nor trustworthy. He gradually wore down the strength of the Habsburgs and recovered the ground lost in twenty years of irresolution or of impotence. His death found his work still uncompleted, but he left his successor to pursue his tradition, and the peace of Westphalia was really of his making. On the death of Gustavus, it must have been clear to Richelieu that open war with one of both of the Habsburg powers could not long be postponed. He was anxious, however, to defer it as long as possible. Internal troubles were not yet completely removed. The queen mother and the heir apparent, though in exile, were in exile at a hostile court. In 1633, the cardinal fell seriously ill, and during his illness, his creature, the garde de Chaux, Charles de Abishbein, Marquis of Chateauneuf, inspired by his mistress, Madame de Chevreuse, and in suspicious intimacy with Anne of Austria, ventured to lay his plans for the cardinal's succession. The cardinal recovered. The Chateauneuf expiated his temerity by ten years of imprisonment. The resources of France were considerable, but her military strength was undeveloped. Her armies and her generals were ill-matched for the seasoned warriors and experienced commanders of Spain and Austria, trained in incessant warfare through many years. Indirect attacks must be preferred so long as indirect attacks would serve the purpose. Meanwhile, all efforts must be made to strengthen the French frontier towards the Rhine. In every direction, Richelieu sent out his envoys, and his envoys served him well. His old plan of separating the princes of the Catholic League from the House of Austria, of inducing them to stand neutral in the coming struggle, and the Protestant Confederates to recognize their neutrality, was pushed once more, and failed once more, owing to the jealousies, animosities, and suspicions of the rival parties. But Fikia concluded on behalf of France a fresh treaty with Sweden, safeguarding as before the interests of the Catholic religion, so far as the treaty could secure them, confining the assistance of France to a pecuniary subsidy and engaging the Swedish power to continue the war, April 1633. At Heilbronn, the Protestant alliance was reorganized, with Oxenstierna, the Swedish chancellor, at its head, and measures were taken for a vigorous campaign. Charnais was able to persuade the United Provinces to continue the war with the Spanish Netherlands, without pledging France to direct an immediate intervention, which Richelieu was prepared to offer in the last resort. Towards the Rhine, Richelieu offered to take over Mainz, and the other fortresses on the left bank than in the possession of the Swedes. But this was refused. Similar proposals were put forward with regard to Philipsburg and Elsass, and were similarly abandoned. His agents worked among the petty princes on both banks of the Rhine, endeavouring to create a Rhenish confederacy under French protection. Already at the end of 1631, the elector of Trier had placed his territories under French protection. In June 1632, French troops had entered the electorate. In August, they drove the Spaniards from his capital and took over Koblenz from the Swedes. Hopes of similar action on the part of the elector of Cologne were destined to be disappointed. The attitude of Lorraine was still hostile. The question of Gaston's marriage was still unsettled, and in 1633, France determined to support her allies by action in this direction. The Duke of Lorraine was summoned to do homage for his Duchy of Bar, which he held of the crown of France, and when he declined to risk his person at the court of his enemies, the Parlement of Paris declared the Duchy forfeit. In August 1633, the French army advanced into Lorraine, and in September the Duke was forced to renounce all hostile alliances, to place Nancy in the King's hands, and to consent to the dissolution of his sister's marriage. 
the princess herself escaped to the Netherlands, where she joined her husband, Duke Charles, in January 1634, resigned his duchy to his brother, Cardinal Nicholas Francis, and took the field as a soldier of fortune in the service of the emperor. The new duke, to secure his rights, granted himself the necessary dispensations, divested himself of his orders, and married his cousin, the Princess Claude. Hereupon both he and his wife were arrested, but in April 1634 they escaped and made good their flight to Florence. Thus of all, the Ducal family, only the Duchess Nicole, the first discarded wife of Charles, was left in Lorraine, which was occupied and governed by the French. There remained Gaston's marriage. The Pope did not favor the dissolution, and accordingly the Parlement of Paris was called upon to declare the civil contract null and void. This was effected in due course, on the ground that the heir to the throne could not contract a legal marriage without the consent of his natural guardian, the king. There was still the sacrament, and it was argued that sacrament standing to contract as form to matter. The form could not subsist without the matter in which it was inherent. The contract being void, the sacrament was therefore non-existent. On such grounds, the decision of the French clergy assembled in Paris, July 1635, that such marriages were illicit, was held to conclude the question, and no more regular dissolution was obtained. Meanwhile, towards the end of 1634, the Duke of Orleans, fatigued by the impotence and the humiliation of his position in Flanders, where he had actually been persuaded to conclude a formal treaty with Spain, took flight and returned to France, and was reconciled to his brother, abandoning his wife with as little compunction as he showed in abandoning his friends to the scaffold or to the Bastille. The military events of the year 1633 were on the whole favorable to the allies of France, not so those of the following year. The negotiations which were opened during the summer of 1633 for the defection of Wallstein and his adhesion to France were frustrated in February 1634 by his assassination. The Allies suffered a series of reverses, and finally, a crowning disaster at Nordling, September 6th. Thereupon, Oxenstierne at once agreed to the cession to France of all the positions for which he had long been pressing, and in particular of Philipsburg, Colmar, and Schlechstadt. The French thus held a fairly continuous defensive position far in advance of their actual frontier. In the south, the Bishop of Basel had placed his territories under French protection, and to the west of Basel, a little principality of Montbelliard, Mumpelgard, had been similarly handed over to the behalf of Württemberg. In Alsace, the French held Colmar and Schlettstadt, and Strasbourg, they were endeavoring to establish connections. Further north, he had occupied a number of positions of which Hagenau and Zabern were the chief. In the Palatinate and the neighboring Bisphoric of Speyer, they were masters of Kaiserslautern, Speyer, Philipsburg, and Mannheim. Further north, they garrisoned the elector of Trier's fortress of Ehrenbreitstein. Thus, by the end of 1634, they had grasped a great block of imperial territory, from Basel in the south of Koblenz and the north to Lorraine in the west. Yet war had not been declared. But after keen bargaining at Paris and worms in the passage of envoys to and fro, among whom was the famous Hugo Grotius, in April 1635, a treaty was arranged at Compiègne by Oxenstierne in person, binding France to an immediate rupture, and the Allies to conclude no separate peace. In September of the same year, an offensive and defensive alliance was concluded at Paris between France and United Provinces, providing for the joint invasion and partition of the Spanish Netherlands. The time for the Lucians and invasions was past. If the coalition were to be maintained, it could only be maintained by the vigorous intervention of France, Saxony, Brandenburg, the principal Protestant princes of Germany, and the chief imperial towns were preparing to make their peace, and when the Treaty of Prague was published, May 31, 
and was afterwards adopted by the chief part of Protestant Germany. The only recorded results had been long foreseen. Imperial troops had surprised Philipsburg, January 23rd to 24th. On March 26th, the Elector of Trier and his capital fell into the hands of the Spaniards. This last incident supplied the pretext for the decision which already had been made, and on May 19th, war was solemnly declared by France against Spain. Open war with the House of Austria was not declared until 1638, but meanwhile hostilities with that power were hardly less effective, because they were indirect and officially ignored. Thus were the ulterior designs of Henry IV put into effect. The simultaneous attack upon the possessions of the House of Habsburg in all parts of Europe, the widespread alliances, the universal conflagration, these Henry had dreamed. They now became a reality. It is said, and may be partly true, that Richelieu initiated and prolonged the war in order that his master might be saddled with responsibilities which only the minister could enable him to endure. It is true that, throughout his long career, the maintenance of his own precarious position was for Richelieu a prime care. That is assumed with him the importance rather of an end than of a means. It is the fact that, so long as the war lasted, Richelieu was or seemed indispensable to Louis, yet little motives never cause, though they may occasion great results. A spark may fire a powder mine, but the powder must have been prepared and laid. The great Habsburg War was the inevitable result of Richelieu's policy, of the policy of those who preceded him. The Spanish alliance of the Regency, the weakness of Luynes, not less the half-veiled hostilities hitherto conducted by Richelieu himself, all led to this issue. Dynastically, the war was a new phase in the blood feud that began on the bridge of Montereau, and was fought out at Marat, Nancy, Pavia, and all the chancelleries of Europe. But still, more fundamental as a predisposing cause were those blind and unconscious forces that impel nations to complete their own existence, to achieve their own realization, to hurl down whatever opposes or threatens to encumber, to sacrifice all else that is most precious to the attainment of self-determined organic unity. National forces were working, not only in France, for the unification of Germany, for the centralization of the Iberian Peninsula, even for the consolidation of Italy. But in the countries swayed by the Habsburg coalition, the racial impulses were less clear, the national consciousness less distinct, and the dynastic bond which united them was wholly artificial. It expressed no common national feeling. It could only exploit. It could not satisfy national aspirations. Even in Austria and Castile, the Habsburg rule had something of the character of an alien domination. Thus, Spain was sacrificed to Milan and Naples and above all to the Netherlands. Germany was sacrificed to Austria, and Austria to the dream of a Habsburg supremacy in Europe. Louis VIII, Richelieu, and their successors were fighting in a more legitimate cause, the cause of a national kingdom. To this, more than to any wit of statesmen or skill of soldiers, such success as they achieved is due. This becomes the more clear when we observe the very moderate measure of wisdom which inspired the councils and the action of France in this momentous period. Of diplomacy, indeed, Richelieu was a supreme master. Even in Italy, he contrived to assemble a respectable coalition of Savoy, Mantua, and Parma to confront the predominant power. In Germany, it was his object, we cannot doubt, to prolong the war. This he could only do by the aid of Sweden. Sweden was invaluable to him. He bought her aid at a paltry price of a million livres a year, which has subsequently added a small contingent of troops. Sweden was threatened on the east and the west by the jealous powers of Poland and Denmark. He persuaded Poland to refuse the tempting offers made to her, 
and to conclude a 26 years truce with Sweden, 1635. He kept Denmark quiet, and amused her king with the futile duties of a self-important mediator. Sweden was anxious for peace, and would have accepted it at any time at the possession of Pomerania, or perhaps a substantial part of it had been guaranteed to her. He succeeded in persuading her that no terms which Austria could offer would be secure unless they were safeguarded by a general peace, in which the interests of all enemies of Habsburg domination should receive due recognition. In order to preserve their illusion that such a settlement was within view, he maintained from 1636 onwards continuous negotiations for peace. In his maneuvers to render these negotiations abortive, he was materially aided by the real unwillingness of Spain and Austria to conclude a general peace, or to negotiate with the hostile or unfriendly powers as a coalition. But he also used every weapon that the diplomatic armory contains. Negotiations require preliminaries. Preliminaries raise questions, which may seem formal, although they are really vital. Such was the question of safe conducts for the plenipotentiaries of the various powers to be represented at the projected congresses. Under this head, Richelieu contrived to raise the questions of the recognition of Dutch independence, of the rights of the Duchess of Savoy as a guardian of her infant son, of the rights in Hesse Castle of the Landgrave's widow, of the status of the parties to the Treaty of Prague, and more important still, of the right of the several estates of the empire to negotiate on a footing of independence with the king of Hungary and Bohemia, who happened to be, also, the emperor. He also made capital out of such objections, as could be urged against the validity of the election of Ferdinand III. The discussion of such matters kept the diplomats of Europe at work until 1641, when at length a compromise on these points was reached and it was agreed the plenipotentiaries should assemble and negotiate with those of the Emperor France and her allies at Munster, Sweden, and hers at Osnabrück. In the interval, he had persuaded Sweden, in 1636, 1638, and 1641, to renew her agreement against a separate peace. The first of the compacts was so precarious that it has never received ratification. The last was not for a term of years, but until the end of the war. He had the less difficulty in persuading Sweden to keep her engagements, since it gradually became clear that France desired, at any rate, no separate peace. When Sweden demanded, as the price of their alliance, that France should guarantee the Swedish conquests in Pomerania, Richelieu, or de Avaux, on his behalf, cleverly countered by requesting a similar guarantee of the French conquests in Lorraine. No more was heard of the inconvenient suggestion. When propositions were made for a general truce, France insisted on the condition of uti positis, and refused to maintain the full war subsidy during any period of truce. By these means the coalition was preserved, Swedish arms kept the emperor and his German allies fully occupied, and the victories at Banner and Tortensen redounded to the profit of France. With the United Provinces, similar methods were employed, but here the difficulty was less, since Spain would not consent to the recognition of Dutch independence, the indispensable condition of peace in this quarter. But in the sphere of military operations, far less ability was displayed. France was acting on interior lines from a consolidated territory against its scattered possessions of Spain. Sea power was thus a momentous factor, and France had created by the efforts of the cardinal an imposing navy. Yet for two years, 1635 to 1637, France acquiesced in the occupation by Spain of the two islands of Lorin, which blocked the French Mediterranean trade. Her naval achievements were confined to victories off Guteria, near San Sebastian, August 28, 1638, off Genoa on September the 2nd of the same year, and at Cadiz in 1640. None of these actions was of capital importance. 
and the great victories were left to Van Tromp and the Dutch. No substantial use was made of the naval superiority which these engagements seemed to show. The victory of Guteria did not prevent the French defeat at Fuenteravia. The navy protected the land operations in Roslyn and Catalina, but little else can be placed to its credit. On land, immense efforts were made. Five, six, or seven separate armies were kept up. Some 150,000 men were constantly in the field. Money was ruthlessly extorted and recklessly spent, but the general conduct of operations reveals no bold offensive, no concentration on a skillfully chosen objective. At the outset, indeed, Richelieu contemplated the conquest of the Spanish Netherlands in cooperation with the Dutch, and with the aid of disaffected subjects of the King of Spain, the Dutch were slow and cautious, and their conception of war was a series of laborious sieges. Had they been left to make war after their own fashion, they would yet have effected valuable diversions, with a more enterprising enemy might have won the lion's share of the spoil. But after the failure of the first campaign, French efforts in this direction, though costly and exhausting, were never pushed with determination. In 1636, indeed, France was hard put to it to defend her northern frontiers. French activity had been transferred to Franche Comte and the Rhinelands. Taking advantage of the opportunity thus offered, United Spanish and Imperial forces in July invaded Picardy, captured La Capelle, La Catalette, Roy, Corby, and threatened Paris itself. In due time they retreated, and the fortresses were sooner or later recovered. Thenceforth, Picardy was never without a strong covering force. The expense of a vigorous offensive would have been little greater but the record of warfare on this side carries little to the credit of the French. The siege of St. Omer in 1638 was a disastrous failure. The conquest of Cateau, Cambresis, and Landresis in 1637, of Hesdin in 1639, of Arras in 1640, after the Spaniards had been driven from the seas by the Dutch, and of Bapalme in 1641, are all that the French had to show for seven years of laborious campaigning in the north. The retention of Lorraine was no doubt a point of prime importance in the cardinal scheme, yet the treaty with Duke Charles in 1641 seems to show that Richelieu hardly hoped to retain it at the end of the war, and the places which were necessary to cover it, Philipsburg, Mainz, Koblenz, Trier, were allowed to fall into and remain in the enemy's hands. In this connection, the possession of Alsace was a vital consequence, but its acquisition was due to luck and diplomacy rather than to French arms. Bernard of Weimar and his German army were taken into French pay at an annual cost of four million livres. His victories in the Breisgau, 1638, and his capture of Bresach later in the same year, place Alsace and the Upper Rhine under his control. His death in the following year gave Richelieu the chance, which he promptly seized, of taking over his army and securing his conquests. Charles Louis, the ex-elector Palatine, while journeying through France incognito, in hopes that Bernard's army would hoist his flag, was seized and imprisoned until everything had been settled according to Richelieu's desire. French Comte might have seemed an easy prize. The territory was French, and formed a natural addition to the French dominions. In the wars of the 16th century, the protection of the Swiss had secured this province from attack. In this war, the Swiss appear to have taken little interest in preserving its centrality. The sultry inroads were made by French armies, and abortive sieges were undertaken, but nothing of moment was effected. End of section 17. Section 18 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick Seaman. Chapter 4. Richelieu. By Stanley Leaves, Part Four.
The warfare in Italy in Pedimont was perhaps the most futile and extravagant. No man in Europe knew better than Richelieu the importance of the Valtelline. Here at the outset, the brilliant victories of Rohan secured for him the necessary control, but unsupported and neglected, the gallant leader was forced in 1637 to surrender to the mountaineers whose freedom he was supposed to be protecting. He had perhaps shown too much talent, and no further employment was offered to him. In the following year, he died. The loss of the Valtelline controlled the situation in Italy. The death of the Duke of Savoy, October 7th, 1637, was a misfortune. The Duchess Christine, sister of the King of France, was with difficulty kept faithful to the French alliance, and her friendship was rather a burden than a profit. Prolonged efforts were necessary to uphold her authority against her brothers-in-law, Thomas and Maurice, who were backed by Spain. The death of the Duke of Mantua, September 24, 1637, left his dominions under the regency of his wife, who was hostile to France, and Mantua was only prevented from open secession by the presence of a French garrison and Casale. Parma left the coalition in the same year. Warfare never ceased in this region during these seven years, but in spite of the brilliant exploits of the Count de Harcourt in 1640, achieved with very scanty resources, all that France could boast in Italy was the imperfect maintenance of the status quo. On the side of Spain, the conquest of Rusalan was an obvious preliminary for more serious attack. Yet this was not undertaken until it was practically forced upon France by the revolt of Catalonia in 1640. Even then, Conde was allowed to fail before Richelieu and the king took the task seriously in hand. They completed it in 1642, just before the cardinal's death. Indirectly, the revolt of Catalonia and the revolt of Portugal in the same year were the results of the war and by weakening Spain helped the cause of France, but they were still more clearly the result of Spanish internal policy, the policy of concentrating authority without fostering national unity. Thus the imperfectly compacted kingdom yielded and split under the strain of war. On the frontier of Navarre, the siege of Fuenterrabia in 1638 was an ill-conceived and ill-executed enterprise, leading inevitably to disaster. Thus, at the cardinal's death in 1642, France had won little compensation for seven years of exhausting warfare. Lorraine had been retained, and Alsace had been acquired. French armies had been trained in war, their tactics improved, their personnel disciplined, the military organization developed. An effective instrument had been created for ministers who had a definite objective, a rational scheme of offensive, and above all, the courage to use their resources without reserve. But Richelieu was afraid of his generals. He divided their commands, he hampered them with instructions. Any great enterprise required the presence of Richelieu and the king, which meant that no risks would be taken, and overwhelming forces would be used to achieve some ostensible success. Military operations were also controlled by political considerations, and political considerations meant the unchallenged supremacy of the cardinal. In these circumstances, it is not surprising that no great general had appeared before the cardinal's death. Turenne and the Duke of Enghin, the great Condi, were trained in these wars but they held no independent commands until after his death. Enghin had already prepared his way to glory by marrying the cardinal's niece, a disparagement which he would certainly have refused had he foreseen the hour of Richelieu's death. The only sure qualification for high command under Richelieu was unquestioning submission and attachment to his person. Hence, we find great armies expended to no purpose under a condi, a cardinal de la Vallette, brisé à la Meire or à Guiche.
the circle of selection being limited to the cardinal's relations connections and humble adherents these were perhaps the best that could be found but little more could be expected of them than was actually achieved if equal opportunities had been allowed to rohan or gabriel or even harcourt the issue might have been wholly different no detailed examination of campaigns is possible in this place and indeed they present no features of exceptional military interest the foregoing summary may suffice to show the policy the objectives and the results of the seven years of war for whose conduct the cardinal was responsible halfway through the seven years december eighteenth sixteen thirty eight died that remarkable man francois de tremblay better known to history as the capuchin father joseph the fact that no difference can be observed in richelieu's policy or action after the death of father joseph is the best refutation of those fantastic legends which represent him as a malign and dominating influence inspiring richelieu with unholy schemes and thwarting his excellent intentions the fact seems to be that father joseph after a pious blameless and enthusiastic youth which found expression in mystical poetry of a high order and in romantic schemes for a crusade of all europe against the infidel turk fell in middle life entirely under the influence of richelieu after materially assisting his master in his progress to power he became his confidant his secretary his humbler self he was among other things a born politician his knowledge especially of german and italian affairs acquired partly in the course of his crusading missions was extensive and valuable he generally drafted the instructions intended for french agents which were then revised by the cardinal and transmitted through the ordinary official channels he was employed by the cardinal for negotiations for interviews and on missions his manner alternating between unctuous suavity and a delusive frankness served as a useful mask his unofficial standing made it easy to disavow him as for instance after the negotiations at ratisbon while his confidential intimacy with the cardinal gave him weight and credit careful research has revealed many minor differences of opinion between master and agent but none was of permanent importance and in the end the views of the cardinal as a rule prevailed father joseph remained to the last a faithful servant of the church of the order to which he belonged and of the order of sisters which he founded he may have refreshed his zeal with the prospect of the great crusade that was to follow when the habsburgs had been crushed but he nevertheless became the slave of a policy in which worldly considerations had undisputed supremacy and in which religion was always subordinated to statecraft his own bent in fact was entirely overruled by a more commanding personality other personal episodes belonging to this period may be quickly dismissed we need not pause to consider the subterranean influences which used the king's favorites marie de hautefort and louise de lafayette to undermine the cardinal's power from these as from all other court intrigues richelieu emerged victorious spain attempts to sway the king by secret correspondence with his wife were hardly more dangerous the unexpected almost miraculous birth of an heir in sixteen thirty eight and the birth of a second son in sixteen forty relieved the cardinal of his gravest apprehensions as to consequences which might follow the sudden death of louis orleans continued his desultory machinations but he was no longer dangerous the other malcontent bourbon prince the count of soissons took refuge in sixteen thirty seven at the court of sedan where he was permitted to remain in sixteen forty one bullion guise 
and Soissons, in alliance with the Habsburgs, thought the opportunity had come for a decisive blow. Supported by Lemboy, with an imperial army, they invaded France. The forces of Châtillon, which confronted them, were driven en route. But at that moment of victory, the Count of Soissons was mysteriously slain by a pistol shot. The figurehead of the conspiracy thus removed, Bouillon made terms, and Lamboy retired. The cardinal appears to have thought the occasion favorable for testing the fidelity of the Duke of Lorraine, who had recently made terms with Louis and commissioned him to aid in suppressing the rebellion. As may have been expected, he preferred to support it, and by such action gave ground for the reoccupation of Lorraine which followed in due course. In the ensuing year, a more romantic plot had a tragical ending. Henry, Marquis of saint mars was the second son of the Marquis of Ethiat, who had faithfully served the Cardinal in diplomacy, war, and finance. On the father's death in 1632, Richelieu took the boy under his personal protection and introduced him to the court in 1638, and the hope that by his attractive personality he would win the king's favor and counteract other inconvenient influences. Before very long, Saint Mars had become the king's accredited favorite and constant companion. But the position had its drawbacks. The young man loved pleasure and had ambitions. He found the king's amusements dull, his temper trying, and his company tedious. He was under the vigilant superstition of his powerful patron, and was expected to reveal to him the king's most intimate confidences. He fell in love with Marie de Gonzaga, who disdained the love of a mere grand écuyer, but held out to him hopes. If he attained a more distinguished rank, saint Ma misled, perhaps by the willingness with him, with which the king listened to and echoed complaints against the cardinal, formed the hope that by royal favor he might contrive to remove the minister and succeed to his authority. He sounded Louis and found that he was not at any rate prepared to take the necessary action himself. He therefore entered in relations with Gaston and with Bouillon. The three made a treaty with the king of Spain, 1642. Sedan was to be the base and refuge of the conspirators, but what further action was to be taken was never certainly agreed. Assassination was no doubt considered, but apparently rejected. The serious illness of Richelieu during the summer of 1642 gave hopes of his removal by natural means, but to the cardinal on his deathbed was brought through some mysterious channel a copy of the treaty with Spain. Taking advantage of a temporary improvement in his health, he arose and carried the compromising document to the king, saint Ma and his friends, and agent, de Thau, the son of the famous historian and statesman, were seized, brought to trial, condemned, and executed. saint Ma, at any rate, deserved his fate. Sympathy is wasted on a man so worthless and unfit for power. Bullion was arrested in the midst of the army of Italy, where he was in command, and escaped further penalty by the secession of Sedan. Gaston, as usual, betrayed all. He was declared incapable of any office and dignity, and on these conditions, pardon. The effort of this last struggle for power appears to have exhausted the remaining strength of the minister, and within three months from the death of saint Ma. Richelieu expired. December 4th, 1642. The secession of Mazarin to his authority and the concluding months of Louis's reign will be treated in a later chapter. For eighteen years the great minister had ruled the kingdom of France. He had claimed for his master and himself power over all persons and causes within the realm. He had elevated absolutism into a principle. Existing institutions Existing traditions have been forced to give way before his will. Claiming so much, he must be brought to account for all that he claimed. 
his great achievements in the field of diplomacy, his personal triumphs over rivals and enemies, the creation of a French army and a French navy, the lasting impression of his overmastering personality. These things give him a great place in history, but he must also be judged by his work as an administrator and by the effects of his work on the internal prosperity and development of France. France needed a great administer. The development of her institutions had not kept pace with her growth. The monarchy had accepted the heritage of a hundred feudal sovereigns. It had undertaken the task of welding a dozen races into a nation. All the men and all the treasures of the kingdom were at its disposal. The fund of loyalty and national enthusiasm on which it could draw was almost inexhaustible. But the machinery for the orderly execution of its purposes was still to be created. We may also think, and consequences were to prove, that safeguards against the abuse of its authority were needed. But we can hardly blame the statesmen who saw in the Parlement and the states general only so many obstacles to efficiency. The materials for a constitutional monarchy may have been present in France, though they were not very obvious to view. But the materials for an orderly, law-abiding, and beneficent monarchy were certainly present, and Richelieu did little or nothing for their organization. The most crying need was that for financial reconstruction. The influence of royal finance was all-pervading, the needs of the royal treasury unceasing and progressive. The income of Henry IV was some forty million of livres towards the end of his reign. His expenditure far less. The annual expenditure of Richelieu in his last two years was 160 to 180 million. Yet the financial organization that had served for Louis XI and Louis XII was still maintained without improvement. There was still a separate machinery for the collection and accounts of the Thai, Aid, the Gebe, and the Domain. The revenue was still diverted at its sources to meet local expenditure, so that hardly more than a half reached the royal exchequer. The system of audit and accounts was still hopelessly defective. A quarter of the revenue appears in the accounts in a lump sum, a qui au comptant, cash extended on items unspecified, the vouchers for which expenditure were burnt every three months. The indirect taxes were still farmed. The expenses of collection were enormous. It is estimated that the cost of levying the tie was 25%. Of levying the Aie and Gabal was not less than 40%. Extraordinary resources were even more wastefully procured. Offices to the value of 500 million livres were sold during Richelieu's ministry, of which some only 350 million reached the treasury. Not only did such devices mean in effect the borrowing of money at ruinous rates of interest, but the offices thus created hampered the public machine at every turn. It was the rule and not the exception for three officers to do the work of one, officiating in successive years. The interest of the public debt under Richelieu rose from 2 million to 21 million livres. In the last years of the reign, default was made on the public debt, and on salaries to the extent of three-eighths and the protesting rentier were severely punished. In 1641, the clergy were forced by the most open coercion to contribute four million livres in three years to the public revenue, in addition to their ordinary don gratuit. In 1639, the revenue from the communal octroi were seized for the king, and the communes were left without resources. At Richelieu's death, the revenue for three years had been anticipated. All these, except in the case of the clergy, occurred by the simple fiat of the king. In 1636-1637, the population of Limousin, Poitou, Angoumois, saint Angi, Gascony, rose in rebellion and were put down by force. In 1639, the rebellion of the Nupes 
in Normandy was supported by Le Parlement and the bourgeoisie of the principal towns. Meanwhile, financiers rapidly amassed enormous fortunes. Crown lands and church lands were sold. Sources of revenue were pledged in security for loans. The revenue raised by the War of Tai rose from 14 million to 69 million livres. The oppressive gabel produced 19 million, and the retail price of assault amounted to four francs of modern money per pound. Commerce languished, agriculture starved, parishes were abandoned, lands went out of cultivation, and the Thai was collected by armed men. For all this, Richelieu devised no single remedial measure. The burden of taxation was great. The distribution of it rendered its incidents even more galling. The Pays de Ata, Languedoc, Provence, Burgundy, Brittany, paid hardly more than one-third of their proper share. Richelieu endeavored, indeed, 1628 to 1632, to assimilate the financial conditions of some of those these provinces to the rest of France. But here his authority for once proved insufficient, and he had to compound with the freer provinces for the restoration of their liberties. Dauphine alone lost its privileges. Not only did the nobles and the clergy escape the more burdensome forms of taxation, but the myriads of officials, whose numbers were constantly growing, also avoided payment. Many professionals were exempt. Most of the chief towns paid a light composition for Thai. It is estimated that a fourth of the population of France went free of direct taxation, on one ground or another. Moreover, one third of France escaped the chief part of the gabelle. The burden of the unprivileged, and especially of the peasants, was the heavier in consequence. Richelieu himself, though profuse, was not avaricious. His income from ecclesiastical benefices was about a million and a half livres, and he received as much more from property and pensions. At his death, his fortune, though large, was not large in proportion to his opportunities. That he himself was no financer need not be laid to his charge, but that he did not discover and employ able financers is largely due to the principles which governed his public action. He required his men of finance to be as subservient as his generals. His bouillon and bouillet found him money. He did not understand, he did not care to understand the means. More capable ministers might have been less easy to control. Even their dishonesty was valuable, as placing them were completely in his power, should they at any time give offence. In general administration, Richelieu had made little systemic improvement. Local administration, so far as it existed, was in the hands of the heads of the five-and-twenty governments in which France was divided, and of the Parlement. The military local authority was in the hands of the governors, the civil authority in the hands of the Parlement. In times of weak government, the authority of governors had frequently been used in the cause of rebellion. Richelieu had made it clear how slight that authority really was, and it was proved that the rebellion, even of a Montmorency, was not dangerous. But the cardinal was naturally not inclined to increase the importance of the governors, and their office continued to be one rather of dignity than of power. Only six months' residence was customary, and even this was frequently evaded. With the Parlement, he was constantly in collision. They approved neither his financial edicts, nor his manner of dealing with political offenders, nor his contemptuous attitude towards the law. They were not suited for the work of administration, and if they had been, they would not have been suited to the cardinal. His methods were arbitrary and direct. He carried further the practice introduced by his predecessors of dispatching commissioners, maîtres de requête, to districts where action was necessary, under the name of intendant de justice, de police, et de finances. These officers received the widest authority to override every existing functionary or institution 
to order all matters at the pleasure of the central government, to try persons and causes without regard to the formalities of law. Similar officers accompanied the armies, where their simple procedure and extensive competence proved of the highest value in controlling and regulating expenditure and supply. Eventually, a system of intendant was created, but under Richelieu there was no system, no lie prescribed the duties of intendant or defined their powers. The dispatch of each intendant was an act of arbitrary force. The intendants were the direct agents of a lawless autocracy. In matters relating to justice, France was already well provided. The courts of the Président and the Parlement, with minor jurisdictions, covered the field well. The complaint was rather of the excessive complexity of the system and procedure than of injustice or defect. But Richelieu made it a practice in dealing with political offenders to discard the ordinary courts of justice and to proceed by the action of commissions of judges specially chosen to try the particular case. By such tribunals, saint Mar, the two, Montmorency, the Marshal de Maria, and many others were condemned. If a first commission showed any hesitation, it was dissolved and a second appointed. However clear the offense, the cardinal would not allow the law to make its normal course. The Parlement protested, but their protests were disregarded. In matters relating to public order, little progress was made. Nobility as a class neither required crushing nor were crushed. Impoverished by the high rate of customary expenditure in the court, and with the army, and by the fall in the purchasing power of the fixed dues which they received from their tenants, their chief ambition was to win the favor of the government, and to secure its patronage, rather than to thwart it. The destruction of royal fortresses except on the frontier was a wise measure of economy. Destruction of the fortified residences of the nobility may or may not have been necessary as a precaution, but such residents, for the most part, were indefensible against modern ordnance, and their destruction without indemnity was in any case an injustice. The practice of the magnates to raise rebellion on any occasion of discontent required severe repression. In the process of repression, it became clear how scanty were the actual resources controlled by such rebels. The general security of ordinary citizens under Richelieu's rule was neither greater nor less than had been in earlier times, and left much to be desired. The armies whose pay became more and more irregular lived upon the country where they were quartered. To be treated as a conquered country implied exceptional indulgence and not the reverse. In spite of the striking example made of the de Bouteville and de Chapelle, the presence, the practice of dueling was hardly less prevalent under Richelieu than it had been under Henry IV. The cardinal's police was admirable for the discovery of secret intrigues. For the security of common people, it was not intended. The almost complete freedom of the press that had existed up to 1630 was in that year destroyed, for the indulgent control of the Parlement and the Sorbonne was substituted a rigorous censorship, and a government permit was required for every publication. Of the press as a useful source of instruction to statesmen, he had no notion. The official Gazette de France contained all the information about public affairs which he thought desirable for the people. Richelieu's friendship for letters followed the same principle as his other efforts. The establishment of a central and supreme authority. This was an age when literary and social circles, or cliques, exercised a considerable influence. The dix-sept seigneurs assembled at the house of Bassompierre, Monsieur de Marais, and that of Madame de Rohan, Countess of Soissons, and the Prince of Condé, held similar gatherings. The Hotel de Rambouillet was the center for the Prichot. One of these clubs met at the house of Valentin Conrart to discuss literary positions. Richelieu heard of their discussions and offered them his protection and official recognition 
Though somewhat embarrassed, they had no choice but to accept, and in 1634 they were constituted as the French Academy. The Parlement, with considerable reluctance, registered their letters, patent, in 1637. The number of the members from the first was forty, of whom Balzac, Bautier, Campelain, Bogelas were the most distinguished. They accepted their prescribed mission to purify the French language and determine its canons according to the best usage. For this purpose, in 1638, they began at the suggestion of Chapelain, the compilation of their dictionary, in which the influence of Vogelis was predominant. The later history of the academy is beyond the scope of this chapter. The age of Richelieu was an age of a great religious revival in France. The Cardinal de Beaulieu founded the Oratory and multiplied institutions in destruction of clergy. Saint Vincent de Paul founded his Sous de la Charité and his Congregation of the Mission. The Ursulines and the Visitandines took in hand the education of girls and women. The Jesuit schoolmasters and professors were active everywhere. Richelieu himself did something for the reformation of the religious orders and procured his election as head of the three great orders of Cluny, Chateau, and Premontre, partly with this object. He did good service in composing the disputes between secular and regular clergy, in requiring of the religious license to preach and to confess, and in subjecting them to the authority of the bishops. It was his ambition to become head of the church in France, as he was ruler of the state, when the Pope thwarted his desire to be legate for France, he dreamed of becoming patriarch of a national church. Yet flagrant abuses went unremedied in the church. Non-residence, clarity of benefices, abbeys and priories in lay hands, the charging of lay pensions on ecclesiastical revenues, the employment of cardinals and archbishops in military commands, these disorders, the cardinal himself, a soldier and a pluralist, did not attempt to check. He is seen, perhaps, at his best in his treatment of the Protestants after their pretensions to political independence have been finally suppressed. The toleration which was accorded to them was real. The greatest consideration was shown for their susceptibilities, and the hostility of the Catholic population was kept in bounds. Their pastors were exempt from tie, a subvention of 200,000 livres was accorded to them. They were compensated for the loss of the property of the church in Bierne. Richelieu was anxious to win over the ministers and prepare the way for a general conversion. In this he was disappointed, but individual conversions were frequent, and the Catholic clergy were taxed to provide pensions for converted Protestant ministers. Of the growing influence of Jansenist opinions, he showed himself less tolerant, he inaugurated the long struggle between the monarchy and this sect by the imprisonment of the Abbey of St. Cyran in 1638. For reasons which are not altogether clear, he saw in these opinions a danger to the state, but the time was not yet come to enlarge upon this theme. Different estimates may be formed of the military achievements of the cardinal. As to the general tendencies of his political action, there is a less room for doubt. Talents, industry, perseverance, resolution, courage, these he possessed in the highest degree. The game of politics, as he understood it, and as it was generally understood, he played with consummate ability. Though at a vast expense, he checked the dangerous preponderance of the Habsburg coalition, and kept for France her proper place among the powers. The large population of the sacrifices which he imposed upon his country for this end were unnecessary. That the heritage of bankruptcy which he left to his successors was due to misgovernment, that his habitual contempt of law and justice was impolitic, as well as immoral, that he created no system to take the place of that which he destroyed, that the absolutism which he set up was lawless and disorderly, prosperity and nation power. These are defects which became the more flagrant, the more highly we estimate his gifts. The abasement of the magnates, the suppression of the Huguenot, the Habsburg Wars, even the maintenance of his personal power, these were legitimate ends, 
but in his choice of means he was reckless and provident. In his choice of persons he looked for subservience rather than for independent initiative. Of more exalted aims he had no conception. Of mercy and justice he took no account. Of created and beneficent statesmanship he had no share. Four-fifths of the field of political endeavor he left untouched, or touched only to encumber and destroy. In the peace of Westphalia, and the peace of the Pyrenees were of his making. So also was the revolution of 1789. He had revealed to the French monarchy the weakness of all those traditional and conventional restraints which had limited the power of the earlier kings for good, and more especially for evil. The autocracy was slow to unlearn the lesson he had taught. The bonfires of rejoicing which celebrated his decease were premature. His death was not to ease the bondage which his living will had imposed on France. End of section 18. Section 19 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5. The Vasa in Sweden and Poland, 1560-1630, by W. F. Redaway, Part 1. Gustavus Vasa, at his death in 1560, left the future of Sweden only half assured. His forty years of resolute government indeed had done much to establish in his dominions a condition of unexampled prosperity. The strength of the nation had grown as the authority of the crown increased. In 1520, Sweden had been a dependency of Denmark, unable to free herself from the political tyranny of Christian II without submitting to the commercial tyranny of Lübeck. Gustavus had given her independence, political, commercial, and ecclesiastical alike, and with it, the strength which was impelling her towards a policy of empire. The amazing progress which Sweden owed to the founder of the Vasa dynasty was achieved by a policy which was to leave deep marks upon her future. Necessity, Gustavus held, breaks law, not merely the law of man, but at times the law of God also. To him, necessity always meant the increase of royal power. Avaricious of power, he set himself to seize it at home and to avoid hazarding it abroad, and in both aims he succeeded. After his death, change in the policy of Sweden was inevitable. To maintain a strong monarchy might be possible, but the days of seclusion were numbered. A state which owed everything to the Protestant faith and the Baltic Sea could not remain indifferent while the fortunes of both were in peril. Apart from the Counter-Reformation, the decay of the Teutonic Order, the decline of the Hanseatic League, the awakening of Russia, and the expanding ambitions of Denmark were new arguments which must compel Sweden to take action. The methods of Gustavus, moreover, were such as no other king could follow. Himself a promoted noble, he pillaged the church remorselessly, and administered the kingdom like a great domain. Seizing manners by the hundreds, he looked to them for a revenue and even for an army, while he labored with marvelous energy to control the economic life of the whole nation. The policy, both international and internal, by which his sons Eric and John brought Sweden to the verge of dissolution, 1560 to 98, her deliverance by his third son Charles, 1599 to 1611, and the efforts by which, under Charles and his son Gustavus Adolphus, she gained organization, empire, and the status of a great power, form the theme of these pages. Eric the Fourteenth, who succeeded without question to his father's throne and treasure, had grown to manhood as heir to the kingdom. A lover of pomp, he is said to have declared that he must seek to subjugate more realms and lands, or he would not wear his crown. It may be doubted, however, whether the strength of Sweden warranted so complete a breach with the policy of Gustavus. Her resources ill responded to the breadth of her territory. The ancient province of Finland was indeed profitable to the crown. But Norway still stretched across the mountains, while foreign and often hostile territory intervened between Sweden and the states of Western and Central Europe. Her single precarious outlet to the North Sea 
was a narrow strip of territory at the mouth of the river Yota, where Elfsborg was to prove far from impregnable. Between Elfsborg and Kalmar stretched the coast provinces of Holland, Skana, and Bleking, those fertile plains of the southern peninsula which, like Gotland, the ancient stepping stone across the Baltic, were fiefs of the Danish crown. Smaland, the border province, was a stronghold of robbers and outlaws from both nations. From Kalmar to the northern limit of civilization, which adventurous peasants and fishermen were slowly pressing northward from Yevla, the long coastline with innumerable inlets for invaders justified the dictum of Gustavus Adolphus, we are nowhere weaker than in Sweden. The wealth of Sweden was no greater than might be looked for in a land where less than one million people were strewn over a vast area, and in a climate which neither incited nor richly rewarded industry. Foreigners in Sweden remarked that the people were long-lived, adaptable, and cheerful, but that they were unskilled in the arts and disinclined for sobriety and steady work. Communications were poor and commerce feeble. A great part of the royal revenue was paid in kind. The mines and fisheries, from which Gustavus had hoped so much, were not in themselves sufficient to support a large population or to supply an abundant revenue. Education, at a moment when Sweden had broken with Rome without as yet drawing full nourishment from Wittenberg, was at its lowest, and the government, by which alone these manifold defects could be remedied, was still rude and insecure. For the moment, indeed, the king was supreme. The hereditary settlement, Arferening, of 1544, by which elective gave place to hereditary monarchy, symbolized his triumph over church, people, and nobles. From each of these classes, however, a sovereign weaker than Gustavus must experience renewed rivalry for power. The church, crippled and plundered as it was, had begun to develop a force of corporate resistance, which baffled each of Eric's four successors upon the throne. The people, in spite of all the sharp lessons of Gustavus, had not completely renounced their practice of armed resistance to measures which displeased them. Only by fair words or a show of force could the crown secure the obedience of a province. Believing themselves defrauded if any intermediate authority was thrust between their sovereign and themselves, they obstructed the creation of adequate executive, judicial, and legislative organs of the state. In general, however, the influence of the people lay on the side of the Vasa against the caste which formed the most dangerous rival of the monarchy. The nobles, sons of the men who perished in the bloodbath of 1520, were enriched with the spoils of the church and had not forgotten that the hereditary settlement of 1544 was a blow to aristocracy. They had acquiesced in the elevation of the Vasa, but they conceived themselves to be entitled both to curtail the powers of the crown and to share in their exercise. Their ambition was to secure a position with regard to the king similar to that enjoyed by their peers in the empire. They claimed that their performance of night service, Rustjanst, the maintenance of a prescribed number of mounted soldiers, freed their estates from taxation and made them practically supreme over the districts in which they lived. To what extremes of lawlessness their pretensions might lead was seen when a bold noble annexed the lands and forests of the crown, punished one of his bailiffs who had fled to court, and when another bailiff cut down a wood, proposed to hang him, together with every peasant who had shared in the offense. The nobles possessed a monopoly of seats in the Rad, a small council out of which the Swedish diet, Riksdag, grew, and which, except in times of stress, performed the ordinary functions of a national assembly. The chief offices thus fell into their hands, and they protested strongly, and in the main successfully, against the employment of any officers of the state whatsoever who were not of native and of gentle birth. They thus formed a check on progress when the king was competent and a menace to the power of the crown in the hands of a ruler unequal to defending it. In the reign of Gustavus, the danger from the nobles was latent, and the danger from the church and people was averted by force. Eric was confronted, in addition, by danger from three great royal duchies, which was in great part created by his father. The testament of Gustavus, of which part received the sanction of the estates in 1547, 
and the whole in 1560, provided his sons with appanages, and attempted, by admonitions and regulations, to secure their future cooperation for the good of the kingdom. The most weighty part of the testament was that by which the king conferred upon the three half-brothers of Eric rights of hereditary sovereignty over great portions of Sweden. John was confirmed in the authority over Obo, Kumogord, Oland, and Rasseborg, which he had already exercised for several years, and thus remained master of Finland. Charles received the greatest part of Södermanland and Nerica with Vermeland, the whole forming a broad belt across the kingdom. Magnus, who was older than Charles but weaker in mind, was to rule adjacent territories to the south, including some two-thirds of Ostergotland. By whatever motives these dispositions were inspired, whether to save part at least of the realm from the sway of Eric, or to curb the nobles by the creation of a class of royal dukes, or to indulge an affection for the younger sons which was stronger than statesmanship, or to satisfy their equitable claim to share in the family inheritance. The result was that Sweden was divided and its very independence placed in jeopardy for more than 60 years. The death of Gustavus created a crisis in which the decisive factor was the character of his successor, Eric possessed a full share of the ability with which the descendants of Gustavus were endowed. His political insight was not contemptible, while his political imagination was active. A child of the Renaissance, he took delight in composing verses and prose, in painting and music, in languages, in translating the classics, and in studying the stars. But this tropical luxuriance, as Jayer finally suggests, was the product of subterranean fires. Eric was too ill-balanced to endure the stress of kingship. The extravagance with which he pressed his suit upon Elizabeth of England is well known. As crown prince, he had delighted in the wild orgies of his court at Kalmar, and he was already suspicious almost to the verge of madness. For three years, however, the young king grappled vigorously with his task. The most momentous problem of policy was the establishment of a single sovereignty within the Swedish state. In April 1561, Eric secured the concurrence of the estates in a statute known from the scene of the Diet as the Articles of Arboga. By this enactment, his brothers were compelled to renounce the dangerous prerogatives which the testament of Gustavus had conferred upon them. Dwellers in the duchies were to swear fealty to the king instead of to the dukes, and the royal supremacy was established in matters of war and negotiation, taxation, appeals, the nomination of judges and of bishops, and the conferment of nobility and privilege. This weighty assertion of the power of the crown was accompanied by the establishment of a royal court of appeal, which met one of the most pressing needs of the growing nation. A body of justices, Koenungs Nemd, was appointed, part to remain at Stockholm and part to go on circuit when required. Having bridled the dukes, Eric next endeavored to regulate the status of the nobles, to whose support his triumph at Arboga was due. To add splendor and security to the crown, he conferred upon his intimates the new dignities of count and baron, and endowed them with grants of royal revenues, which were moderate in amount, but hereditary. He then set himself to correlate the duties and the privileges attendant upon noble birth. The scale of knight service was fixed in 1562 by the Uppsala Constitution at the rate of one well-appointed horseman for every 300 marks of income from hereditary estates or 200 marks from fiefs of the crown. Manor house and home farm were not to be reckoned in, but every nobleman, however poor, must maintain a soldier or lose caste and submit to ordinary taxation. The burden imposed by the Uppsala Constitution was nominally less onerous by one half than that imposed by Gustavus in 1559, but Eric enforced his claims with such stringency as to annul this benefit and gradually to alienate the nobles. Meanwhile, the future both of the king and of his realm was being determined in Livonia. At this moment, the struggle for predominance in the Baltic, a struggle vital to the power which held both Stockholm and Obo, entered the phase which, within the compass of 160 years, 1561 to 1721, was to bring to Sweden her glory, her empire, and her downfall. The Teutonic order was moribund, 
and Eric as heir to Sweden and John as lord of Finland had united to oppose their father's policy of timid homekeeping and to secure for the Vasa dynasty a share in Estonia and Livonia. During the summer of 1561, the Protestant town of Reval became Swedish, but at the end of November, the order made complete submission to Sigismund II of Poland. Sweden, it seemed, must either abandon her hopes of aggrandizement or prepare for war. Russia and Denmark, however, were also candidates for the prize, and Sigismund suggested a third solution, which promised immediate peace at the hazard of future struggles. In July 1561, he proposed an alliance of Sweden and Poland against Russia, to be cemented by the marriage of one of his sisters with Duke John. Eric seemed inclined to acquiesce in an arrangement which would have made his brother all but heir presumptive to the Polish crown. In February 1562, however, he forbade the match and proceeded to capture Pernau. John, after long hesitation, defied both the royal command and the Articles of Arboga. In October, he married Catherine Jagelo and received seven fortresses in Livonia as security for the repayment of money borrowed by Sigismund. Eric, who suspected his brother of treasonable intrigues in Sweden, summoned the estates to Stockholm and procured from them a sentence of forfeiture and death against him, June 7, 1563. The Duke defended Obo, but in August he was forced to surrender to an army of 10,000 men. Many of his servants were put to death, and he was imprisoned in the lonely fortress of Gripsholm. There he remained for four years, while the king and his low-born minister, Goran Persson, subjected Sweden to a reign of terror. The downfall of John was accompanied by the progress of the Swedish arms in Livonia, but for both disasters, Poland was amply avenged by Denmark, her new ally. The relations between Eric and Frederick II had grown steadily worse. The hereditary rivalry between the Scandinavian kings was symbolized by the three crowns of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, which each of them bore on his escutcheon. It was now inflamed by the quest of empire on the eastern shore of the Baltic. Eric, who hoped to drive the Danes from the Scandinavian peninsula, toiled to win allies by way of marriage, and wooed Elizabeth of England, Mary of Scotland, and Christina of Hesse Castle. The Danes, on the other hand, made use of their superiority at sea by intercepting the Swedish embassies and supplies, until in June 1563 they were severely defeated off Bornholm by Jakob Baga. The emperor summoned a congress at Rostock, but strove in vain to preserve peace. In August, the war known as the Northern Seven Years' War was formally declared by Denmark, 1563 to 1570. Sweden was in great peril, for her rise had given offense to several powers. Frederick secured the alliance of the Poles, of the elector Augustus of Saxony, and of the men of Lübeck, who feared for their trade with Livonia and hoped much from the restoration of a Danish dynasty in Sweden. As against these diplomatic triumphs, Eric could only point to an agreement for seven years' peace with Russia. He failed either to develop the latent conflict of interest between the Allies or to secure counter-alliances with their several enemies. He alienated the Emperor by slighting the Congress of Rostock and lost the Hessian marriage by addressing a love letter to Queen Elizabeth which was seized and dispatched to the Landgrave of Hesse Castle by the Danes. Then, with the consent of his estates, he sued for the hand of René of Lorraine, only to affront all parties by a secret match with his mistress, Karin Mann's daughter, the offspring of a common soldier. In the field, the king's influence was even more disastrous than in the cabinet. While the Swedish army was a national force which might soon be made formidable, Frederick was trusting to some 30,000 German mercenaries, a host which could not long be satisfied with the spoils of Smaland and Vostergotland. Eric and Persson, however, were not strategists but barbarians, and the war became a series of brutalities. Both armies devastated where they could not conquer and not seldom put their prisoners to death. At home, the Swedes gained no signal success and suffered several grave disasters. Chief of these was the loss of Elfsborg, whose fall in September 1563 cut Sweden off from the North Sea. Such was the isolation of the kingdom that wine could not be procured for the administration of the Eucharist, and the king outraged the feelings of the hierarchy by authorizing the consecration of water or water mixed with honey. 
In September 1565, however, a foothold on the western coast was regained by the capture of Varberg, while in Norway, in Livonia, and on the sea, wherever Eric was not, the dreary struggle was waged on equal terms. Klaus Christerson Horn proved himself a worthy successor to Jakob Baga until he succumbed to the plague in 1566. Gustavus, moreover, by his lifelong invective against the Jutes, had made the war popular in Sweden. In March 1566, the estates protested that they were ready to sacrifice life, lands, and all that they had rather than submit to an adverse peace. The year 1567, however, witnessed the collapse of Eric's position both at home and abroad, though he gained the Russian alliance by undertaking to surrender the wife of his brother John to her rejected suitor, Ivan the Terrible. The Tsar afterwards asserted that he had believed her to be a widow and had wished to restore her to Poland in safety. Eric could not advance even such excuses as these. His infamy profited him but little. The Russian alliance did not save the Swedes from disasters in Norway and Livonia, while at home misgovernment was becoming insupportable. Eric's capricious tyranny had not spared the high nobility, and he was conscious of their alienation from himself. Haunted by fears of treason, he suddenly struck at the great family of Stjur, the kinsmen of his own half-brothers. In 1566, the young Nils Stjur was condemned as a traitor. The king forced him to ride through the streets of Stockholm with a crown of straw upon his head, then pardoned him and entrusted him with a mission to Lorraine. Next, with another change of purpose, he caused Goran Persson to indict the Stjur and many other nobles before the estates at Uppsala, and when Nils Stjur returned from Lorraine, he flung him into prison. On May 22, 1567, however, the king expressly guaranteed his safety. But two days later, he visited him in prison and stabbed him to death. The old Count Svantestjer, his son Eric, and two other lords were next dispatched by the soldiery, and the king's tutor, Burius, paid for his remonstrance with his life. The royal assassin fled from Uppsala and for some days wandered demented through the land. The interregnum attested both the weakness and the strength of the Vasa. No one arose, either to act for the king or to supplant him. John was in prison, Magnus had lost his reason, and Charles was still a boy. At this moment, moreover, the indicted nobles were found guilty of treason by the estates. Within a month, the king had recovered himself sufficiently to set about the work of conciliation, and he allowed Pearson to be condemned to death. In the autumn, however, he became possessed by the belief that John had supplanted him in the kingship, and in a grotesque encounter, the two brothers in turn did homage to each other. Meanwhile, the Danes were preparing to strike a blow of unusual severity. In a triumphant winter campaign, Daniel Ransau, the Turenne of Denmark, swept through Smaland and Ostrogotland, burned and pillaged more than 1,400 homesteads, and took by surprise the camp of the defenders at Norby. He crowned the bold enterprise by a masterly retreat, which encouraged Eric to give himself the airs of a conqueror. During the year 1568, the king steadily undermined his throne. He set John at liberty, restored Pearson to favor, made Karen Mann's daughter queen of Sweden, and extorted the recognition of her son as heir to the throne. At this time, however, John and Charles were organizing a revolt. On July 12th, one week after the coronation, the strong fortress of Vadstena fell into their hands. Their troops were few, but the rule of Eric had become impossible. He appealed to the dukes and to the people, fought bravely, and allowed his hated minister to be tortured to death, but all in vain. On September 29th, Stockholm opened her gates, and Eric was compelled to abdicate. In January 1569, he was deposed by the Diet. He was harried from prison to prison, but while he lived, the government could not feel secure. Early in 1575, a secret meeting of the Rod, together with the bishops and several priests, condemned him to death and two years later he was poisoned by command of his brother John. John III, who received the homage of the estates in January 1569, owed his position to the endorsement of his claim by Duke Charles and the nobles. He paid his debt to the former by renouncing the Articles of Arboga, and to the latter by conceding many privileges. The counts and barons received fresh grants of revenues and judicial rights, 
and became in all essentials a hereditary feudal aristocracy. The king swore to abstain from promoting lowborn ministers and secured the nobles against imprisonment without trial and against trial otherwise than by their peers. They were made free to engage in foreign trade and to sell the produce of their estates without regard to the commercial monopoly of the towns. Above all, night service was reduced from the standard of 1562. Henceforth, one horseman had to be maintained for every 400 marks of revenue in time of war and for every 800 marks in time of peace. Those who were too poor to perform night service might sell their lands and yet retain their caste. Concession to the nobles was thus the keynote of a reign in which the monarchy was menaced by a fresh peril. The rod was now recruited from nobles of a new generation, led by the houses of Bioca, Brai, Spara, Banner, and Fleming. Not a few of them were educated and traveled men, and in Eric Spare, they possessed a skillful apologist of oligarchy. Their ambition to control the hereditary monarchy through the rod was certain to tax the statesmanship of Eric's successor. John III, though himself ambitious, was no statesman. The obstinacy which he had displayed in Livonia was not weakened by adversity or by time. He loved regal pomp, and, though bankrupt, built more lavishly than any other king of Sweden. He possessed the hot temper of the Vasa and is said to have once literally trampled underfoot a recalcitrant clergyman. His natural bias towards theology had been strengthened by his studies while a prisoner and by the influence of his papist consort. As king, he neglected administration to pursue the chimera of autocratic religious comprehension and for many years made it his chief object to force his liturgy upon the people. Under such a king, in a land which still depended on personal government, the character and conduct of the duke became of great importance. Charles, who since Magnus had become insane, ruled in his own right over about one-twelfth of the nation, set an example which contrasted strongly with the misrule which prevailed beyond the confines of his duchy. He claimed, moreover, to be entitled by birth to a share in the sovereignty of the kingdom, and as the strongest of the sons of Gustavus, he exercised great influence on policy. As a rallying point of opposition to the injurious innovations of the king, he rendered invaluable service to the state. The intrigues of John with the Counter-Reformation and with Poland were steadily watched by a harsh and unbending colleague of high courage and Calvinistic sympathies, whose ideal was the maintenance of the Vasa dynasty by adhesion to the principles laid down by Gustavus. The accession of the husband of Catherine Jagalo was equivalent to peace with Poland. In foreign affairs, therefore, the first duty of the new government was to bring to an end the destructive and unprofitable war with Denmark. As early as November 1568, indeed, the envoys of the rebellious dukes had signed a treaty at Rilaskilda by which Sweden surrendered her conquests, yielded the right to wear the three crowns, and paid 200,000 thalers. Frederick offered to renounce the indemnity, but John and the estates preferred to fight on in the hope of driving the Danes from the peninsula. The campaign of 1569-70, to 70, however, only increased the need of peace. The Danes recovered Varberg and sent a fleet to Reval, while Ivan, balked of the wife of John, flung his ambassadors into prison. France and Poland offered in vain to mediate, but the emperor was more successful, and the Seven Years' War closed, as it began, with a congress at Stettin. After more than five months' negotiation, the Peace of Stettin was concluded, December 1570, on the basis of the mutual restoration of conquests. The question of the Three Crowns was referred to an imperial court of arbitration, and Sweden was compelled to redeem Elfsborg by the payment of 150,000 thalers. To raise this sum, nominally rather more than 33,000 pounds, it was necessary to subject all movables in Sweden to an inquest more searching than that of Domesday. The peasants contribute one-tenth of their substance, the unburnt towns one-twelfth, and the burnt towns one-eighteenth. Payment was made in no less than seven currencies. The tax gatherers were compelled to compute the decline in value from the standard money of Gustavus through the best, medium, and ordinary impressions of Eric, down to the still baser coins issued by John in 1568, 1569, and 1570. 
Further debasement, however, was yet to come, for a 13 years' war with Russia had begun. In the days of Gustavus, Ivan's hordes had sold captive men and women for a few pence. In 1573, when they took Weissenstein, they bound to stakes the survivors of the little garrison and roasted them alive. Sweden was too poor to pay for vengeance, and in 1577 she had lost all Livonia save Raval. At this point, however, the king of Poland, Stephen Bathory, intervened. Poles and Swedes in alliance overthrew the enemy at Venden, 1578, drove him from Livonia, invaded Ingria, and took Narva, September 1581. The Tsar, though shut out from the Baltics, was glad to conclude a truce with both states. The truce of Pliusa with Sweden was to run for three years, reckoned from August 1583, and in 1585 the term was prolonged to 1590. In 1583, for the first time for 20 years, Sweden was at peace with all her neighbors. Within her own borders, however, she was torn by strife. The weak and fitful absolutism of the king could not fail to provoke general opposition, and it seemed at times as if civil war were in sight. The king's extravagance imposed unwanted taxation upon a people harried by plague and exhausted by war. Too feeble or too self-satisfied to create any permanent organs of administration, John carried on his slovenly rule with the aid of secretaries, a practice which his subjects deemed unlawful. Shocked by the many abuses, the Rod continually but vainly protested, on one occasion begging the king to refrain from damaging his health by the bursts of collar which their interference provoked. But the brunt of resistance, ecclesiastical and political alike, was borne by Charles. The causes of discord between the brothers were innumerable, and the chief of these was beyond remedy. In church matters, in taxation, and in the appointment of officials, the duke asserted an independence which was clearly incompatible with the unity of the kingdom and the sovereignty of the king. On the other hand, it was Charles alone who maintained good government, Protestantism, and national freedom so far as his power extended. For the third time since the death of Gustavus, the alliance of the nobles decided a conflict between his sons. In January 1582, John secured from the Diet at Stockholm both the acceptance of his liturgy for the whole kingdom and the substantial revival of the Articles of Arboga against the pretensions of the Duke. In 1585, moreover, less than 16 months after the death of Catherine, John widened the breach by his mesalliance with Gunilla Bielka. In 1587, indeed, Charles gave way sufficiently to admit of the promulgation at Batsina of a constitution drawn up by Eric Spare to record the victory of the king. The liturgy, however, he would never tolerate. The clergy of his duchy were denounced by the king as members of the devil, and the royal bailiffs were instructed to imprison them as outlaws if they set foot in royal Sweden. Henceforward, however, the quest of the Polish crown and the quarrel with the rod which arose from it stood foremost in the mind of the king. End of section 19. Read by Colleen McMahon. Section 20 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5. The Vasa in Sweden and Poland, 1560-1630, by V. F. Redaway, Part 2. The death of King Stephen Bathory in December 1586 offered John an opportunity of consoling himself for his own rejection in 1573 and 1574 by securing the Polish crown for his son Sigismund. After long hesitation, the prince resolved to become a candidate. His competitors were the Tsar Feodor Andreas, brother of the late king, and four Austrian archdukes. Thanks in great part to the unscrupulous tongue of the Spar, Sigismund was able to outbid them all with the delusive undertaking to cede to Poland the Swedish conquests in Livonia. The Queen Dowager and the Chancellor Zamoyski procured his election by the nobles on August 9, 1587, but three days later the Zabrowski faction prevailed upon the Senate to choose Archduke Maximilian as king. In 
In mid-September, Sigismund landed at Danzig, only to find himself dependent for throne and safety on Zamoyski's troops. While the impossibility of either repudiating or fulfilling his bargain with regard to Livonia heightened the difficulty of his position. The repulse of Maximilian from Krakow, where Sigismund held his entry, and the surrender of the Archduke after a decisive battle at Pishin in Silesia, January 1588, did not bring the troubles of the former to an end. Some hated Sigismund for his Swedish birth, which made him in their eyes no better than the Germans, whose dress and language he affected. Many missed him in the frank, genial, and martial temper of a Polish sovereign. Zamoyski, rather than the king, led the ascendant party in the state. Sigismund's position in many respects resembled that of William III in England, who likewise wearied of the crown. Early in 1589, he entered upon secret negotiations with a view to installing the Archduke Ernest in his stead. The conspiracy against the Republic was chastised by a public humiliation which left the monarchy even weaker than before. At the so-called Diet of Inquisition in 1592, the primate of Nessen solemnly arraigned the conduct and policy of the king. Sire, think upon your oath, he cried. Take warning by your predecessor, Henry of Valois, who broke faith and perished miserably. Zamoyski, who remained till his death in 1605, the champion of Polish nationality, added words of defiance and warning and demanded the dismissal of the foreign guards. At length the king capitulated, and promised in writing that he would never abandon the kingdom, or diminish the privileges of the nation, or nominate his successor. Before Sigismund sailed from Sweden to Poland, the prospect of a personal union between states so incompatible had compelled John and the Rod to formulate a plan for their future relations. Both before and after his mission to Warsaw, Eric Spar strove to safeguard the interests of Sweden and of the Rod by means of a document finally signed by John and Sigismund at Kalmar, September 1587. The so-called Statute of Kalmar asserted complete equality between Poland and Sweden, and provided for arbitration of their differences on equal terms. In spirit, however, it recognized the presence of the older kingdom. Sigismund, when king of both countries, might live in Poland on condition of maintaining a Swedish council and chancery at his side, and of visiting Sweden at least once in three years. In law and government, in foreign policy and religion, the statute provided for the independence of Sweden and her provinces in Livonia and Russia, with a care which extended even to the possibility of the king's inducing the pope to absolve him from observing its provisions. The realm, however, was to be independent only in order that the Rad might govern. The substance of power in Sweden was to pass a council of seven great nobles, one of whom alone was to be chosen by the duke. The design to depress Charles to the rank of a noble was so patent that the statute was concealed from him for several years, and he therefore never acknowledged its validity. No sooner had they reached their goal than both father and son wished to retrace their steps. John, soured by opposition and weary of ruling, cared for nothing save to regain the companionship of his heir. He favored Sigismund's plan of abdication and met his son at Reval in the summer of 1589, resolved to bring him back to Sweden. The Swedes, however, united with the Poles in protesting against the repetition of the crime of Henry of Valois. Even the staff of John's army raised its voice to condemn so wanton a challenge of war. John, who had consistently defied the rod, declaring that he would go to Reval, though men should fall as grass in summer before the scythe, answered only with harsh rebukes, but Sigismund, on whom many influences were at work, proved more pliable. At the end of September, after two months of intercourse, father and son parted, John with a thirst for vengeance upon the rod which the remnant of his days proved too scanty to appease. In his bitterness against his ancient allies, John sought reconciliation with his ancient enemy. In 1590, he surrendered to the duke all the advantages won at Arboga, Vadstena, and Kalmar, ascribing the several statutes to the machinations of wicked men. 
Of these terms, Charles gladly took upon himself a great part of the burden of government and countenanced the king's campaign against the rivals of monarchic power. Eric Spar, Hogenskild, and Turbilke, Axel Leonsfjord, and other great nobles were imprisoned and deprived of their fiefs on charges of treason, of which most tangible was their original advocacy of the acceptance of the Polish crown. At the same time, the hereditary character of the monarchy was strengthened by a provision for an eventual female succession. The discord in Sweden favored the Russians, who had renewed the war in January 1590. While the aged king could only prosecute his generals and negotiate with the Tsar, in November 1592, he died. At the death of John, Sweden and Poland became associated under the sway of a king incapable either of compromise in politics or of tolerance in religion. Inscrutable, imaginative, chaste, tenacious, and able, Sigismund was by no means a force to be despised. The elective character of the Polish crown and the jealousy of the nobles towards the relics of royal power combined with his Swedish birth and Jesuit education to prevent him from becoming a Polish patriot. Unrestrained by ties of nationality, he surrendered himself to the service of Rome, and at her behest continued to bear the burden of Polish kingship. So to augment his power that he might become the northern counterpart of Philip II, a monarch who should purge Poland of heresy and bring Sweden and even Russia into the fold, this was the dream of his life. The Jesuits were his counselors, the Habsburgs his allies, and the Pope his master. Clement VIII, whose interest and influence in Poland had survived his mission of conciliation in the early days of Sigismund's rule, was not slow to insist upon the duty of converting Sweden. In the spring of 1593, he sent Bartolomus Pavinsky with a contribution of 20,000 scudi to further this aim. Sigismund was admonished to fill the vacant Swedish seas with Roman Catholics, and to provide in Stockholm, or if that were impossible, in Poland, a Jesuit college for the Swedish youth. Meanwhile, the Swedish church declared its Lutheranism by the Uppsala Resolution, already noticed in the previous volume, which became the national covenant of the Swedish people. The fanatic Abraham Angermanus was appointed to the Metropolitan See of Uppsala, and all preparations were made for securing ecclesiastical guarantees from the king as a condition of his coronation. Amid the storms of the Counter-Reformation, however, Sweden needed a ruler who could give her more than promises to refrain from assailing her church. The union devised at Kalmar, and upheld by the great nobles, would at best revive the irresponsible aristocracy with which Gustavus had done away. It was likely to degrade Sweden to the position of a Polish dependency, to imperil her church, and to sacrifice her empire. The natural center of resistance to the vassalage of his country was Duke Charles, who had effected a reconciliation with the Rod and arranged, with the sanction of a small meeting of the estates, that they should govern jointly with himself during his nephew's absence, January 1593. The authority of Charles, however, as none felt more keenly than himself, was indispensable to the welfare of Sweden rather than conformable to her laws. The history of the years 1592 to 1599, during which Sigismund remained king of Sweden in name, records the successive stages by which an impossible position changed into revolution. First it became clear that a genuine regency of Charles on behalf of Sigismund was impractical. While great nobles such as Claus Fleming, the ruler of Finland, refused to recognize any authority but that of the king, Charles and the Rod tried in vain to extort from him a guarantee of the Uppsala resolution, and failing this to prevent him from setting foot in Sweden. At the end of September 1593, he landed at Stockholm and Abraham Angermanus unwillingly stood face to face with the papal legate Malaspina. Sigismund found Duke, Rod, and Diet unanimous in their demand for religious guarantee, and the favor which he could not refrain from showing to Poles and Romanists embittered the long struggle which followed. The king resisted with all his might the constitutional innovation of a guarantee prior to coronation. At last, however, he was forced to give way. He recognized the election of the heretic archbishop 
and received his crown at Uppsala from the heretic bishop of Strangness, February 1594. The victory had been won by the firmness of Charles. Scouting the king's offer of privileges for himself as the price of privileges for the Romanists, he arrayed an army at Uppsala to uphold the policy of no guarantee, no coronation. Sigismund, however, protested secretly, and promised to the papists what he had sworn to deny them. By the advice of Malaspina, he conferred upon six of his dependents the dignity of Lord Lieutenant, Stathalare, hoping thereby to secure protection for the Romanists and to curtail the authority of Duke and Rod. Early in August 1594, he returned to Poland. Charles sought to frustrate the disintegrating policy of the king by renewing his alliance with the Rod and by demanding the full powers of an administrator of the kingdom. The benefits of his rule were patent to all. He earned the honorable nickname of Peasant King, Bondekonung, he contrived to pay the army, reduced the face value of the debased coin, founded towns, and restored Uppsala as the seat of learning. In May 1595, moreover, he concluded the peace of Tuzin with the Tsar. At Tuzin, the Swedes agreed to surrender the county of Kekscholm in return for the recognition by Russia of their title to Narva and Estonia, while a boundary commission was appointed to avoid the recurrence of old disputes. The establishment of peace with Russia, and perhaps also the birth of his son Gustavus Adolphus, December 9, 1594, encouraged Charles in the inevitable conflict with Sigismund, the Romanists, and the Lord's Lieutenant. In order to set his authority beyond dispute, he took up the weapons of his father. First he threatened to resign, and when this no longer sufficed to bend the rod to his will, he made a direct appeal to the people. In October 1595, the estates, including representatives of the army, obeyed his summons to Soderkuping and granted him all that he desired. Romanist priests were expelled from the kingdom, Romanist laymen from office, and Sigismund was to rule only through the agency of Charles and the Rod. Though some of the nobles dissented from the resolution of Soderkoping, the duke found in it a sufficient warrant to proceed. He pressed his claims with the masterful and lawyer-like assertion, which marks the Vasa, arguing that Sigismund, who had sworn to keep the law of Sweden, had thereby abjured the right to veto what a diet resolved, he fell upon the Romanists and the Lord's lieutenant. Claus Fleming and the army of Finland, however, supported the king and Charles failed to induce the Rod to levy war against them. He therefore broke with the Rod and the great nobles, but again courted and received a mandate from the nation. In February 1597, the estates, disregarding the inhibition of Sigismund and the unprecedented absence of the Rod, met at Arboga and admonished all men to embrace the cause of the duke. Soon Elfsborg and Kalmar were in his hands, and every province had endorsed the Arboga Resolution. Eric Spar, Sten Banner, and the three Gustafsons fled the country. The commandant at Kalmar swore to resist Sigismund, and the revolution reached the stage of war. Once more, a Vasa called the Swedish peasants to arms against a monarchy which, although the nobles for the most part adhered to it, was in fact a foreign tyranny. In 1596 and 1597, Claus Fleming was forced to put down two peasants' risings in East Bothnia, and in the following year, the men of Dalarn tortured and murdered James Neve, a royal officer who strove to rouse them against the duke. At Stockholm, August 1597, at Uppsala, February 1598, and at Vadstena, June 1598, National assemblies showed that neither the abstention of a faction nor the commands of the king could shake the alliance between duke and people. In 1597, Charles descended upon Finland, where Stellarm had succeeded Fleming, and took Abo. Next year, Gustav Banner and Ture Bilke fled to Denmark. At last, Sigismund resolved to assert his authority by force of arms. In July 1598, he dispatched Stellarm with 3,000 men to Groneborg, north of Stockholm, 
while he himself sailed from Danzig to Kalmar. The army of Finland, which arrived first, fled at the sight of a few peasants led by two professors from Uppsala. The king, however, was admitted to Kalmar and Stockholm, and many nobles embraced his cause. He sailed northward to Stegborg, where a long negotiation under arms with the duke developed into a battle. The royal troops gained the upper hand, but Sigismund called a halt at the moment of victory, only to be routed a fortnight later at Stangbro, September 1598. He surrendered five members of the Rod as the price of an armistice, and it was provided by the Treaty of Linkoping that both forces should disband. Charles kept faith, but Sigismund, as usual, played false. He fled to Poland, where he was received with enthusiasm, and declared that he would return to Sweden as a conqueror. This conduct only hastened his deposition. In February 1599, an assembly of nobles and bishops at Jönköping declared that, unless the king would return to Sweden without an army, or send his son Vladislav to be brought up in the evangelical faith, they could obey him no longer. In July, after Charles had stormed Kalmar, Sigismund was formally deposed by the Diet assembled at Stockholm. Three months later, the conquest of Finland was complete. At the same time, Narva joyfully accepted the Protestant Charles, and in April 1600, Estonia sought his protection against the aggressive nationalism of the Poles. There was much, however, to mitigate and to disguise the revolution which was thus accomplished. The actual government of Sweden underwent a little alteration. Sigismund had never ruled, and Charles was not yet king. The hereditary prince of the realm of Sweden and Duke of Södermanland had defeated an attempt of his nephew and the great nobles to deprive him of the political influence which he had acquired before the death of John, and which the mass of the nation was resolved that he should retain. His ideal of government, which was wholly conservative, remained unchanged. It was the personal rule of the head of the House of Vasa, fettered only by his oath to the nation and by the law of Sweden. Valuing the principles of Gustavus more than primogeniture, he took the crown from the head of a nephew without any ambition to place it on his own. To him, the revolution was a necessary but unwelcome act of policy. The Swedish nation had nonetheless usurped by force rights which it had granted to the Vasa in 1544, but which in the hands of Sigismund menaced its independence and its religion. This was revolution, and it was glorious because it defied not merely Sigismund and his faction, but also the Catholic reaction in Europe. By his championship of Protestantism, as in much else, Charles IX connects the work of the first and of the second Gustavus. In personal character and in domestic government, Charles IX was his father's heir. He showed himself, it is true, more devout but less virtuous than Gustavus, while in his dealings with men he was more upright but less adroit. Both kings were brave, indefatigable, grasping, suspicious, violent, and practical. In husbanding the national estate, in frankly taking the people into their council, in swiftly overwhelming opponents, and in pressing to the utmost every royal claim, the founder and the re-founder of the Vasa dynasty were alike. Gustavus, however, was compelled by circumstances to confine himself to endeavors at home in Sweden. But Charles, on the other hand, played his part on a stage enlarged by forty years of rivalry with the nations of the north. In an augmented and less secluded Sweden, he practiced anew the principles of his father and thus rendered possible the achievements of his son. A severity not less than that which Gustavus had shown to pretenders was dealt out by Charles to the party of Sigismund. The victories at Kalmar and in Finland were followed by executions, among them that of the innocent son of Claus Fleming. These acts of vengeance foreshadowed the tragedy of the rod. In February 1600, when the estates met at Linkoping, Charles selected 153 of their number to try 13 great nobles who he accused of treason. The judges, though temporarily released from their allegiance to the duke, gave sentence according to his will, and Eric Spar, Sten, and Gustav Bonner, Ture Bilke, and Bengt Falk 
were beheaded in the marketplace. Five years later, after a similar trial at Stockholm, the old fox Hogenskjeld Bielke shared their fate, and in 1604, the prescription of lesser men was completed at the Diet of Norkoping. If Charles showed no mercy to his traitors, he was himself pedantically careful of the hereditary right to the crown. The deposition of Sigismund was conditional, and more than once a loophole was left open for the eventual succession of his heir Vladislav. The Diet of Linkoping, however, provided that after five months' grace the succession should pass to Charles the Ninth, then to Gustavus Adolphus, and his heirs male, and failing such, to Duke John of Ostergotland, Sigismund's half-brother, at that time aged ten. Yet it was not until four years had elapsed, and John had publicly renounced his birthright, that Charles consented to style himself king. His coronation was deferred until 1607. The Eric's Gate, his inaugural progress through the realm until 1609. Finally, by his will, Gustavus Adolphus was not to succeed him unless John should waive his claims when grown to manhood, and the estates should choose his cousin king. As the bloodbath of Stockholm in 1520 had removed domestic rivals from the path of Gustavus, so the bloodbath of Linköping cleared the path of Charles the Ninth. Secure against faction in Sweden, he was able to fling himself into the struggle with Poland, which lasted throughout his reign, and the struggle with Denmark, which threatened at the beginning and broke out at the end. In 1600, Sigismund took steps to make a national affair of his dynastic quarrel. He ceded Estonia to Poland, but failed to win more than the passive acquiescence of the Diet in a war with Sweden at his own risk and cost. Nevertheless, the Poles imprisoned the Swedish envoys, and Charles replied by invading Livonia with some 9,000 men. August 1600 By March 1601, he was master of the lands north of the Duna. The castle of Kokenhausen and the city of Riga barred his progress, but the Livonians showed signs of sympathy with their fellow Protestants in the struggle with the Romanist power. The peril of their province, however, roused the Poles, and in five campaigns they proved that they were still the foremost warriors of northern Europe. In 1601, they reconquered Livonia as far north as Valmar, where they captured Karl Carlsen Gillenheim, the king's natural son, and Jacob de Lagardie, whose mother was the natural daughter of John III. So long as the king lived, Sigismund kept Karl Carlsen in prison, often in chains, thus provoking a fresh animosity within the house of Vasa. In the campaigns of 1602, 1603, and 1604, Zamoyski and Chodkiewicz made steady progress in recovering and defending the fortresses which dominated the exhausted plain. They penetrated into Estonia, and the Swedes twice failed to retake Weissenstein. In 1605, therefore, after the unsuccessful General Stalarm had been condemned for treason, Charles himself resumed the command which he had laid down after his first successes. He lacked, however, the coolness of a successful strategist. At Kirkholm, a day's march southeast of Riga, he fell upon Chodkovich with a greatly superior force, but his rash generalship brought upon his army a terrible defeat. September 1605. The Poles could boast that the Swedes left upon the field thrice as many dead as Chodkovich had men. Barely escaping with his life from a field where some 8,000 of his troops perished, Charles returned to Sweden as hastily as he had come. King and nation alike faced with courage both the wreck of the army of Livonia and the prospect that the Russian pretender, known to history as the first false Demetrius, would as Tsar reward Sigismund with his alliance. Next year, though the Swedes in Livonia were still too weak to take the aggressive, the death of Demetrius and Zamoyski paralyzed their opponents, while in Sweden the Catholic Petrus Petrosa planned in vain to assassinate the king. It may well be that the greatest dangers which confronted Charles were due to his own stubborn Calvinism. The Swedish church, no longer subservient to the crown, scouted the king's proposals for even the smallest modification of its intolerant Lutheran teaching. From 1607 to 1610, Charles made futile efforts to unite the two communions. By threatening to decline the crown, he continued to induce the estates to accept a clause in the royal guarantee of 1604, which provided that the Uppsala Resolution and the Augsburg Confession 
should be the rule of the government only so far as they were founded on God's word in the scriptures. Now, as in 1593, however, he displayed towards the Lutherans a statesmanlike restraint which contrasts strongly with his violence towards the rod and foreign powers. Although war and religious controversy were raging, the restless energy of Charles found vent in many domestic reforms. In 1600, he took a great step towards the establishment of a provincial standing army. Next year, as he returned from Livonia, he paused to organize the government of Finland and to cut down the liberties of the nobles to the level of those enjoyed by their peers in Sweden. He then journeyed round the shores of the Gulf of Bothnia, making a choice of sites for towns. In May 1602, he met a diet at Stockholm and struck the keynote of his domestic policy by restoring the rod in conformity with the law of the land. This measure, though conservative, was not reactionary, for a decade of persecution had tamed the existing generation of high nobles. Thenceforward, the crown possessed in the rod a corporation of notables whose services, individual and collective, it could claim on behalf of the realm. At the same time the king grappled with questions of the codification of law and the establishment of a supreme tribunal, both of which projects cost him much toil and brought little immediate advantage. In 1604, a Great Succession Act was framed. This arranged for the hereditary devolution of the crown upon both male and female vasa, while it took the right of inheritance from all who departed from the established religion, or married a wife holding any false religion, or married without the knowledge of the estates, or accepted another throne. With this Bill of Rights, which, excepting perhaps Charles himself, every successor of Gustavus had transgressed, was coupled an enactment that no dissidents in matters of religion should be suffered to dwell or to hold property in Sweden. Only the firmness of the king saved the followers of Zwingli and Calvin from express condemnation. Sweden still lacked anything like an organized administration, and men competent to govern were rare. Impatient at the dearth of qualified assistance, Charles made such impractical proposals as that every nobleman should forfeit his nobility if he failed to provide his sons with learning sufficient for their serving the state in office. While the number of educated nobles was slowly increasing, the main burden of directing the administration still fell upon the king. Charles promoted manufactures, regulated commerce, worked minerals, controlled the bailiffs of the crown, planned canals, reformed weights and measures, and raised up such abiding monuments to his memory as Karlstad, Philipstad, Maristad, and Gothenburg. These manifold contributions to the political and economic structure of Sweden were made under a cloud of war which did not lift as the rain advanced. In Livonia, Count von Mansfeld gained fortresses when the Poles were absorbed in domestic strife and lost them again when Chodkovich and an adequate force confronted him. As the result of four campaigns, 1607 to 1610, the Swedish power was restored in Estonia and overthrown further south. In 1611, an armistice suspended the unprofitable strife. The combatants, however, were still the allies of conflicting parties in Russia, where a second false Demetrius had claimed the throne with Polish support. Early in 1609, Charles had concluded at Vyborg an eternal alliance with the Tsar Basil against Sigismund and his successors. Next year, in the hope of gaining the county of Kekscholm for Sweden, Jacob de la Gardie led an army of mercenaries to Moscow. Meanwhile, Zolkevsky was dispatched by Sigismund to make Vladislav Tsar. In June 1610, he encountered the Allies at Clusinio. The mercenaries deserted, the Russians fled, de la Gardie and his 400 men capitulated, and the throne of Basil collapsed. In 1611, according to a treaty between the Poles and Moscow, Vladislav became Tsar. De la Gardie therefore seized Kexholm in March and Novgorod in July, and concluded with Novgorod a treaty which secured the throne for Gustavus Adolphus or his brother Charles Philip. At the moment when the duel between the Vasa rivals entered upon this new phase, the ambitious young king of Denmark, Christian IV, at last prevailed on his estates to sanction a war with Sweden. 
The claims of the Vasa to wear the three crowns and to exercise rights of sovereignty over the laps in the extreme north of Scandinavia played their wanted part among the Danish grievances, while the foundation of Gothenburg and the Swedish veto upon trade with Riga and Kurland formed more substantial excuses for war. Thus menaced from two sides, Charles met his estates at Orebro, November 1610. He was now worn and aged. Men complained that he was led by low-born counselors. Twice he had been struck down by apoplexy, and he was forced to leave Gustavus Adolphus to speak on his behalf. His spirit, however, was unbroken, and it was his firmness which induced the reluctant Diet to defy the Danes and to provide for a new army of 25,000 men. In April 1611, Christian declared war, and immediately dispatched forces to the mouth of the Gotha and to Kalmar. Near Kalmar, which gives its name to the war, the two kings confronted each other throughout the summer months. Gustavus Adolphus, now in the field as well as at home, his father's mainstay, surprised Christianople, but the great fortress of Kalmar was treacherously surrendered to the Danes. In his rage, Charles challenged Christian to single combat, receiving, however, only coarse taunts in reply. At the close of the campaign, he turned towards his capital, but died before he reached it, October 1611. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5. The Vasa in Sweden and Poland, 1560 through 1630, by W. F. Redaway. Part 3. After playing for more than 40 years a leading part in every crisis of Swedish history, Charles IX left his country surrounded by peril. In the present struggle, Denmark, which had never been more formidable, was the half-unconscious ally of the Counter-Reformation. The War of Kalmar claimed all the energy which Sweden still possessed at a moment when it seemed that Russia might either become hers or pass to her irreconcilable foe, Sigismund. The loyalty of the people, moreover, had been strained by the burden of incessant struggles. The northern provinces were refusing to provide troops for the invasion of Norway, while the mercenaries plundered a country which left them short of pay. The nation, indeed, had gained strength since the Reformation. The church was now solid, national, and militant, and Sweden was no longer destitute of industry, commerce, and education. Yet never had she stood in greater need of a strong king to save her from foreign foes and to endow her with an organized central administration. For nearly two months after the death of Charles, however, the throne remained unfilled while Queen Christina and Duke John carried on the government. Then, in December 1611, the estates met at knee shopping. In their presence, John once more abjured all claim to the crown together with the rights of co-regency which the Diet of Norshoping had conferred upon him till Augustus Adolphus should reach the age of twenty-four years. He was still ruler of Ostergotland, while Charles Philip received the Duchy of Sotermanland by his father's will. In consequence of the late king's affectionate treatment of Duke John, Gustavus Adolphus was secure against immediate rivalry from the only one of the Swedish Vasa who might have been dangerous. The irregularity of the succession, however, gave the nobles a favorable opportunity for driving a hard bargain with the crown. They sought in the main, with success, both security against such judicial persecutions as Charles IX had practiced, and also a share in the government proportioned to their social weight. By the royal guarantee of 1611, Gustavus bound himself to confer upon them many great titular offices and to secure the consent of the Hrad and estates in matters of legislation, peace, war, and alliance. He undertook to consult the rod before ordering new levies of men or money or convoking the estates. 
These concessions did much to secure complete harmony between king and nation in confronting the Danish and all other perils. Much, too, was due to the personality of Gustavus. Thanks to his father and to the century in which he lived, he was already, at the age of 17 years, well-versed in humane learning, administration, and war. Under the tutorship of John Skite, he had steeped himself in the works of the ancient historians. German was the language of his mother, and Oxtenierna testifies that, quote, he spoke Latin, Dutch, French, and Italian just as if born to them, understood Spanish, English, and Scotch, and had also a smattering of Polish and Muscovite, end quote. As a Protestant, he inherited a love of the Bible. As a child of the Renaissance, a taste for music, poesy, and eloquence. He had, moreover, served a strict apprenticeship in statecraft. When but nine years of age, he began to attend the sessions of the Rod. At thirteen, he heard complaints and received ambassadors. At fifteen, he became Duke of Vostmanland and practiced co-regent with his father. The truce of 1609 between Spain and the Dutch sent a host of condonieri to the north, and from them he learned the art of Spignola and Maurice of Nassau. Already he showed signs of that versatile talent for war which was to ripen into perfect mastery, so that he became equally expert in inventing appliances and organization, in selecting conscripts and pointing cannon, in heading a troop of horse, and in planning a campaign. What laurels Sweden had gained in 1611 were of his gathering. In form and feature, he was kingly according to the heroic type which his people reverenced. He could control his hereditary collar better than the hereditary impulse to be the foremost in every fight. Only once is it recorded that he played the tyrant. Then, in 1631, a young courtier, Eric Rolam, insulted him and fled. Gustavus, inexorable for nine months, cashiered the father on the ground that he should have brought up his son better and confined him to his house until Eric should return to duty. The connection with Margaret Calabau, who gave birth to Gustav Gustafsson at Vosburg in May 1616, was quite unworthy of the lover of Ebba Brahi. Yet these rare strains, not surprising in Avassa, enhance the glory of his habitual self-mastery. Like all the members of his house who wore the crown, Gustavus possessed versatile ability and the ambition to embody it in some great work. Though as loyal to fact as Gustavus I or Charles IX, he breathed an atmosphere of idealism and therefore surpassed them in power over the hearts of men. The noble generosity of his temperament made it easy for the sons of the victims of his father's judicial murders to rally round his throne. For a moment, so late as 1622, he dreamed that he might obliterate his disputes with Sigismund in a crusade against the enemies of their common faith. What was of chief importance to Sweden and to Europe was that in Gustavus this unique endowment was accompanied by true statesmanship. Though ardent in pursuing certain lofty aims, the creation of an enduring machine of government, the enlightenment of his people, the ascendancy of Sweden in the north, and the defense of Protestantism, he could discern the right moment for advance, the best path to follow, and the distance which it was safe to travel. Free from jealousy and suspicion, he could, moreover, avail himself of the sagacity and formulating power of Axel Oxenscherna, the great counselor whom he found ready to his hand and in whom he recognized the perfect complement to himself. The king's first task was to end the War of Kalmar on honorable terms. Christian, who was enlisting many thousands of German mercenaries, would not hear of peace, and the winter and summer campaigns of 1612 witnessed the usual ferocious devastation of border provinces by both sides. In January 1612, he was beaten back from the walls of Goldberg, where women shared in the defense, and the wife of the commandant ordered 30 prisoners to be slain. Next month, Gustavus, who bore the chief burden of command, was surprised by Ratzau near Vitra and had an extremely narrow escape from death. 
In the winter campaign, nonetheless, the balance of success inclined towards the Swedes, but in May it was more than redressed by the loss of Elvsborg and Goldberg. The Danes now held the keys of Sweden and were lords of the Baltic. They threatened a combined march on Jan Schopping, Christian from Elvsburg, Rantzau from Kalmar. Gustavus, however, appealed to the people to repel the foe too strong for the royal arms. The peasants obeyed, filled the countryside with irregulars, and forced both invading armies to retreat. Christian next menaced Stockholm by sea, but was repulsed. Unable to bear further the cost of a war which was unpopular in Denmark and fearful that the Dutch might intervene to get rid of the sound dues, he accepted the mediation of James I of England. In January 1613, by the Peace of Nared, each side gave up its conquests and conceded to the other the right to bear the three crowns. Sweden renounced her empty but irritating claims to portions of Christian's dominions. The ancient mutual freedom from customs duties was restored, and the Swedes, receiving the right of free passage through the Sound, promised to refrain from impeding Danish commerce with Livonia and Kurland. Elfsburg, with the other Swedish posts at the mouth of the Yurta and seven counties in Vestriotland, were left in the hands of the Danes as security for the payment of an indemnity of one million thalers in specie within six years. Gustavus thus began his reign by buying off the Swedish nobles with privileges and the Danish armies with money. The ransom of Elfsburg, nominally more than six times as high as in 1570, laid a heavy poll tax upon the people and forced the king to sacrifice more than 30% of his revenue and to coin his plate. This was the prelude to a long series of imposts, for the new reign, like that of Charles IX, was a period of almost unceasing war. To the strain which war imposed upon the king and nation was added that of administration, organization, and social change during the two decades of Sweden's most rapid domestic development. That the country endured so much was primarily due to the frank and cordial cooperation between crown and people, which Gustavus successfully established. Innocent of dynastic self-seeking, he never feared to take his subjects into his council. He convoked diets or smaller conventions almost every year, and in 1617 gave the four estates, nobles, clergy, burghers, and peasants, their first regulations for meeting, Riksdag Sordningen. The people responded when the need arose by waiving all privilege and placing themselves and their money at the disposal of the crown. Gustavus sacrificed much at Nared that he might be free to devote himself to affairs beyond the Baltic. For the moment, his chief problem was the war with Russia. Firm peace with Poland was indeed impossible, so long as Sigismund persisted in claiming the allegiance of Sweden. From 1611, however, by a truce which was prolonged until 1617, the two branches of the House of Vasa had agreed to forego their domestic dissensions in the hope of profiting by the anarchy of Russia. Sigismund dreamed of bequeathing the crowns of Poland, Sweden, and Russia to his sons, while Gustavus, with perhaps a juster appreciation of Muscovite national strength, embraced the opportunity of fortifying Sweden by erecting a firm bulwark at her neighbor's expense. While the king was struggling with the Danes, Jacob de la Gardiere made Novgorod a base for the conquest of Ingria. Nutburg, which was reputed impregnable, was starved into surrender. Narva and other places also capitulated, and the progress of the Swedish arms was arrested only by the walls of Skov. The national revival at Moscow in 1613, however, threatened to destroy the dominion of both Swedes and Poles in Russia. Quote, rather perish than be severed from Moscow, end quote, was the answer of Novgorod when Gustavus proposed to convert western Russia into a Swedish Lithuania. Skolv, with some 3,000 defenders, held out so bravely that the Swedes hemmed it in with a belt of devastation 20 leagues in breadth. Without reinforcements and supplies, De La Gardiere and his conquests were in peril. 
Mikhail Romanov, the new Tsar, was bent on becoming Lord of Novgorod, and his forces profited by their vast superiority in numbers to regain Ziegfin and Gdau, Ogsdau. The conclusion of peace with Denmark enabled Gustavus to dispatch a new army to Russia. The unruly Scots and Germans who formed the bulk of it proved, however, so mischievous that he might well believe his own presence necessary at the seat of war. In January 1614, he held a momentous diet at Orobru. After controverting the charge that he made war to satisfy his martial instincts, he secured the cooperation of the estates against Russia and Poland if an honorable peace was not to be had. One of the gravest defects in the government of Sweden was remedied by the creation of a supreme council, while an economic ordinance was directed against the scandals of purveyance and compulsory posting. Then, rejecting all counsels and entreaties, the king set out for the east, traveling day and night along the shores of the Gulf of Bothnia. In July, de la Gardiere crushed the invaders from Moscow at Branitsi, and in September the king recovered Godof by storm. He returned in triumph to Sweden, bringing with him de la Gardiere, whose ascendancy in the east was not devoid of danger to the crown. Gustavus now aimed at securing what the Swedish arms had won, but despite her internal distractions, the barbaric pride of Russia long impeded the conclusion of peace. In 1615, Everett Horn, the successor of de la Gardiere, fell before Skov, and the king returned to undertake the siege in person. After three months, however, he was glad to accept once more the good offices of England, a power whose interest it was to dissuade her commercial protégé Russia from self-destruction. At last, by accepting the mediation of his new allies, the Dutch, and by threatening to make common cause with Sigismund, he extracted the peace of Slotbava from the Tsar, February 1617. By surrendering Novsgorod and recognizing Mikhail Romanov, the Swedes gained the fortress and country of Keksom, northwest Ingria, the renunciation of the Russian pretensions to Estonia and Livonia, mutual freedom of trade between Russia and Sweden, and an indemnity of 20,000 rubles. Finland, whose administration had been reorganized by the king in the winter and spring of 1615-1616, now stretched along the shores of the northern half of Lake Ladoga, while the fortress of Notbori secured her against invasion. It seemed that the Swedish Empire had acquired a durable, natural frontier against a neighbor whose potential greatness her king, like his grandfather, perceived. Without her approval, as Gustavus boasted, Russia could not launch a boat upon the Baltic. He extorted the Spanish gentry to take up estates in Ingria and the burghers to profit by the opening of Russia to their wares. Embassy after embassy was dispatched to keep the Russian court in good humor, and the Russian grain market open to Swedish armies. Gustavus even helped to instruct and recruit the forces of the Tsar. He hoped that the power bridled at Stolbovo may be a helpful ally in the war with Poland, which now broke out anew. The war of succession between the two branches of the House of Vasa fills a great space in the history of Sweden and of Poland during 60 years, 1600 through 1660. That part of it, 1617 through 1629, however, which falls within the reign of Gustavus, is especially conspicuous in the general history of Europe. It may be described as that portion of the Thirty Years' War which rendered possible the Swedish intervention in Germany. From its outbreak, Gustavus was consciously taking part in the great struggle of Protestantism against the Catholic reaction. Sigismund, who had become closely associated with the throne of Habsburg by his marriage with the Archduchess Anna in 1592, was determined to purge Livonia of heresy and to restore Sweden to Rome. Dynastic necessity, no less than personal conviction, therefore, made Gustavus the champion of the faith, which in three generations had become the symbol of Swedish national freedom. At Urobru, early in 1617, he armed himself with a fiercely intolerant statute, which decreed that every Romanist must quit the realm on penalty of forfeiture and death, a doom in which three of the four estates would gladly have included Calvinists. <laughs>
The fact that he was menaced by a Jesuit Habsburg crusade rather than by a single-crowned litigant compelled him to look beyond Poland for the disease and beyond Sweden for the remedy. Aggression, he believed, constituted the best defense for Sweden, and he hoped by aggression to gain provinces. But whatever its issue, the struggle was inevitable, and the nature of the enemy made the interests of Sweden and of Protestantism identical. Sweden hoped to gain the alliance of Brandenburg and to cement it by the king's marriage. Skite discussed with James I the plan of a great evangelical alliance and labored to convince the Dutch that his master was fighting their battle against Poland and Spain. Count Palatine John Casimir of Zweibrücken, the brother-in-law and assistant of the king, dwelt on the same theme in the Protestant courts of Germany. The old Scandinavian discords, however, had left a great hindrance in the way of Protestant Union. Denmark was still the jealous rival of Sweden rather than a sister Protestant power. Until 1619, Elfsborg remained in Danish hands. Then Gustavus met Christian at Helmstead and strove by personal influence to avert the danger to Sweden and to the Protestant cause. It was not until 1628, however, when the Danish forces had been crushed by Tilly and Wallenstein that Sweden dared to devote the bulk of her strength to war beyond the Baltic. It was in the Polish struggle of 1617 through 1629, moreover, that the Swedes first gained great military skill and reputation. Hitherto the armies of their Vasa kings had gained few victories on land except against the Russians, and for some years they showed no marked superiority to the Poles. The victory of Walhoff in 1626 is the Ferbellen or Rockwa of Sweden. In 1617 and 1618, while Poland was still at war with Russia, the Swedes devastated parts of Livonia and captured Pernau. Sigismund then made a truce of 14 years with Russia and of three years with Sweden, but became embroiled in a disastrous struggle with the Turks. Gustavus, having vainly offered to purchase peace by restoring the conquests made by Sweden since 1600, assembled a large army and strove to heighten its discipline, regimental esprit de corps, and even piety by issuing the famous Articles of War. In July 1621, he left Sweden with 158 ships and besieged Riga with 19,000 men. The great German city, free, populous, and Protestant, held out bravely for five weeks and then experienced the usual politic clemency of her conqueror. Gustavus, whose exploit made him famous in Europe, is styled Magnus on the medal which commemorates his success. He designed to make Riga the cornerstone of a new Swedish province in Livonia and Kurland. Prince Radzivill, however, now stronger by the reason of the close of the Turkish war, regained what Gustavus had conquered after the fall of Riga, and the king's army was too ill-found to win it back. In August 1622, a truce was negotiated which endured for three years. During this breathing space, the last which Gustavus was destined to enjoy, Sweden did not put off her armor. The position in Livonia was such as to afford no hope of settlement without a renewal of strife. The inflexibility of Sigismund was not weakened by the triumphs of his allies in Germany. Pernau and Riga too could not well remain politically separate from the province whose janitors they were. In July 1623, the rumor that a Polish armada was preparing against him brought Gustavus in haste to Danzig with 20 warships. While Sigismund and his court feasted on shore, the Swedes extorted from the city an undertaking to respect the truce and even demanded a pledge of permanent neutrality. Next year, in consequence of her violation of the free commercial intercourse provided for by the Treaty of Narod, Sweden stood for a moment on the verge of war with Denmark. When this danger passed, Gustavus and Christian, as is related elsewhere, became competitors for the leadership of the Protestant expedition into Germany. 
Thus, when the truce with Sigismund expired, Gustavus stood at the head of an army which for eight years had been either fighting or awaiting the signal to fight, and in which feudalism had given place to a centralized national organization. In these years, too, the hold of Gustavus upon his people had grown even stronger than before. The circle of the Swedish Vasa had contracted until only its center remained. Duke John died in 1618. Catherine Stenbach, dowager of Gustavus I in 1621, and Christina, dowager of Charles IX in 1625. Above all, in 1622, the king's younger brother, Charles Philip, fell in the Livonian War. Their appanages escheated to the crown, and the danger from the duchies was at an end, but the succession was insecure. In 1620, the king had married Maria Eleonora, sister of the elector George William of Brandenburg, but they were as yet without an heir. More than ever, the destiny of Sweden hung upon the life of the king. Throughout his reign, Gustavus Adolphus responded to every national need. He possessed neither the necessary authority for autocratic reform, nor was this part of his ambition. The monarchy of Sweden, it is true, was still in great part patriarchal, and her administration rude. While the king made incessant journeys through his dominions, the seat of government moved with him. While he was at the head of his army overseas, during almost one half of the years 1621 through 1632, the administration was carried on by a small committee of the Rod, nominated, limited, and instructed by himself. The Diet, through gaining its power at the expense of the provincial assemblies, had hardly attained to the stage of definition reached by the English Parliament at the accession of Edward I. The Rod, although the course of events tended to make it the center of government, was as yet rather an aggregate of active grandees than a permanent cabinet council. The competence of the several organs of administration was determined in great measure by the personality of their respective chiefs. When the king is found applying in vain to Uppsala for a qualified diplomatic clerk, it is not surprising that Axel Oxenschierna could invest the chancery, the writing office of the crown, with something of his own eminence, that Jacob de la Gardiere could shape the administration of the army, or Gustavus himself fashion the Supreme Court to his own design. But the rudimentary organization of the state did not imply the autocracy of the king. Besides the limitations upon his power imposed by his concessions to the nobles and those inevitably attendant on the rule of law which he was building up, Gustavus had to reckon with the conservatism of the clergy. In 1623, he made the chief of a series of efforts to achieve a reform which lay very near to his heart, the establishment of an orderly central authority in the Swedish church. He proposed to create a general ecclesiastical consistory composed of six clerical and six civil officials, and to charge it with the oversight not only of worship, doctrine, and discipline, but also of education, charitable foundations, and the press. Negotiations continued for more than a year, but the king was unable to overcome the stubborn resistance of the clergy to the intrusion of laymen, and he failed to accomplish his design. In inspiring his lieutenants, however, and in removing the friction and inertia which had hitherto retarded social and constitutional progress, Gustavus rendered priceless services to Sweden. The definition of rights and duties and the centralization of government, which were of necessity abiding aims of his policy, found notable expression in the foundation of the House of Nobles, soon after the Polish truce had ended. It had long been a grievance of the Vasa that noble status, with its freedom from ordinary taxation, was often usurped by their subjects without license from the crown. In June 1626, Gustavus authorized the building of the Riederhaus, a hall of meeting in the capital for those enrolled as noble, and thereby stereotyped into a hierarchic corporation those Swedes who could vindicate their claims to nobility or who might thereafter be ennobled by the king. In 
The chief of the four orders of the Diet thus received the definition and organization which had been repudiated by the Church. Reform could, however, claim only the intervals in strife. Apart from the peril to the king's own person, to which alone the political vision of Gustavus was always blind, all the interests of Sweden dictated the renewal of the war with Poland in 1625. An attack upon Livonia would paralyze Sigismund and divide the enemies of the Protestant cause, while its conquest would give Sweden a new province and a bastion on the side of Poland. To confuse the enemy, a triple attack was devised. Gilienian, with a small force, was to descend upon Windau, while de la Gardiere and Gustav Horn, with the army of the Baltic provinces, laid siege to Dorpat, and the king and John Bannier employed the mercenaries in the neighborhood of Riga. The Swedes were everywhere successful. Within three months, almost all Livonia was theirs. While the German burghers of Dorpat were rejoicing at the advent of Protestants, Gustav was capturing the strong places of Kurland, together with Bries, the border fortress of Lithuania. Too far seeing to attempt the conquest of a Romanist people, he hoped that the suffering Lithuanians might influence Sigismund to make peace. At this point, however, the Swedes received a check. A Polish force under Gonzievsky drove Horn from the southeast of Livonia. Two armies, with Radzivill and the distinguished statesman Leo Safia in command, confronted Gustavus in Kurland. At the end of November, the king wrote to Axeniera from Bursen, quote, Hungry and cold have driven us hither. I have seen more misery on the way than ever before in my fifteen years of war. End quote. All through December, he worked incessantly to avert starvation. On January 7, 1626, however, a brilliant feat of arms determined the issue of the war. At Walhoff, fighting against odds of perhaps five to one, Gustavus crushed Sophia's army almost without loss to his own. He then returned to Sweden, leaving Livonia to await peace and to regain strength under a separate and liberal administration, to which the University of Dorpat, founded in 1630, still bears witness. The campaigns of 1625 had proved how valuable to the Swedes were the resolute strategy of Gustavus and the reforms introduced by him into their discipline and tactics. In 1626, he sought to reap a still richer harvest in Prussia. East Russia was a fief of the Polish crown, ruled by Queen Maria Eleonora's brother, the elector, George Wilhelm of Brandenburg. West Prussia, in many respects a second Livonia, might afford Gustavus abundant supplies and a theater of war convenient for observing the struggle in Germany and for compelling Sigismund to make peace. At the end of June 1626, the Swedes, some 14,000 strong, descended upon both provinces of Prussia. Gustavus ridiculed the idea that Brandenburg could stand aside while the existence of Protestantism was at stake. Pillau, the port of Königsberg, had 28 feet of water, and he seized it as a naval base. By also blockading Danzig, where a great Protestant community, careless of all interests save its own, grew rich upon the commerce with the Vistula, he was able to lay hands upon the customs dues of all Prussia and to make the war, in a great measure, self-supporting. Having thus secured access to the mainland, Gustavus next endeavored to conquer the Polish littoral. His success was swift and far-reaching. Danzig alone proved obstinate. In Catholic Ermeland, as well as in West Prussia, the towns opened their gates. Both provinces were reorganized as dominions of Sweden, retaining their privileges but paying heavy taxes for the war. Here, as wherever the Swedes triumphed, the Jesuits were expelled and a Lutheran organization introduced. He then occupied the district to the west of the Vistula and hemmed in Danzig by land and sea. Two months elapsed before Sigismund was able to dispute his progress. A futile effort to recover Mua on the Vistula was a fresh demonstration of the inferiority of the Polish troops. Encouraged by the news from Germany, however, Sigismund offered impossible terms of peace. In October, having committed the administration of Oxteniera and the army to wrangle, Gustavus returned to Sweden. On December 8th, his daughter, Christina, was born.
Although the Polish war had still more than three years to run, its main results were now achieved. Henceforth, the Swedes were hindered by the wounds and sickness of their king and by the stubborn valor of Danzig rather than by Sigismund and his army. On the other hand, cold, hunger, and sickness cost them thousands of lives. Prussia was stripped bare, and the vast extent of Poland made it impossible for them to strike the decisive blow. At the same time, the downfall of Christian IV and of the Protestant power in Germany brought into closer connection the Eastern and Western Wars. In 1627, one of Wallenstein's regiments joined the army of Sigismund. The elector of Brandenburg, after long hesitation, took sides for a moment with his overlord, only to suffer fresh humiliations when half his force deserted to Gustavus and he lost Marienweerder and Memel. Before the campaign of 1628 opened, the king's plan for an offensive war of defense against the Habsburgs had received the assent of a secret committee of the four estates. Sweden became the ally of Denmark and assisted in the defense of Stralsund. Gustavus now commanded more than 30,000 men, but until February 1629, the Poles gained the fruits of victory by avoiding battle. Then, near Gersnau, Wrangel shattered an army of some 6,000 men under Pataki. He lost no more than 90 men, but was compelled to retreat from the walls of Thorn. In the summer, the presence of Arnhem with 10,000 imperialist troops recalled Gustavus to the war. The Swedes were surprised at Stumm, where the king had a hairbreadth escape from death or capture, but they made good their retreat to Marienburg. At last, his own ill health, the exhaustion of his dominions, and the danger from Habsburg designs on Prussia overcame the obstinacy of Sigismund. Charnese, the envoy of Richelieu, took the lead in mediation, and on September 26, 1629, a six years' truce was signed at Altmark. On condition of surrendering the remainder of her conquests, Sweden gained the tranquil possession of Livonia and the great part of the coast of Prussia, including Brownsburg, Elbing, Pillau, and Memel. George William received Marienburg and other compensation in West Prussia. The Swedes secured freedom of worship for the Protestants, whom they surrendered to Poland, and a boon surpassed only by that of the relief from the Polish War, they acquired financial support for the war in Germany, since the customs dues, which in 1629 exceeded half a million Riksdaler, were left in their hands. The reign of Gustavus after the truce of Altmark forms an integral part of the Thirty Years' War. His embarkation in 1630 with an army entirely equipped at home commemorates, however, the industrial and commercial progress which had formed a constant ideal of his rule. Quote, the king's majesty, end quote, said Oxtenschirna, quote, controls and steers mines, commerce, manufactures, and customs, just as a steersman steers his ship, end quote. Gustavus indeed spared no effort to further mining and metalworking under the strict control of the crown. In order to concentrate commerce and manufactures within the towns, he increased their number, conferred privileges upon them, and protected them by law against the competition of the country districts. In 1614, trade with foreigners was confined to 13 staple towns, while the market towns, Uppstadter, received a monopoly of trade between Swedish subjects. The principle that industry and commerce should be controlled by the crown permeated the economic policy of Sweden. The king embraced with enthusiasm the plan of a South Sea trading company, Industries were committed to the rule of guilds, the monopoly of trade with foreign lands, first in copper, then in iron, corn, and salt, was granted to chartered companies. All these experiments were made when Sweden was perpetually at war and when the financial burden of war could not be thrown upon the future. Although much of the economic policy of Gustavus was unsuccessful, Sweden became eminent in the industries necessary to war. Her internal communications were improved, and 15 new towns were established by the king. 
four great free schools in Vesteris, Strangness, Link Shoping, and Obu were of his creation, and in 1624 he endowed the University of Uppsala with more than 300 manors, comprising almost the whole of his private estates. The twenty years of his reign were a time of constitutional advance, of profitable conquest, of military organization, and of the growth of a richer, more harmonious, and nobler national life. The glory of Gustavus is enhanced by contrast with the reaction and decadence which characterized the first five and forty years of Vasa sovereignty in Poland. For a century after Sigismund's accession, indeed, the Polish magnates continued to be famous for magnificence, valor, and freedom. They believed that their constitution secured the Polish nation in the enjoyment of the fairest fruits of the three great principles of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Yet, the reign of Sigismund is but the beginning of the long chastisement brought upon the Poles by the arrogant individualism which had dictated the establishment of a weak elective monarchy in 1573, and which was destined in two centuries to dissolve the state. A vassal of the church, a stranger both to self-interest and patriotism, Sigismund derived in great part his domestic policy from the Jesuits and his foreign policy from the Habsburgs. In 1589 and 1590, he left to his subjects the defense of the Polish frontiers against the Tartars and the Turks, and a decade later, the Poles, in their turn, refused to concern themselves with the recovery of his Swedish throne. Disunion between king and people is the chief characteristic of Polish history, in a reign far from inglorious in war. The Habsburgs gladly embraced the opportunity to make the realm of Sigismund their bulwark against the tumultuous forces of the East. In 1595, Poland declined the invitation of Pope and Emperor to a crusade, but Zamoyski conquered Moldovia at his own expense. At the same time, Zolkievsky purged the Ukraine of its Cossack invaders. In 1597, Polish suzerainty over Moldavia was recognized by the Sultan, and two years later, the Hadspar of Wallachia menaced the province to no purpose. To these victories of the Republic must be added the overthrow of the Swedes in Livonia. After the crowning triumph of Kirkholm, 1605, Zamoyski declared that it was disgraceful to struggle so long with so petty a foe, but again the discrepancy between the interest of Sigismund and that of the nation proved injurious to both. At this crisis of the whole reign, Zamoyski, addressing the Diet for the last time, charged the king to his face with having misappropriated the taxes, left the troops unpaid, neglected the fortifications, retained the foreign guards, planned the coronation of his son, and betrayed the interests of the kingdom by his patronage of the Russian pretender and by his close alliance with the House of Austria. The death of Zamoyski, however, facilitated the king's marriage, 1605, with Constantina, the sister of his former queen, a union which his subjects regarded both as an act of treason against the republic and as an insult to heaven. Sigismund's second marriage consolidated into a single force the several elements of hostility to the crown which had sprung up during 18 years of misrule. With the tacit consent both of the king and of the senate, which was full of his creatures, the Jesuits and the mob had reduced religious toleration to a shadow. The Protestants were excluded from office, restricted in education, deprived of their churches, and exposed to outrage at the hands of the Romanist populace. The Greeks in Lithuania suffered most from Latin aggression. The Union of Brescia in 1595, by which six Orthodox prelates joined the Roman Communion, proved only a new source of fanatic violence and civil strife. It thus became possible after the death of the patriot Zamoyski for personal enemies of the king to rally 60,000 men in support of the Rokosh, Grand Remonstrance of Sandomir. In 1606, Sigismund showed statesmanlike moderation in his efforts to meet this indictment and to avert civil war. In 
Owing, however, to the obstinacy of the Palatine of Krakow, the Chancellor of Lithuania, an interregnum was proclaimed by the rebels in 1607, and it was doubtful how far the royal troops could be trusted to put them down. Many of the insurgents, on the other hand, listened to counsels of moderation, and an accident contributed to save the crown. At Guzov, a sudden panic seized the divided and dwindling army of the Rokosh, and the king's clemency finally extinguished the movement. Thenceforward, though the power of the nobles remained unbroken, that of the Protestant party was at an end, and the influence of the Jesuits even greater than before. The suppression of the Rokosh was the last enduring triumph of a reign which had still a quarter of a century to run. Some of the Polish nobles, it is true, had secured the coronation of Demetrius at Moscow in 1605, and five years later Sigismund was to enjoy the brief elevation of his son Vladislav to the throne of the Tsars. In 1619, however, when at Divaline the Republic accepted Smolensk and Zyverse from the Romanovs as the price of a truce for 14 years, the dream of a Polish Tsar had vanished. All that Sigismund hoped for from the Habsburgs and from the Polish nobles greedy for office in Livonia and Estonia likewise vanished, but at a far greater sacrifice by the truce of 1629. His support of the imperial cause in the Great War brought him trouble not only from Bethlen Gabor, but also from the Polish Diet of 1624, which compelled him to forbid his subjects to serve in foreign armies. The Turks, too, were able to turn the balance of success in their own favor. In 1612, they recovered Moldovia, and the efforts of the Poles to restore their suzerainty culminated in 1620 with a terrible disaster near Sikora. Zolkiewski was killed and Konopolski captured, and next year the heroism of the dying Chodkiewski in defending Kulzum was rewarded only by the concession that the Turkish governor of Moldavia should be a Christian. All these disasters, together with the burning of the rich town of Yaroslav in 1625 and the annihilation of his fleet during the war with Gustavus, Sigismund bore with the tenacious equanimity which was, perhaps, the most notable feature of his character and the most disastrous to Poland. End of section 21. Section 22 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6. Gustavus Adolphus, 1630-1632, by A.W. Ward. Part 1. In the, quote, Proposition, end quote, which on May 30th, 1629, Gustavus Adolphus addressed from Elbing to the Swedish estates, and which first distinctly placed before them the plan of the great liberating expedition that has immortalized his name, he declared that to defend Sweden was to defend her faith. He won his last and greenest laurels as the champion of Protestantism, the advancement and maintenance of which had, from Gustavus Vasa onwards, than an unchanging principle of action in the kings of Sweden. But as the Elbing proposition itself indicates, it was the immediate question of the national safety which determined Gustavus Adolphus to call upon his hard-tried people for an unprecedented warlike effort. The response given by that people was, all things considered, not less heroic than the summons. For Sweden was a poor country, very heavily taxed, and its population, including that of Finland, numbered not more than a million and a half. The king was ready at the last moment to draw back from his enterprise if his conditions were granted, nor would he have embarked in it at all as the mere servant of a Protestant propaganda, or as the sword-bearer of any interests but those of his own land. He would not have done battle on German soil to suit the schemes of Richelieu, the wishes of England, or the interests of the United Provinces, or to redress the grievances of the German princes deprived of their territorial acquisitions by the Edict of Restitution. 
He believed that the maritime designs of the House of Habsburg, which had been already known to his father before him, aiming as they did at the control of the sound and the mastery of the Baltic, would strangle the national life of the kingdom, which by unflinching valor and provident governance he had made doubly his. And so he went forth to carry war into the empire, not indeed unaware of the possibility that success might carry him beyond the achievement of his immediate end, or insensible, as his great counsellor Oxen Scherna afterwards phrased it, of the fundamental importance of momenta temporum, but nevertheless intent upon a well-defined purpose from which no obstacle would cause him to swerve. From this point of view, it will be worth while to recapitulate in brief the successive steps in the historic process which ended in the landing of Gustavus Adolphus on the island of Usedom at the mouth of the Pina on June 26, 1630. Sweden first entered into the complications of Western politics when, a little more than a year after she had made peace with Denmark, January 1613, she concluded a defensive alliance with the United Provinces, brought about by the vigilance of Olden Barneveld, April 1614. Although in 1615 and the following year, when a decisive stage of his struggle with Poland seemed near, Gustavus Adolphus was necessarily desirous of an alliance with Brandenburg, Prussia, nor was it until November 1620 that his marriage with the young elector George William's sister Maria Eleonora was celebrated. Shortly before that date, at the time of the outbreak of the Great War, an intervention in the affairs of the empire was first suggested to him. But neither the application of the Bohemian leaders for aid, nor the solicitations of King Frederick, brought to Stockholm in March 1620 by Gustavus' brother-in-law, the Count Palatine John Casimir, came to anything. The Swedish king's preoccupation with Poland would have of itself sufficed to account for his refusal to take part in the abortive Danish attempt of 1620 to 1621 to bring about a European Protestant alliance. But when, in 1623, this attempt revived with the sudden resumption of a policy of aggressive ambition by Spain under Philip IV and Olivares, Gustavus Adolphus was found ready to take part in the project. At first by a, quote, diversion, end quote, into the Austrian lands, and then even by an attack upon the Palatinate. But he demanded the double guarantee of a large Dutch and English fleet and the transfer to his keeping of the ports of Bremen and Wismar. James I, who preferred Danish leadership, juggled the Swede first out of the offer of supreme command and then out of a share in it. In return, Gustavus declined to join the Hague concert and while leaving Christian IV to fight out his Lower Saxon War, made himself master of Livonia, 1625, and Prussia, 1626, so that he controlled the whole line of the Baltic east of Pomerania. During this period, the notion of a flank attack upon Poland's ally, Austria, was in the king's mind, but the force of events led him to adopt a more direct course. The plan of maritime domination, which in 1627 to 1628 Wallenstein had begun to carry out on behalf of the House of Habsburg, and which aimed at the control of the Baltic from the Sound to the halves of Pomerania and Prussia, had been primarily directed against both the Scandinavian powers, and they accordingly became allies. April 1628 and jointly took part in the defense of Stralsund. But Gustavus, who was aware that his still unbroken power would have to bear the brunt of the struggle, fortified himself at the outset by a solemn engagement on the part of a committee of his diet, December 1627 to January 1628, and in June 1629 gave a pledge of the action on which he had resolved by his treaty with Stralsund. By the autumn, he had 5,000 troops in the city and a foothold on German soil. 
The rescue of Stralsund was followed by negotiations with the other Hansa towns, which contributed to their final rejection of the Habsburg maritime proposals and the consequent collapse of the great design. September to October, 1628 Sweden's defensive action, as from her point of view it may still fairly be called, against that design, was, without loss of time, seized upon by the promoters of the Grand Protestant Alliance as a proof that she must speedily proceed to the offensive. It was at this time that Sir Thomas Rowe, fresh from his successful efforts at Constantinople to delay the ratification of the Peace of Sean between the Emperor and the Port, sought to convince both Frederick Henry of Orange and Gustavus himself as to the expediency of a combined war against the House of Habsburg, of which the Swedish king should be the head, 1628 to 1629. In December 1628, Gustavus met his Riksrad, and still insisting upon the Dominium Maris as the essential issue, obtained its assent to an anticipation of the emperor's attack by carrying the war into the empire. In March, by way of a preliminary measure, the island of Rügen, which Denmark was proposing to purchase from the Duke of Pomerania, was occupied by a division of the troops in Stralsund under Leslie, and gradually cleared of imperialists. While Gustavus Adolphus was thus revealing the design in which he was now fully prepared to engage, and at the same time offering moderate terms of peace to Poland, his proceedings were suddenly thwarted by a masterstroke on the part of his most persistent adversary. Wallenstein had from the first recognized where the chief obstacle to his and the House of Habsburg's designs was to be sought and found. In April 1629, he dispatched Arnhem with a force of 15,000 men to the Polish frontier. And Sigismund was now so strong that while making an abortive attempt to induce the Emperor and Wallenstein to abandon their northern policy, Gustavus had to take his departure for the seat of war. The intention was to isolate him at the very moment of his proposed interference, and herein also Wallenstein was successful. One of the reasons for the singularly easy terms granted to Christian IV at the Peace of Lübeck, June, was undoubtedly the wish once more to alienate the Danish from the Swedish king. At the same time, an intolerable insult was offered to Gustavus Adolphus by excluding his ambassadors from the peace negotiations. But the device, masterly though it was, proved only temporarily successful. After Sigismund's failure at Stum, June 17th, to repulse the Swedes, he began to incline to peace and soon Richelieu's agent, Charnasset, was on the spot to bring about a solution entirely in accordance with the cardinal's policy. Rowe, who had also found his way to Prussia, cooperating. A six-year's truce was concluded at Altmark, September 26, 1629, on a basis of mutual concession. But Gustavus Adolphus retained the port of Pilau, and not long afterwards... February 1630, concluded a separate treaty with Danzig. At last, his hands were free for the great German enterprise. During his absence in Prussia, the Riksdag, in response to the royal proposition already mentioned, had voted the taxes, contributions, and ships demanded, and on the king's return, a final consultation was held at Uppsala, October 27th at which, after a most elaborate discussion of pros and cons, all the royal councillors present declared individually for the offensive. War was now solemnly decreed. The imperial design for the mastery of the Baltic, and implicitly of Sweden itself, was once more put in the forefront. Nor can any reasonable doubt be thrown upon the truth of Oxenstierna's statement, made after his master's life had been sacrificed in the venture, that the king had regarded Pomerania and the Baltic coast as the outworks of Sweden, and had gone to war in order to secure them. 
even now he agreed to a conference at danzig proposed by christian the fourth in his new character of mediator but the negotiations after dragging through the spring and summer of sixteen thirty came to nothing and christian may have been right in maintaining that gustavus had now no desire for peace on conditions which his opponents could be expected to grant yet when at last after final delays caused by the weather he on june twenty sixth sixteen thirty anchored off the island of usedom at the mouth of the pena in pomerania and during the next two days disembarked his troops he still had good cause for avoiding anything like rashness or haste in his movements on his fleet in addition to three thousand marines were thirteen thousand soldiers whose numbers were soon after his landing increased by accessions from sweden livonia and stralsund to a marching force of some forty thousand men while at home and in the baltic lands in his rear he may have left behind over thirty thousand more rather more than half of the soldiery were swedish or finnish by birth among the foreign levies the scots were specially notable but the baltic lands in general and even brandenburg and poland had contributed their share they were all welded together by confidence in their commander by a firm discipline and it cannot be doubted by the influence of the religious observances with which that discipline was interfused the infantry was for the most part armed with muskets of comparatively light weight and in part at least fired by flintlocks in lieu of the old cumbrous matchlocks mounted foot soldiers known as dragoons formed a complement of the cavalry which was gustavus weakest arm his strongest was his artillery for which light iron cannon were largely employed the so-called leather end quote, guns fell into disuse early in the german war here and throughout extreme mobility was a leading principle of gustavus method of warfare and proved a chief cause of its success the cost of maintaining this army which in sixteen thirty led to a deficit of nearly a million of dollars in the swedish budget was a matter of anxious forethought and as a matter of fact the war expenditure of sixteen thirty was diminished by half in the following year and that of sixteen thirty one in sixteen thirty two the chief anxiety of gustavus at the time of his landing and the main reason for the slowness of his initial advance was his lack of allies either outside the empire or within it in the negotiations which after the conclusion of the polish truce charnasse had carried on in sweden where in february sixteen thirty he had had audience of the king at Vistaros, some hitch had occurred possibly due to richelieu's sudden action in italy though anxious to keep up the war with spain the united provinces besides being dissatisfied by the burden of the swedish tolls at palau now added to that of the danish at the sound were unwilling to take part in a german war except by granting secret subsidies and allowing the levy of troops england on the point of concluding peace with spain was quite out of the reckoning while christian the fourth was falling back into his old attitude of hostility towards his swedish rival and intent upon his own ambitious design against hamburg bethlen gabor whose ultimate cooperation had long been a constant factor in the calculations of gustavus and with whom active negotiations had been carried on in sixteen twenty nine had died in november of that year but of more immediate importance was the question of alliances within the empire on which the progress of the swedish arms could not but largely depend although already in sixteen twenty nine duke george of luneburg sela had entered into communication with gustavus and although early in sixteen thirty gustavus had sent his able secretary philip sattler to several of the protestant courts and cities the question was obviously one of alliances which would not be settled till the die had been cast on july ninth the swedish army crossed the great half and on the following day duke bogoslav 
of Pomerania was obliged to admit a Swedish garrison into his capital, Stettin. His visitor then compelled him to conclude a treaty of alliance, by which his duchy and troops were placed under Swedish control, and he paid a contribution of $200,000. Inasmuch as on Bogoslav's death his duchy would pass to Brandenburg, it was stipulated that, until his successor should have accepted this treaty, or in the event of a disputed succession, Pomerania should be held in sequestration by Sweden. In all the negotiations in which the Institutor Germaniae, as Oxenstierna styled his master, now entered with the dispossessed Mecklenburg dukes, with the house of Brunswick Lüneburg, and with his Brandenburg brother-in-law, he showed himself resolved not only on the Pomeranian quote, satisfaction, end quote, but also on a, quote, a securation, end quote, or safeguard. This was to consist of a series of fortresses to be placed under his protection. But George William of Brandenburg, as has been seen, was now wholly imperialist. His neighbor, John George of Saxony, might be relied upon to remain quiescent at all events till after the convention of protestant princes summoned by him to leipzig for january sixteen thirty one should have met even landgrave william of hesse castle whose grievance it had brought him to the brink of an alliance with the king was taken aback by the swedish demand of complete military control though the landgrave's aid and that of the weimar dukes could hardly fail gustavus for a time it seemed as if the only princely support on which he could depend in germany was that of the brandenburg prince christian william the deposed administrator of magdeburg who had spent the latter half of sixteen twenty nine at stockholm lodging in the castle there with another fugitive count thurn in march sixteen twenty nine at the time of the issue of the edict of restitution wallenstein incensed by the refusal of Magdeburg to receive and maintain an imperial regiment, or pay an accommodation of $300,000, had laid siege to the city, but after seven months he had raised the blockade, accepting, for appearance sake, the modest payment of $30,000. Elated by this repetition of the fiasco of Stralsund, the Magdeburgers joined in an agreement formed by six Hanseatic towns to arm in common defense, November 1629, and establish a more democratic town council. This body entered into communication with the exiled Christian William, who in his turn presented himself at a meeting of the Hansa towns at Lübeck and obtained from it a contingent promise of support for the Swedish cause. Finally, Gustavus Adolphus undertook to become Christian's surety for a supply of money, and to assist him as opportunity offered to recover the Magdeburg Sea. Though even the new town council at Magdeburg as yet hesitated about openly promoting Christian William's return, the citizens became more and more agitated by the continued encroachments of the emissaries of the Catholic restitution, who even ventured to affix a mandate to the door of the cathedral. Christian now contrived to make his way into Magdeburg incognito in the company of his confidential agent Stallman, who brought with him a commission from Gustavus inviting Magdeburg to ally itself with him in return for a promise of protection. Soon Stallman revealed the presence of the administrator and unfolded their plan. August 1st, 1630 Christian William had in readiness a force of some 3,500 men, and the Dukes of Weimar were prepared to furnish nearly as many more, if with the aid of this force Magdeburg kept open the passage of the Elbe, and the armies of the Emperor and the League were consequently drawn into the center of resistance, the King of Sweden must march to meet them, and round him would gather all the upholders of that Protestant cause with which the city was, above all others, identified. An alliance was hereupon actually concluded between Christian William, the king's agent, and the town council, against the disturbers of the spiritual and temporal peace of the empire. 
and the administrator at the head of an enthusiastic following at once proceeded to his, quote, residential, end quote, capital, Halle. But soon he found it prudent to return to Magdeburg, for Pappenheim had been detached by Tilly, now in supreme command of both the League and Imperial forces, and had approached along the left bank of the Elbe to within a few miles north of the city. Christian William was, with some reluctance, allowed to quarter his soldiery in the suburbs. But on October 29th, a distinguished Swedish officer, Dietrich von Falkenberg, at last arrived to take command of the troops. The provocation had been given prematurely. But Gustavus Adolphus was desirous of showing that he would, if possible, support more effective movements that might follow. On his arrival in Pomerania, he found a considerable imperial force still in control of the greater part of the country under the command of General Torquato Conti, who had taken measures for protecting the odor against a Swedish advance. After securing Stettin, where he established a fortified camp, Gustavus took Stargard, July 1630, and then, doubtless with a view to drawing nearer to Magdeburg, made a diversion from the line of the Oder into Mecklenburg, September. But no favorable reception was given to the proclamation which, from his fortified camp, he addressed to the Mecklenburgers, admonishing them in angry terms to throw off the authority usurped by Wallenstein in defiance of the law of God and the gospel. There was little love in the land for its lawful dukes, and Wallenstein's administration, orderly, impartial, and expeditious, was unmistakably popular. Into Rostock the imperialists, regardless of past compacts, had contrived to throw a garrison, the king's reinforcements from Prussia had not yet arrived, and he did not yet feel strong enough for more extensive operations at a distance from his base. The Mecklenburg campaign therefore remained a mere demonstration, October, and while Gustav Horn invested Kohlberg, which did not capitulate till March 1631, the king resumed the campaign on the Oder. Here, less than twenty miles above Stettin, the imperial forces, under the command of Heimbald von Schomburg, were massed at Gars, which was connected by a bridge with the fortress of Griefenhagen, likewise in their occupation. A series of successful operations, accompanied by some hard fighting on Christmas Eve and day, put both places into the hands of the Swedes, and Schomburg's army, disorganized and demoralized, and suffering terribly from the severity of the winter, hastily returned to Kusterin, whose gates were open to it. Thence it made its way to Frankfurt on the Oder, whither, or to Landsberg, such bodies of imperialists as had remained scattered throughout Pomerania likewise retreated. Such was the virtual end of Wallenstein's great army of the north. The whole of the duchy, with the exception of Kohlberg, Griswold, and Demin, was now in Gustavus's hands. The effect of the success was great with both friend and foe, and with the watchful statesmen in the West. Gustavus's own imagination was fired to conceive of a great combination of five armies, amounting together to more than a hundred thousand men, in the face of which all resistance would melt away in Germany. But for the present, even his advance along the line of the Oder could not continue, so long as the three Brandenburg fortresses which had served as a refuge to the imperialists shut their gates upon the Swedes. During the eventful six months which had passed since the landing of Gustavus Adolphus in Usedom, the two Protestant electors had drawn no nearer to the deliverer. John George of Saxony, Though in the past two years he had been plied by Gustavus himself, by Bernard of Weimar, coming from The Hague, by the Mecklenburg Dukes, by the administrator, and by the city of Magdeburg, remained unmoved, and to the Magdeburgers he gave the plain advice to remain in obedience to the emperor. George William of Brandenburg deeply resented the hard measure which his brother-in-law had dealt out to him in Palau. After Gustavus' landing, 
He had asked to be allowed to remain neutral, but had been answered with a flat refusal, accompanied, however, by conciliatory assurances. Gustavus would not even bind himself to give up ultimately any places occupied by him in Brandenburg or Pomerania unless George William would become his ally. Left to his own devices by the elector of Saxony, the Brandenburg elector was now in the depths of irresolution, and, as to the fortress of Kustrin on the Oder, issued instructions which revealed his utter helplessness. At Ratisbon, where, as has been seen, the electors were at this time in conference with the emperor, the agreement at which they had arrived on the critical question of the chief military command could not bode well for any change in the policy of restitution favorable to the Protestants. Nevertheless, the two Protestant electors signed a letter of remonstrance addressed by the Electoral College, simultaneously with one from the Emperor to the Swedish invader, August 1630. But the patience of John George was not inexhaustible. When about this time he, on behalf of George William as well as of himself, applied to the emperor for the revocation of the obnoxious edict and was met by an arrogantly worded refusal, coupled with a demand for aid in both men and money, he was at last found prepared with a suitable retort. His announcement of the proposed Convention of Protestant Estates at Leipzig was not an actual revolt, but it indicated that revolt was possible. He maintained, however, a waiting attitude, and as late as March 1631, vouchsafed no reply to a renewed appeal from Gustavus Adolphus. Meanwhile, the neutrality of Brandenburg had proved untenable. The successes of the Swedish arms at the close of 1630 led to a summary demand on the part of Gustavus Adolphus, first, for free transit by water and by land at Kustrin, and then for the surrender into his hands of the fortress itself. Urged by Tilly to refuse, and advised by John George to enter into no engagements with Sweden, George William entreated Gustavus not to insist upon a, quote, conjunction, end quote, between them. The right of transit should be granted if Brandenburg as a whole were not to become the seat of war, and if the king would undertake to leave untouched the elector's capital and fortresses. January 1631. While unable to reach an understanding with the two Protestant electors, Gustavus Adolphus arrived at a definite settlement with France. Charnassay, whose last negotiations with him had been broken off on a trivial point of form, resumed them at Barvalda, where, though the chief difficulty was the money part of the bargain, some heat was infused into the discussion. On January 13, 1631, however, a treaty of alliance between the kings of France in Sweden was signed by their commissaries for the protection, as it purported, of their common friends, and for assuring the security of the Baltic and of the open sea, freedom of commerce, and the restitution of the oppressed estates of the empire. The king of Sweden, for the treaty was practically dated as from a year back, was to conduct an army of 30,000 foot and 6,000 horse into Germany, and France to pay an annual subsidy of $400,000, with an additional 120000 for the year spent in negotiation. The alliance was to continue till March 3, 1636, and to be renewable should peace not have been concluded by that date. But neither of the Allies was to make peace without the assent of the other. The adhesion of German and other princes and estates was to be permitted unless they were openly or secretly acting with the enemy, a clause intended as a warning to malevolent neutrals. With Bavaria and the League, there was to be friendship and neutrality, should they incline to accept it. In all localities conquered by the King of Sweden, he was to observe the laws of the empire and not to interfere with the exercise of the Catholic religion. To this last clause, and to that concerning the League, Gustavus had only with difficulty been induced to assent. 
It will be remembered that, after Wallenstein's dismissal, the forces of both Emperor and League had been placed under the supreme command of Tilly. The removal of Wallenstein inevitably had an injurious effect upon so much of the imperial army as had been kept under arms, and Richelieu had taken care to close all present prospect of any reinforcements from Italy. The 12,000 troops, or thereabouts, still left of the imperial army of the north, were demoralized by want of pay as well as of success, and could clearly no longer be relied upon for the defense of Oder and Elba. The forces of the League, on the other hand, which it was at first intended to employ for covering the lands of the West and South, were reckoned at 27,000 in the field, and more than half this number in garrisons. But Tilly, after making his dispositions at Ratisbon, waited patiently in the Vesser country till his numbers should be complete. Nor was it till the middle of January 1631 that, after making a transient appearance before Magdeburg, his army reached Frankfurt on the Oder. After his junction with Schomburg, Tilly was in command of 34,000 troops. But his imperialist reinforcements were in a sorry plight. The news having now reached Tilly that Gustavus was about to enter Mecklenburg, the general of the League, by a rapid march, crossed the middle mark south of Berlin and approached the Lion of the Havel, so as to place himself in the way of the Swedish advance upon the Elba and Magdeburg. Immediately after the conclusion of the Treaty of Barvalda, Gustavus, regarding the Lion of the Oder as temporarily closed, had, though it was midwinter, started for Mecklenburg with a division of his army amounting to nearly 12,000 men. Before the middle of February, he easily took Demin on the Mecklenburg frontier, and after detaching a division to besiege Greifswald, was preparing to advance when he learnt that Tilly was approaching New Brandenburg in mecklenburg strelitz nearly 30 miles south of Demin, where 3,000 Swedes under Nifausen lay in garrison. Gustavus seems to have hoped to divert Tilly towards Schwede, where the Swedes would have been nearer to their base at Stitten. But he sent instructions to Nifausen to conclude an honorable capitulation if it became necessary. The messenger fell into Tilly's hands, and on March 19th he took New Brandenburg by storm and put the whole garrison to the sword. Quote, New Brandenburg Quarter, end quote. Though it only carried out the accepted principle that no mercy need be shown to a garrison holding out after surrender has become inevitable, in its turn set a precedent soon afterwards followed at Frankfurt and at Magdeburg, and thus opened a more savage epoch in the conduct of the war. After this success, Tilly stood still for some days, and then, perhaps feeling incapable of moving Gustavus from his position at Schwed, where he continued to be in touch with the other Swedish division under Horn, marched southwest towards the towns of New Rupin and Brandenburg. On the march he received an explicit order from Maximilian of Bavaria to lose no time in setting about the siege of Magdeburg, before whose walls and trenches Pappenheim was fretting in enforced inactivity. No sooner was Gustavus sure of Tilly's departure than once more, leaving Horn behind to finish the siege of Greifswald, it did not fall till June, he marched with 14,000 men upon Frankfurt on the Oder. To secure this fortress had long been an object of anxiety to him, but we have the explicit statement of his secretary Gruba that his immediate purpose was to draw Tilly away from Magdeburg, passing Kustern without any hindrance and constructing a redoubt in face of its walls. He arrived before Frankfurt, where lay a force of 5,000 men, more or less, with Field Marshal von Tiefenbach and other officers of note, the remnant, in a word, of Wallenstein's Army of the North. On April 13th, the fortress was rapidly taken by storm, but the brilliancy of the exploit was dimmed by the excesses which followed, and which lasted far into the night, long beyond the three hours allowed by the king for plundering. By his orders, the lives of the citizens were left untouched. But of the garrison, two thousand, 
according to Munro, 3,000, were slaughtered, quote, in revenge of their cruelty used at New Brandenburg, end quote. Within a fortnight, Landsberg, which Tilly had not turned to relieve, capitulated to Gustavus. A panic spread through Silencia, to which, and to Moravia, the line of the Oder directly led, and at Prague Gustavus was believed to be about to carry the war to the gates of the city where it had begun. The emperor himself believed an attack on the Austrian lands to be in serious contemplation, but Gustavus had no such intentions. He still kept the line of the Elba in view, and sending a message to Magdeburg, which he had persuaded himself could hold out two months longer, announced his victorious progress to John George of Saxony and the Protestant estates assembled on his summons at Leipzig. End of section 22section twenty three of the cambridge modern history volume four the thirty years war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter six gustavus adolphus sixteen thirty to sixteen thirty two by a w ward part two the convention was opened early in February 1631 by a combative blast from the clerical trumpet, but the high-spirited Ho von Hohenegg was on this occasion unable to carry with him his own master, or any other member of the assembly save the landgrave of Hesse and the Weimar dukes William and Bernard. Though, however, John George stolidly asserted that nothing need be done so long as it was not attempted to extirpate the Augsburg Confession. The statement of grievances, including, of course, a demand for the revocation of the Edict of Restitution, was ultimately dispatched to the Emperor, accompanied by an intimation that the Protestant estates proposed to levy troops in their several circles, and, if necessary, to afford due assistance to one another. The emperor replied by requiring the dissolution of the new association thus outlined, and soon took severe measures against some of the southwestern towns that had entered into it. The scheme proceeded no further, and as to the all-important question of the choice of a leader, the king of Sweden's ambassador, though admitted to the meeting, had been put off there with meaningless promises. Thus a possibility of combined resistance had been indicated, but this was all. Perhaps the most interesting incident of the convention had been a conference between Lutheran and Calvinist theologians, to which long afterwards Leibniz referred as the hopeful precursor of later attempts at religious reunion. The particular negotiations which followed between Gustavus and the two Protestant electors cannot here be pursued in detail. Yet the protraction of these discussions was the direct cause of the great catastrophe of the fall of Magdeburg. At last Gustavus, by means of a personal interview with George William at Berlin, supplemented by a military demonstration, secured the delivery into his hands, May 13th, of the fortress of Spandau, till the Magdeburg difficulty should be ended. This was one of the two pledges on which he had insisted, and though the transfer of the other, Kustrin, was still delayed, he now felt sufficiently sure of Brandenburg, and the elector's imperialist minister, Schwarzenberg, quitted the court. Gustavus might now have marched upon Magdeburg up the right bank of the Elbe, but he decided on taking the longer route towards Wittenberg, with the view of crossing the river there and moving on Magdeburg down the left bank. His chief reason for this preference was his desire to avoid a battle with an enemy superior to himself in numbers, but it necessitated a promise of cooperation from John George, who remained immovable. These negotiations had just broken down when the news reached Gustavus at Potsdam that on May 20th, Magdeburg had fallen. The suggestion that Gustavus wished to utilize the peril of Magdeburg in order to force John George into his alliance may be dismissed as malicious, but his delay was a grievous miscalculation, and the principal defense which he set up for it, and which other apologists have repeated, 
that he was bound to safeguard himself, but was prevented from effecting this by the procrastinations of the two electors, exaggerated their real weight in the balance, and detracted from his own greatness. On assuming the command of the troops in the city which, exclusive of the citizens, cannot have much exceeded three thousand men, Falkenberg at once introduced Swedish discipline into their ranks. Magdeburg, which numbered about thirty-six thousand inhabitants, was well fortified except on the river side, north and northeast, where, however, the islets on the bridged marsh offered facilities of defense which were improved by Falkenberg. In the course of November 1630, the city was invested by Pappenheim, but during the winter months some negotiation ensued, with an equally futile attempt by Pappenheim to bribe the Swedish commander. And it was not till the end of March 1631, after the fall of New Brandenburg, that Tilly at last sat down before Magdeburg, and the siege began in earnest. His and Pappenheim's united forces reached a total of over 22,000 foot and 3,000 horse, with 86 heavy guns, besides an additional body of nearly 5,000 troops near at hand at Dessau. After Pappenheim had captured the redoubts on the right bank of the Elbe, and one or two on the left had also fallen, a pause followed, owing to the news of the capture of Frankfurt, and the emperor's demand that Tilly should proceed at once to protect the Austrian lands. It was, however, resolved first to finish the siege, and on April 28th Pappenheim attacked the fortifications on the islands. By the next day all the outworks of the city were in the hands of the besiegers. On May 4th Pappenheim took possession of the raised northern suburb of Neustadt on the left bank, and began erecting his batteries. On the same day, Tilly, who would gladly have preserved the fortifications, summoned the administrator, the town council, and Falkenberg severally to surrender. The immediate reply on the following day was a brief but successful sortie, followed by two others. On May 10th, the town council sent an answer announcing its wish to call in the mediation of the electors of Brandenburg and Saxony, and of the Hansa towns. Tilly's answer, insisting on surrender as a preliminary condition, did not arrive till May 12th. In the meantime, Falkenberg had sent an urgent appeal to Gustavus Adolphus. On May 17th, the bombardment of the city walls from the Nudstadt opened, and it continued during the next two days. Meanwhile, on the 18th, a further summons from Tilly to surrender reached the city, where hope and fear were striving for mastery. On the 19th, the whole body of the citizens, as well as the town council, discussed the question, and it was decided to treat, though Falkenberg succeeded in securing that a consultation should be held with him early on the following morning. On the evening of the 19th, there had been indications of a lull in Tilly's operations. This was probably the reason why a sortie, which Falkenberg had intended to make that night, was not undertaken. The charge against him based upon this change of plan can only be described as absurd. At five o'clock in the morning of the 20th, a portion of the garrison had, as usual, withdrawn from the walls. Soon afterwards, while Falkenberg was addressing the town councillors in the Rothhaus, the news of a movement of the enemy towards the walls arrived. By seven o'clock, the assault had begun on the new Stad's side. Pappenheim, who led it, had already mounted the walls when Falkenberg threw himself in his way, and a check resulted which Pappenheim afterwards resentfully attributed to want of proper support on the part of Tilly. But soon a gate on this side of the wall was forced. The setting on fire, by Pappenheim's orders, of a few houses increased the terror of the defenders. Through another gate the Croatians poured in, and finally Pappenheim took in the rear the force which was resisting the Duke Adolphus of Holstein Gottorp's assault on the south side of the city. Falkenberg had fallen, mortally wounded. The administrator, Christian William, was taken prisoner. His career was over, and he ended by becoming a convert to the Church of Rome and an imperial pensioner. By 1 p.m. Tilly was in complete possession of the maiden city, the vaunted bulwark of the Protestant faith. 
then began a massacre of the garrison and of armed and unarmed citizens in the streets houses and churches the nameless deeds of horror committed are only too well authenticated in the course of the afternoon fire broke out in several places and by the following morning virtually the whole of the city with the exception of the cathedral the Liebfrauenklauster, where soldiers are said to have helped to extinguish the flames and a number of houses in a remoter quarter was reduced to ashes there is no evidence that tilly interfered with the excesses of his soldiery till on the evening of the twenty second he granted pardon to all survivors among these were about a thousand people who had sought refuge in the cathedral on the twenty fourth tilly commanded the stoppage of all further plundering the charge that the destruction of the city by fire had been ordered by him is contradicted not only by his own statement but by every argument of probability the counter charge that it was due to falkenberg and some who with him desired to make an earlier moscow of magdeburg is more specious but rests on no satisfactory evidence Oppenheim's instructions early in the morning had no connection with the general conflagration. The mystery of its origin, if mystery it be, remains unsolved. Oppenheim, who estimated, and probably greatly underestimated, the loss of life in the sack of Magdeburg at 20,000, expressed his opinion to Maximilian that no such awful visitation of God had been witnessed since the destruction of Jerusalem the moral impression made by the sack of magdeburg on both friend and foe was without precedent or parallel even in the thirty years war it remains reflected in scurrilous songs of savage triumph in wrathful outcries penitential psalms and wild accusations it revealed itself in the amazed incredulity of wallenstein and in the uneasy eagerness of gustavus adolphus to disprove his responsibility for such a catastrophe but its immediate effect was neither from a military nor from a political point of view overwhelming even now gustavus relations with brandenburg and saxony remained to be settled about the middle of june after protracted negotiations he marched upon berlin the princesses of the electoral court headed by the venerable Louisa Juliana, Dowager Electress Palatine, went forth into his camp, and on the 19th, with much feasting and firing of guns, his compact with the elector was at last concluded. Spandau was placed in the king's hands for the rest of the war. Kustern too was, if necessary, to be given up to him, and the elector undertook to pay a monthly contribution of $30,000. Though Greifswald now fell, and the restoration of the Mecklenburg Dukes was in progress, Gustavus, leaving part of his forces on the Oder, advanced with the rest towards the Elbe, and after the capture of Havelberg, established himself in a fortified camp at Verben, in a very strong position between the Elbe and Havel. For a moment he had thought of not passing beyond the compact territory already conquered by him, but he soon elected to follow his star, about this time his queen arrived at volgast with a fresh body of swedish troops part of which were united with the six thousand englishmen and scots levied and brought to stettin by the marquis of hamilton at his own cost but this force like mansfeld's of old gradually melted away after the sack of magdeburg tilly uncertain as to the direction which the movements of his adversary would take had to the indignation of Pappenheim, remained in the vicinity of the ruins when at the end of may after both league and emperor had strengthened their forces the latter by troops from italy where the mantuan war was now over he at last set forth with nearly twenty five thousand men he marched not northeast but southwest upon hesse castle to stop the levies of landgrave william but he was soon summoned back to the elbe by pappenheim and by the end of july once more stood at volmerstead immediately below magdeburg early in august he approached the camp of gustavus at verben but after some fighting in which on the swedish side bernard of weimar took a prominent part 
till he perceived that he could not dislodge the king, and withdrew to the south of Magdeburg. Thus in August, Gustavus Adolphus was at leisure to pay a visit to Mecklenburg, and to assist at the entry of the dukes into Gustrau, now recovered by them, with the whole duchy except Rostock, Weismar, and Dolmetz. The elector of Brandenburg had, however unwillingly, submitted to the force of events. To the elector of Saxony, the fall of Magdeburg came home even more closely, especially when the emperor insisted on the dismissal of the Saxon troops, as he had already enforced that of the soldiery levied in the southwest in response to the Leipzig Convention. While William of Hesse Castle and Bernard of Weimar, each at the head of some thousands, stood on the Hessian frontier and in Fulda, Tilly was by the end of August massing the forces of both Emperor and League at Eisleben, Luther's birthplace in the county of Mansfeld, and once more the destinies of the house of Wetten seemed likely to be decided, together with the great issues of the religious conflict. The ferment of opinion, which found expression in a copious pamphlet literature, is explained by the multiplicity of considerations that pressed upon the stolid John George, his tenure of the Lusatias, his relations to the Edict of Restitution, and the conflict between his loyalty to the Emperor and the Protestant sympathies by which he was surrounded. These last found a courageous advocate in his court preacher, Hoa von Hohenegg, the most important personage in the electorate next to the elector himself. But John George listened rather to the advice of Wallenstein's former lieutenant, Arnim, now in the Saxon service, whose schemes for setting up a middle party between the Swedes and the Emperor bore some resemblance to the designs afterwards cherished by Wallenstein himself. For the present, however, Arnim advised the Swedish alliance, and by inducing Gustavus to promise his good offices for securing the archbishopric of Magdeburg to the Saxon prince Augustus, brought round the elector. On August 30th, John George offered his alliance to Gustavus, then at Brandenburg, and moved his army to Torgau. The Swedes hereupon advanced to Wittenberg, and during September the two armies lay side by side, awaiting the sequel. After addressing a last warning to the elector, on September 4th, he occupied Merseburg on the next day. On the 12th, John George and Gustavus concluded a close offensive and defensive alliance, which secured the direction of their joint action to the king. A decisive conflict between the Catholic and Protestant armies could now no longer be delayed. On September 15th, the Swedish forces, numbering 20,000 foot and 7,500 horse, and the Saxon, variously estimated at between 15,000 and 20,000 men, mustered at Dubin on the Mulda. Tilly's army of 23,000 foot and 11,000 horse was inferior in numbers to that of his enemies, and he had less than half their number, 60, of guns. He would therefore have preferred, before risking a battle, to wait for Aldringer, who, with a large force from the southwest, had already reached Erfurt. But this time, not only was the usual pressure exercised on him by Pappenheim and others, but he really had no choice. Leipzig, which he entered on September 16th, was almost an open town, and when he placed himself to the north of it to await the enemy, there was no time for fortifying his position. On the following day was fought the great battle of Breitenfeld, so called from the village a couple of miles northeast of Leipzig, towards which the Swedish right wing, at the crisis of the battle, drove their adversaries. The incomparably superior mobility of the Swedish troops, only part of whom were actually engaged in the battle, was the main cause of the victory. Neither the charge of Pappenheim's heavy cavalry, which finally lost touch with Tilly's center, availed, nor the rout of the Saxons on the left, whom the heavy mass of Tilly's right drove in confusion from the field, the elector himself being carried away as far as Eilenburg. The loose formation of Gustavus' order of battle enabled him to defy the Pappenheimers, throw himself upon Tilly's left, and finally by a sudden cavalry charge from his own right, retake the Saxon guns and capture Tilly's.
He had thus gained a complete victory before the September evening had closed in. His losses in the battle and the pursuit amounted to barely 5,000 of his own troops, besides 2,000 Saxons. Of Tilly's army, something like half, the numbers were variously stated from 7,000 to 12,000, were left on the field or taken prisoners. The remainder rallied at Alberstadt. Tilly himself was wounded, as was his adjutant general, Duke Astolfus of Holstein Gortup, who had taken so conspicuous a part in the siege of Magdeburg. The latter died in captivity at Eilenburg. The day of Breitenfeld, on which Tilly was widely held to have lost his reputation as a commander, suddenly raised that of Gustavus Adolphus to a height which it henceforth maintained. But it accomplished something more than this. His plans now entered into a phase which, in the view of the negotiations previously carried on by him, cannot be described as altogether new, but in which these plans rapidly assumed a breadth such as they had never before reached. His thoughts now went beyond Quote, satisfaction, end quote, and, quote, security, end quote, for a great Protestant victory, which had redeemed a dire Protestant catastrophe, had now marked him out as the champion of a cause adopted by half the empire. The momentum temporis proved decisive, but neither was it his formed intention to carry on an armed propaganda of Protestantism through the empire, nor had he definitely resolved on securing for himself the imperial crown, which Bernard of Weimar and others had beyond doubt suggested to him as within his reach. Of the two alternatives before Gustavus Adolphus, the one was to march direct upon Vienna while leaving Tilly to the Saxons. This course, which John George would have preferred, both as enabling him to enforce the principles of the Leipzig alliance in the west and southwest, and as sparing him a direct conflict with the emperor, besides bringing Gustavus nearer to Poland, would have been comparatively easy of execution. What has been pointed out by Clausewitz in a masterly summary of the situation, Gustavus was by no means one of those generals who achieved great results by sudden blows and rapid incursions. Moreover, at Vienna, though he could have done much there for the Protestants, he could not have established for himself any secure basis either for further action or for an ultimate settlement. Such a basis he sought, and practically established, by making himself master of a line that reached from Oder to Elba through Thuringia and Franconia by way of Frankfurt to the Middle Rhine. The isolated positions still occupied by the enemy in the north were of practically little significance. In the west he came into close touch with France. The troops of John George, which had gained no laurels at Breitenfeld, would for the present be suitably employed for the recovery of Silesia, a process which would completely estrange him from the emperor, and furnish him with a field of operation of his own, without forwarding his design of heading a third party in the empire. It has been suggested that Gustavus Adolphus had yet another reason for not directing his own attack upon the Habsburg lands. There can be no doubt, though until after the close of these transactions our knowledge concerning them is drawn from the untrustworthy confession of Shima Razin, that already in the earlier part of 1631, negotiations had been in progress between Gustavus and Wallenstein, and it is at least highly probable that to these dealings Arnim was no stranger. In the summer before the Battle of Breitenfeld, these communications, managed by Thurn and Rassen, Wallenstein's secret agent, led to a promise on the part of Gustavus that 12,000 Swedish troops should be entrusted to Wallenstein, who should be recognized as, quote, Viceroy, end quote, of Bohemia, the title king not being used as yet out of consideration for Frederick. Wallenstein, undertaking in return to overthrow the Habsburg dominion in Bohemia, Silesia, and Moravia, and to invade the Austrian duchies, but after his great victory, Gustavus, 
feeling no longer dependent on such help, suggested that the collection of a force on the Bohemian frontier should be left to Thurn. The king, therefore, does not appear to have had at this time reckoned on any important intervention from this quarter, but Wallenstein was soon to show that he had not forgotten the slight. Leaving the Saxon elector to deal with Leipzig, Gustavus Adolphus, after concluding an alliance with the princes of Anhold, set forth from Halle, September 27, 1631. Erfurt, where he held his entry on October 2nd, and where he concluded a final alliance with the Weimar Dukes, placing the command of the Thuringian Reserve in the hands of the eldest, William, was to serve as a base of operations for the main force, numbering about 25,000 men, with which, a few days later, the king, by way of Gotha, advanced into Franconia. On the middle and lower Elba, Bonner and Taut commanded smaller armies, of which the former occupied Magdeburg as a strategical position, whereupon the rebuilding of the town at once commenced, February 1632. Rostock capitulated to Taut, October 1631, who then advanced towards the Weser. The conquest of Franconia was rapidly accomplished by Gustavus Adolphus, after taking the important Würzburg fortress of Königshofen, he on October 12th entered the Episcopal city itself. After he had reconstructed the bridge across the mine, a struggle of several days made him master of the castle at Marienburg on the left bank, with its enormous accumulation of military supplies and ecclesiastical and literary treasures, of which later some found their way to Uppsala. The prince bishop had taken refuge in France, and Gustavus, relying on his title by conquest, at once prescribed the form of homage to be taken to himself as Duke of Franconia and to his heirs. The administration which he set up was composed of natives mixed with Swedish officers, and of the conventual and other landed property which he proceeded to distribute the larger share, went to members of the Franconian nobility who had taken his side. The news of the Swedish progress had scattered to the winds the Frankfurt, quote, composition, end quote, meeting, and while the Bishop of Bamberg tried to negotiate with the conqueror, the Protestant princes and towns, near and far, solicited his friendship. Nuremberg haggled long over her bargain, but by the end of October concluded, for a year in the first instance, a close alliance, as did the Margraves of Ansbach and Bayreuth, all of the petty Protestant estates round about following suit. Duke George of Brunswick Luneburg in the north, after protracted negotiations, and the House of Württemberg in the south, which had suffered severely by the Edict of Restitution, sought and obtained the alliance of the king. And with all Franconia, as far west as Hanau, under his control, he could enter upon the next stage of his resistless advance. Meanwhile Tilly, who on finding he was not pursued after Breitenveld, had turned into the much-vexed Hesse Castle, had been at last reinforced by Aldringer, and was now at the head of 18,000 troops. With these he, early in November, attempted a movement upon Würzburg and, after being smartly repulsed here by Gustavus himself, essayed to lay siege to Nuremberg. But the alliance with Gustavus in the presence of a Swedish garrison had infused into this city a spirit which determined him to raise the siege before Gustavus, who had turned aside from his advance, had come near. Whereupon the baffled veteran took up his quarters at Nordlingham, further south towards the Danube, on the right bank of which Maximilian had collected another army for the defense of Bavaria itself. On November 19th, Gustavus, leaving Horn behind him to guard Franconia, set out on his march towards the Rhine. Aschaffenburg was occupied without a blow. Frankfurt opened its gates, and, passing them, the king continued his march to Hoxt, in the electorate of Mainz where he was reinforced by 17,000 men under William of Hesse Castle. Thence he passed through the territory of William's Hesse-Darmstadt kinsmen 
to whom he granted moderate conditions being at first intent on seizing heidelberg december but he found the line of march much occupied by spanish troops and on drawing back had to dislodge them from a fortification on the right bank of the rhine facing oppenheim the garrison of mines upon which he now moved was commanded by a spaniard de silva the fortress surrendered december twentieth and the city redeemed itself from being plundered by a payment of eighty thousand dollars bernard of weimar brought the campaign to a brilliant close with the capture of mannheim by a stratagem january eighth sixteen thirty two at mines the capital of one of the leading princes of the league which now became gustavus's headquarters he established a civil administration resembling that set up at Würzburg, and prepared for his next campaign his intention was by means of vast armaments to raise the forces with which he had carried on his campaigns of sixteen thirty one to more than twice the present total but even more notable was the expansion of the general scope of his enterprise in the course of the last operations of sixteen thirty one he had been unexpectedly brought into conflict with the troops of a power with whom he had hitherto avoided entering into direct hostilities but though anxious not to precipitate a quarrel he was prepared to face this new complication while therefore mindful as ever of sweden's maritime safety he sent directions home that attention should be paid to the fortification of Gothenburg on the Kattegat. He put the explicit question to his Riksrag whether he should treat what had occurred as a rupture of the peace and openly declare war against Spain. The Riksrag replied that Spain must be held to have broken the peace, but that a declaration of war had better be adjourned yet the spanish branch of the habsburgs had unmistakably been added to the list of his de facto adversaries meanwhile the war had been once more carried into the lands of the austrian branch and by a strange irony of fate john george of saxony had become the assailant of the emperor in october sixteen thirty one the saxon army had marched into Lusatia where now stood ten thousand imperialists under tiefenbach and had then under arnim's command crossed into bohemia while a division largely composed of the remnant of hamilton's contingent under leslie kept silesia under control arnim's movement seems to have been intended as a diversion against the tiefenbachers rather than as a serious attack upon prague but when he had crossed the bohemian frontier trustworthy information reached him that the capital would easily drop into his hands there was no proof and no probability that the source of this information was wallenstein whose lands arnim on his march was careful to spare early in november the saxons stood before prague and occupied the city without a blow the handful of soldiery under maradas which garrisoned the city having taken its departure to tabor under the quote, protection end quote, of john george who soon arrived in person a species of reaction now ensued which restored many of the protestant exiles to their lands and was accompanied by some acts of violence but the elector appears to have kept in view the temporary character of his occupation and though egger and a few other smaller towns were taken there was no attempt at conquering the kingdom at large and in the south pilsen tabor and budweis all held out for the emperor arnim's position was full of difficulty between the pressure of the returned bohemian exiles headed by thurn ardent and indiscreet as ever the caution of the elector who as oxenscherna afterwards said could never make up his mind whether the emperor was his friend or his foe and the duplicity of wallenstein with whom arnim was in both direct and indirect communication december through january all question of an understanding between gustavus adolphus and wallenstein had for the present come to an end since breitenfeld and wallenstein who had by this time consented to levy an army for the emperor was really working for a separate peace with saxony <laughs> 
During the winter months of 1631 to 1632, then, Gustavus Adolphus was preparing for the resumption of war on an unprecedented scale. But neither were the thoughts of peace now, nor ever, absent from his mind. His position at this time, indeed, seemed that of arbiter of both war and peace. To his court at Mines, graced by the presence of his queen, Maria Eleonora, whom together with the Chancellor Oxenscherna, he had summoned from Stockholm, came the representatives of many princes and of cities, Ulm and Strasbourg, desirous of ratifying old alliances or concluding new. Thither came to the ex-elector Palatine, whose claims had, so late as the preceding spring, been still urged at Vienna by English embassies by his indefatigable agent Rusdorf, and who at Mainz was supported by Sir Henry Vane. Though received with much cordiality and courtesy, he was made to feel that his restoration had become a question of secondary importance. Of far greater moment than the wishes of England were the designs of France. Richelieu had never intended that Gustavus should take the ultimate issues of European politics into his own hands, or that after his great victory he should, instead of assailing the emperor's dominions, invade those of members of the League, to whom an opportunity of neutrality had been expressly preserved at Barvalda, and over whom Richelieu was most anxious to maintain his influence. Already before the Battle of Breitenfeld, he had half-forced Maximilian into a defensive alliance for eight years. And after the battle, when Maximilian claimed aid in men or money, had instead sent Charnassay to Munich to persuade the elector to abandon the emperor and neutrality towards Sweden. Maximilian, informed by Tillity and Aldringer of the insufficiency of their forces, and aware of the rumor of the approaching return of Wallenstein to the command of the imperialists, in the end made up his mind for neutrality as conductive to a general peace. Of the three spiritual electors, Trier at once accepted the proposal, while Cologne and Mainz, with the bishops of Würzburg, Worms, and Osnabrück, were at least prepared to negotiate. At a meeting of the League at Ingolstadt in January 1632, it was, notwithstanding the protests of the imperial ambassador Questenberg, resolved to invite the mediation of France. Gustavus Adolphus, to whom Richelieu's agents now addressed themselves, although he was desirous of a general peace on his own terms, can only have entered into the present negotiation with the view of detaching the League from the Emperor and of meeting the wishes of France. To the Munich proposal that the contemplated arrangement should be conditional upon his restoring to the members of the League any of their territories now in his occupation, he first returned a blank non possumus. Richelieu himself was very jealous of any encroachment by Sweden on what he regarded as the French sphere of influence, the left bank of the Rhine. And finally Gustavus offered a compromise. His conquests of the dioceses of Trier and Cologne, and in the lower Palatinate from Bavaria, were to be restored, but all other Swedish acquisitions were to be retained till the conclusion of peace while the army of the League was to be reduced to 12,000 men and quartered in the lands of its members. These proposals were accepted by Trier, and even by Cologne, who feared invasion, but were refused by Bavaria, who insisted on the restoration of Mainz, Würzburg, and Bamberg, and on a Swedish guarantee of Maximilian's electoral dignity during his life. The League was thus broken up, and Richelieu had in effect suffered a diplomatic rebuff prejudicial to the influence of France in western Germany. About the same time, an effort to bring about a general peace through the Protestant allies of Sweden was made by the busy Landsgrave George of Hesse-Darmstadt, quote, the peacemaker, end quote, in Gustavus' ironical phrase, quote, of the Holy Roman Empire, end quote. Prompted by the landless elector of Mainz, as well as by his fears for his own lands, which, as has been seen, Gustavus had treated with consideration, 
he proposed a meeting of catholic and protestant estates to lay down the basis of a general pacification and was ready with a scheme for reconstitution of the empire including the revocation of both the edict of restitution and of the reservatum ecclesiasticum the quote, satisfaction end quote, of sweden being left to the king's own judgment john george of saxony's mind too was working in the direction of peace but of a separate peace with the emperor who as early as october sixteen thirty one had begun to sound him on the subject the channel chosen by the emperor was wallenstein whose previous communications with gustavus adolphus were as yet unknown at vienna the question had been discussed in november between wallenstein and arnim who had urged that the policy of reaction must be abandoned by the emperor the status of sixteen eighteen restored and the bohemian question regulated afresh these negotiations continued and though richelieu sent an ambassador to john george and the elector another to gustavus adolphus december sixteen thirty one to discuss the general design and to propose a quote, composition end quote, meeting at nuremberg the king saw through the elector as he had seen through the cardinal at torgau in february sixteen thirty two john george made a futile attempt to detach george william of brandenburg and to bring him over to the policy of a separate peace with the emperor after which the king of sweden his task done might be induced to withdraw with an indemnity gustavus after returning a dilatory answer to his untrustworthy ally early in march took an opportunity of delivering himself in public at mines on the selfishness of saxony and on the hopelessness of coming to terms with the enemy end of section twenty three section twenty four of the cambridge modern history volume four the thirty years war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter six gustavus adolphus sixteen thirty sixteen thirty two by a w ward part three meanwhile the emperor like gustavus himself was preparing for a renewal of the struggle in a wider rather than a narrower area in february sixteen thirty two ferdinand the second concluded a close alliance with the ambitious king philip the fourth of spain and about the same time he demanded though in vain an auxiliary force from poland he could obtain no promises in italy except from florence and modena and none from switzerland even pope urban the eighth whose policy will be examined in a subsequent chapter adhered to his view that the war in germany was not a religious war as shown by the king of sweden's abstention from interference with any man's religion the sultan stimulated by gustavus was moving troops to the hungarian frontier no ally seemed to remain to the emperor but his spanish kinsmen unless the restless jealousy of christian the fourth were to range him on their side thus the refusal of bavaria to listen to the offers which would have detached her from his side and the manifest inclination of saxony to make peace without sweden and so had a kind of third party in the empire afforded much relief to ferdinand but he made a provision of his own against the danger which might sooner or later descend upon him by obtaining as early as december sixteen thirty one wallenstein's promise to levy an army for the imperial service these transactions had manifestly been hastened by the fear which at the time had not seemed idle that after taking possession of the whole of bohemia the saxon troops might invade the austrian duchies in december sixteen thirty one wallenstein at zenaim in moravia met Egenberg, whom he continued to trust it was agreed that in the course of three months he should levy and equip an army of seventy thousand men but without as yet definitely assuming the command the sound of his drums had a magical effect 
but for after all there had been many other very rapid levies in the course of the war still more wonderful was the power of organization which quickly welded into an effective army a mass heterogeneous in race religion and antecedents of service the genius of a great poet has with idealizing touch depicted the selfishness the savagery and the superstition which entered into this abnormal compound and also the force which gave it unity and discipline in addition to wallenstein's own vast expenditure large sums were contributed to the cost of raising this army by the colonels of the new regiments levied as well as by eggenberg and other members of the austrian nobility and by the young king of hungary unfortunately the written conditions under which in april sixteen thirty two the actual resumption of the chief command by wallenstein was settled at gallersdorf in lower austria are not extant and the accounts of the bargain contain much that is fictitious the power of signing treaties of peace was certainly entrusted to the generalissimo but with limitations which according to his own statement prevented him from treating with sweden on the other hand it may be safely inferred that he exacted from the emperor the promise of a revocation of the edict of restitution perfect independence in all matters military was as a matter of course now guaranteed to him and an explicit promise was made by the emperor that neither the influence of his confessor the mormain nor that of any other person should be allowed to interfere with wallenstein's action he had exercised the right of nominating his officers already during his earlier tenure of the chief command but it was now provided that no other independent command should coexist with his own in the empire and king ferdinand the emperor's heir was excluded from active service in the army still more notable was the stipulation that in lands conquered by him he should possess not only the right of confiscation but the prerogative of pardon extraordinary as these provisions are it should be remembered that both wallenstein's position as a prince of the empire and the actual nature of the political crisis placed him in relations towards the emperor which differed essentially from those between sovereign and servant moreover impenetrable as much remains in wallenstein's political calculations his new agreement with the emperor was not inconsistent with the design of re-establishing and raising the imperial authority though this involved affronting the pretensions on which the electors had insisted at ratisbon and impeding the progress of the catholic reaction wallenstein was a man of great thoughts and of aims beyond the common but as has already been seen he was also a man of business his title as duke of mecklenburg was now confirmed by the emperor but as his duchy was in swedish hands he was promised a full equivalent and in the meantime placed in possession of the immediate principality of glogau in silesia he was also relieved of a debt of four hundred thousand dollars still owing by him to the exchequer of bohemia from the time of his vast purchase of estates in that country of the conditions of wallenstein's military dictatorship which were made public at the time richelieu afterwards recorded his opinion that it would be difficult to decide whether they were more extraordinary or necessary from zenaim where in april the commander-in-chief had mustered his army he marched into bohemia where the demoralized saxon troops retreated before his approach as late as may thurn sought to reopen negotiations with wallenstein through his brother-in-law count trishika but in vain the negotiations with the elector john george for a separate peace were still in progress and gustavus adolphus who was kept well informed by a special envoy at the saxon court count philip reinhard von solms was already preparing to draw near to the electorate on may twenty first wallenstein had an interview at rakonitz with arnim to whom by virtue of his authority to conclude treaties he offered as the price of a separate peace the revocation of the edict of restitution and freedom of religion for the saxon electorate at the same time he held out the prospect of an imperial alliance to follow upon the peace nothing was actually concluded 
but on the following day wallenstein easily took possession of prague and the saxon army of occupation withdrew across the frontier to perna it will be seen how materially these events effected the action of gustavus adolphus himself in the midst of his victorious course the campaigns of sixteen thirty two notable for a multiplicity of operations of which only a few can be mentioned here began in february by the capture of bomberg by field marshal horn who was in command at Würzburg. being in his turn attacked by tilly he successfully broke out from the episcopal capital at the head of the garrison gustavus who about the same time had taken krusnach in the rhenish palatinate at once marched to horn's assistance and after effecting a junction with him at schweinfurt on the main drove tilly back into bavaria towards the danube here or on the lech maximilian had resolved that a stand should be made to protect his capital on the last day of march after some futile negotiations with the elector gustavus entered nuremberg in great state but immediately hurried on till within less than a week he stood before donauwerth where the lech flows into the danube till he was now near at hand but after his army of twenty thousand men probably much inferior to his adversaries in numbers had been joined by the garrison of Donauwerth, which had abandoned the place to the Swedes. It retreated down the river towards Ingolstadt. Here Maximilian appeared in person, and it was resolved to march back upon the Rhine in the angle between the Danube and the Lech, and if possible to prevent the Swedes from crossing the latter river. Gustavus, who had now secured the Danube up as far as Ulm, covered the construction of a bridge of boats across the lech by his artillery and thus brought his army over to the right bank in the battle which followed april fifteenth tilly was carried off the field wounded and by maximilian's orders the army now withdrew upon newburg in ingolstadt gustavus success had been made possible by the arms in which he excelled and the road into bavaria now lay open a fortnight later, April 30th, Tilly died of his wound at Ingolstadt. His last military doings had not added to his fame, and since he had met his superior at Breitenfeld, his habitual caution had been intensified by a sense of failure. The methods which he had learnt from his Spanish exemplars had broken down hopelessly before this new master of war nor was he a statesman soldier of the type of either gustavus or wallenstein but he had rendered great services at the most critical earlier stage of the war and the main share of the infamy attaching to the sack of magdeburg should fall not on him but on the practice of the age of warfare in which he held a conspicuous place from rhine the swedes without loss of time advanced upon augsburg which was entered upon april twenty fourth a garrison was placed here and a monthly contribution was promised by the free imperial city its municipal administration was entirely protestantized and the citizens swore an oath of quote, security end quote, to the king from a military point of view the triangle of danauwerth ulm and augsburg between danube and lech formed a position of incomparable strength but gustavus had no thought now of taking up a defensive position on april twenty sixth the advance continued upon ingolstadt which maximilian had likewise abandoned his only hope now lay in wallenstein whose aid he had urgently solicited for his attempt at securing a recognition of his neutrality from gustavus adolphus through the french resident etienne who is well aware how unwelcome the tidings of the quote, Goths end quote, progress must be to Richelieu, broke down on the demand of disbandment. But the siege of Ingolstadt proved more difficult than had been foreseen, and on May 1st Gustavus pushed on towards Landshut, which soon fell into his hands. At this point, some uncertainty was introduced into the king's movement by the news from Saxony and Bohemia which at first induced him to march in the direction of Nuremberg. When, however, an advance of Wallenstein into Bavaria seemed probable, 
the king turned back once more, and the march on Munich continued. About the middle of May, the precise date is disputed, Gustavus Adolphus entered the Bavarian capital, leaving his troops outside. A heavy requisition, three or four hundred thousand dollars, was imposed upon the town, but only the payment of part exacted, and even Maximilian's palace was spared, the chief spoil being the elector's celebrated collection of cannon in the arsenal. The stay of Gustavus in Munich was cut short by the news of untoward occurrences in the West. The elector of Trier had secured, quote, neutrality, end quote, by accepting the protection of France and yielding up to her his fortresses, including Coblenz. But his chapter had called in a Spanish force which seized Spayer and advanced into the Palatinate. Notwithstanding the disturbed state of this southwest, to which the dukes of Lorraine and Orléans were preparing to contribute, Gustavus had once more to march back upon Nuremberg, for the tidings had reached him of Wallenstein's entry into Prague, and of Arnim's withdrawal across the Saxon frontier. End of May The king was necessarily much disturbed by the news of the Rackenitz interview and its consequences. But his ambassador at Dresden was, in answer to his complaints, told that the elector himself attached no importance to the negotiations of his field marshal with Wallenstein, and that he hoped for a junction between Gustavus' army and his own at Leitmeritz. Deception was in the air, and the king, Arnhem's policy being also that of his master, was so fully persuaded that the conclusion of a separate peace between Wallenstein and the Saxons was impending, that he took measures for eventually buying over Saxon officers to the Swedish side. On the other hand, Wallenstein may not have intended to deceive the Saxons, for at this time he might still hope to oblige the emperor to accept his policy. On June 23rd, a special envoy from Gustavus arrived at Dresden, in the person of Count Palatine Augustus of Sulzbach, who laid before the elector a series of proposals on the part of the king. They are largely identical with the famous program put forward by him about the same time at Nuremberg, and nowhere is a clearer indication to be found of his political intentions when he stood at the very height of his military successes. A preliminary demand extremely distasteful to John George who had always shown a strong aversion from his brother elector, was the restoration of the unfortunate Frederick. The Swedish satisfaction was evidently susceptible of reduction, but ultimately Pomerania would clearly be insisted on. While some kind of supremacy was claimed by the king over the Catholic lands conquered by him, but the most startling proposal, at least from the Saxon point of view, was the formation of a corpus evangelicorum consisting of all the Protestant estates of the empire, strong enough to maintain against Austria, Spain, and the League any settlement that might be reached, and place under the direction of Sweden. When the king consulted the Riksrad as to the possible terms of peace, the necessity of the establishment of such a corpus, together with the retention of Pomerania, was strongly urged upon him. We are not informed as to the close of the negotiations at Dresden about these proposals, but the mission of Augustus of Sulzbach was so far successful that the elector promised to have no further dealings with Wallenstein unless with the king's consent, and on June 28th signified to Wallenstein that he had broken off the negotiations. On the other hand, the elector promised to unite his troops with the Swedes, Arnim betook himself to Silesia, and Wallenstein, having, in the last days of June, effected a junction with the Bavarian troops, headed by Maximilian himself, at Eger, marched with them upon Franconia. Their advent here had been anticipated by Gustavus Adolphus. When forced to change his plan of action, he left Banner and Bernard of Weimar behind him to hold Bavaria and Schwabia, and started on his long march with an army of not more than 18,000 men. On June 18th he reached Firth on the Regnitz, opposite Nuremberg. He now sent the experienced diplomatist Sattler and Hemnitz, the historian of the Swedish war, to ascertain the views of the Nuremberg authorities on the twofold question of a general 
and a separate peace. His propositions, though with variants of some importance, were in substance those which he had laid before the Saxon elector, and in the discussion of which notes are preserved, his emissaries argued in favor of a corpus evangelicorum under a qualified capo. In other words, Gustavus Adolphus aimed at becoming the head of a confederation which would have included all Protestant Germany. Although we do not know the limits to which he intended that his control might, permanently or temporarily, extend, this formed design on his part is of the very highest importance, far exceeding even that of Sattler's incidental statements as to what his master was prepared to do, should he in course of time be elected Roman king or emperor. This was not the present issue, though it was nearer to the domain of practical politics than when, during the winter negotiations at Mines, Richelieu is said to have dropped a hint in the same direction, and we have Oxenstierna's statement that his sovereign had no such end in view. Of immediate significance at the present moment was his eagerness to secure the towns, more especially the great towns of the southwest. If they adhered to him, and it will not be forgotten how closely already were the bonds which united to him the Hansa towns of the north, the princes, so he averred himself, would soon follow. The Nurnbergers, who remembered better than he the sorry days of the Union, demurred to any line being drawn between the princes and the towns. But Gustavus was determined and proposed an early meeting of the representatives of the town of Frankfurt. His messages, his words, his genial ways in the midst of the jubilant citizens— all betokened the complete confidence of victory. But his intention of crushing the Bavarians before their junction with Wallenstein was frustrated. Though, moving on from Firth, he occupied the road leading from Radisbon to Eger by Amberg and Weiden. The Bavarians had already reached Eger, and, massing his forces, Wallenstein was clearly desirous of waging a decisive conflict. June. That, with forces scattered over so wide an area, Gustavus should exhibit some uncertainty in his movements was inevitable. But after he had resolved in his turn on giving battle at Nuremberg, the energy with which he concentrated his forces is extremely remarkable. Before the actual conflict, he more than doubled his numbers, raising them to a little short of 48,000 troops, as against more than 60,000 enemies. The latter estimate, however, is very uncertain because of the extraordinary number of non-combatants. Fifteen thousand men, it is said, and as many women, comprised in Wallenstein's army. After falling back on Nuremberg and marking out a camp for his forces on the western and southern sides of the city, Gustavus paused to await both the arrival of the enemy and that of his own reinforcements. The fortifications of Nuremberg itself were strengthened, and the citizens cheerfully prepared for the defense, contrasting, if we may attach credit to a song of the day, their own hopefulness as they beheld their, quote, father, end quote, and his, quote, heroes, end quote, in their midst, with the desolation of Magdeburg when her fate was upon her. By the middle of the month, Wallenstein had taken up his position in a vast fortified camp, which extended on the left bank of the Regnitz as far as Firth, immediately opposite Nuremberg, and faced the main Swedish position from heights covered with batteries. The Swedes had failed in all their attempts to prevent the construction of the vast camp which threatened an effective blockade of the city and of the Swedish camp at its gates. Within the walls, the signs of famine were already at hand, for the town was crowded with fugitive peasantry, and the ravages of disease were spreading among the Swedish soldiery. Soon after the middle of August, however, Gustavus had gathered his forces. Wallenstein, strangely as it was thought, hazarding no interference with the arrival of the service contingents. The most important of these was that brought by Oxenstierna from Rhine and Mosul, with which, after effecting a junction with the troops of Benair and those of William of Weimar, he had reached Nuremberg on August 20th. All was now ready for a decisive struggle. On August 31st, 
The Swedish army was drawn up in fighting order along the Regnitz opposite Wallenstein's camp. But he would not accept battle. A cannonade opened on the following day remained ineffectual, and on the night of September 2nd, the Swedes crossed the Regnitz at a lower point and pitched their camp immediately opposite that of the enemy. On the morning of the 3rd, the attack upon the heights on the northern side of the camp began. The chief point of attack and defense was the Alta Vesta, a ruined castle in the middle of a clearance of the wood, which had been specially fortified by the Wallensteiners. Thrice the Swedes entered it, and thrice they were ejected from its walls. The struggle continued caldissimente, in Wallenstein's phrase, till darkness and the fall of rain rendered its continuance on the part of the Swedes impossible. But they held their ground during the night, and in the morning essayed another attack, but again in vain. Hereupon Gustavus withdrew his troops into the camp at Firth. The king frankly confessed to the Nuremburgers the failure of his great effort, but the preparations in which he engaged for constructing another camp showed that he had, as yet, no design of moving. Hereupon he once more tried negotiations with the adversary whose resistance had at last stayed his victorious course. The intermediary was the imperialist General Spare, one of Wallenstein's former agents, who had been taken prisoner by the Swedes. Thurn, too, and the bohemian agitator Bubna were in the king's camp, and may have contributed to complicate the situation. But the proposals of Gustavus, placed on record by Oxenstierna, were both clear and moderate. Pomerania and the dignity of a prince of the empire were to be the king's own satisfaction. The elector Palatine was to be restored, but so likewise was the elector of Mainz. Saxony and Brandenburg were to be compensated by Magdeburg and Halberstadt, Wallenstein by a duchy of Franconia. The emperor was to guarantee these arrangements. But Gustavus' offer of a conference on the question of peace, to be held in the sight of both armies, was declined by Wallenstein till he should have referred the proposal to the emperor. It was actually referred to him, and an indecisive answer came two months afterwards. As we know from Oxensterna, the impression left on Gustavus by the apathetic bearing of Wallenstein was that no settlement remained possible between them, but war to the knife. Meanwhile, though Gustavus had pressed forward the entrenchments, the lack of provisions was becoming serious on his side, and Wallenstein was in his turn being pressed by those around him to assume the offensive. But he was still immovable. At last the king, in order, if possible, to draw the fox, resolved on abandoning his position. Placing a garrison of nearly 5,000 in Nuremberg and sending a formal challenge of battle for the morrow to Wallenstein, he broke up his camp on September 18th. Three days later, after the Swedes had reached Neustadt near Coburg, Wallenstein also broke up his camp and, burning down the villages round Nuremberg, marched north. The course now pursued by Gustavus Adolphus is open to much criticism, nor can it be denied that his wonderful versatility and buoyancy at this time began to resemble a hazardous mutability of design. It should, however, be noted that the plan on which he now resolved had the persistent approval of Oxenscherna, who so often, as he told the king, had occasion to pour water upon his fire. Gustavus determined on returning to Schwabia, and thence moving down the Danube, to invade the Austrian lands, where he reckoned on being supported by a rising among the sturdy peasants of Upper Austria, of whose continued unrest satisfactory assurances had reached him. Wallenstein, the king seems to have calculated, would by such a movement be drawn out of Saxony, and in the meantime he ordered a Swedish force under Duwall from the Brandenburg side to join Arnim, who now had 16,000 men under his command. If, however, it proved necessary to furnish Saxony with further assistance, this task was to fall to Bernard of Weimar, who was placed at the head of the force in Franconia during the illness of his elder brother, William. Yet when Bernard proposed to move forward on his own account, the king showed much displeasure. He had once more modified or postponed his plan of action, 
and after crossing the Danube at Donauwerth and recapturing Rhine, halted at Newburgh with the intention of continuing his march to the Lake of Constance. October. Here at last, definite news reached him of Wallenstein's movements, and an interval of high-strong expectation ended in clear and firm resolve. Notwithstanding the doubts of Gustavus, who remembered the old dealings with Arnim and his master, Wallenstein had never hesitated in his determination to crush the Saxons, after Gustavus had himself failed to come to their aid. Against Arnim, Maradas had led an imperialist force from Bohemia, and in the middle of August, Field Marshal Hulk had by Wallenstein's orders broken into the southwest of the electorate and finally carried his raids as far as the neighborhood of Dresden. Hulk, a Dane and a Lutheran by birth and breeding, who had formerly served against Wallenstein in Stralsund by the brutal excesses of his flying column earned for himself in the Erzgebirge and its near neighborhood a long-enduring infamy. In September, Wallenstein detached Gallus with a force of from 10,000 to 12,000 in Hulk's wake, and in the middle of October, the Bavarian troops, having marched south to operate nearer home against the Swedes, himself approached by way of Thuringia, and after effecting a junction with both Hulk and Gallus, reached Leipzig. Both town and castle, the Pleisenberg, after a show of resistance, capitulated. The commander-in-chief was here also joined by Aldringer with a division from Bavaria, and by Pappenheim, who during the greater part of the year had been carrying on a successful operations in the northwest against the Swedish commanders Tott and Baudson, and against the wary Duke George of Lüneburg. With some reluctance, Pappenheim relinquished a kind of warfare in which he excelled, and took up his position near that of Wallenstein at Halle. The whole district between the Elbe and the Sala was now under the control of the imperialists, whose headquarters were at Weissenfels. Their entire force, including the Pappenheimers, may be reckoned at over 25,000 foot and 15,000 horse, with, it is stated, 70 guns. But, as in the case of the Swedish army, there is much uncertainty in this estimate. Sure at last of Wallenstein's purpose, Gustavus determined upon keeping his promise to the Saxon elector. The intentions of John George may even now have seemed doubtful to the king, but whether Wallenstein were to crush Saxony, or whether it were to lapse into neutrality, Gustavus, as he seems now to have fully recognized, would be placed in an impossible position. His way home would be blocked, his tenure of Pomerania imperiled by the, quote, Duke of Mecklenburg, end quote, and the freedom of the Baltic might once more be threatened by the imperial commander-in-chief. If so, where was he to look for allies? Denmark's jealousy was stronger than ever. The desire of the United Provinces for peace grew with the revived ambition of Spain to take part in the war. He could place no trust in English diplomacy, which in the person of Sir Henry Vane continued to occupy itself with the subsidiary question of the restoration of Charles I's brother-in-law. Even France, while leaving the subsidies promised at Barvalde unpaid, was alike intent upon her own operations on the Rhine, and undesirous of making Gustavus the arbiter of the German war. His progress had reached a stage of great difficulty, and we know for certain that in these closing weeks of his career of conquest, his mind was much occupied with what had been his primary concern when he had opened his German campaigns, the problems of safeguarding the destinies of his own Swedish kingdom. On October 17th, the Swedish army reached Nordlingen, and on the 24th, Gustavus rode into the faithful city of Nuremberg, there to confer with Oxenscherna on the situation. The Chancellor was to remain as the king's plenipotentiary in southern Germany, with instructions to summon to Ulm a meeting of the Schwabian, Franconian, and two Rhenish circles, which should there renounce their allegiance to the emperor, accept the king's direction and protection, 
and ordered a general excise towards the prosecution of the war. The Chancellor received the King's instructions as to the government of his daughter and heiress, Christina, should his death take place during her minority. At Erfurt, Gustavus bade farewell to his queen, and on November 11th he reached Nuremberg, about nine miles from Weissenfels. After the Hessians and the Weimarers had joined him, his force is reckoned to have amounted to 19,000 foot with 6,500 horse and 60 guns. The troops of John George of Saxony and Duke George of Lundeberg were not on the spot. Arnim, who commanded the Saxon forces that were still in Silesia, was busily negotiating according to his wont. But with all his coming and going, Gustavus' urgent entreaties could not induce the elector to do more than order two regiments of horse to march south with the Lüneburg troops. None of these, or of the Saxons, appeared on the field of battle. To keep in touch with Pappenheim, Wallenstein moved back his main army on Merseburg and Lutzen, and by this movement induced Gustavus to advance. On the evening of November 15th, the Swedes stood on the border of the great plain which opens east of the Sala upon Lutzen, Markranstadt, and Leipzig. In this war, as in the Napoleonic, the chosen battlefield of its nations. On the morning of the 16th, in a November fog, the Battle of Lutzen began. The high road to Leipzig had been entrenched by Wallenstein and was defended by artillery. Behind it stood his army, in three lines of battle, with cavalry on either wing. Upon it the Swedes advanced, in their lighter formation of two lines, the king and his blue and yellow guards on the right, Bernard of Weimar, but as to this the accounts differ, in command on the left. About ten o'clock the fog for a time dispersed, and the attack, led by the king in person, began. Notwithstanding a charge of Ottavio Piccolomini's cavalry, the Swedes had taken the battery on the road, but they were driven out again, and as the fog thickened, Gustavus, hastening to the assistance of one of his regiments, was momentarily isolated and carried among the enemy's cavalry. His horse received a wound, and then he was wounded himself, whereupon he begged the Duke Francis Albert of Lauenburg to help him from the field, but the Duke fled. A royal page, Lubelfing, remained by the side of his master when some troopers rode up and put an end to his life. His body was found naked and covered with wounds. The supposed foul play on the part of the Duke of Lauenburg is an exploded fiction. This happened about noon, but the battle continued to rage till nightfall. So soon as the king's death became known, the command of his army was taken over by Bernard of Weimar. Pappenheim, whose cavalry now intervened in the battle, was in his turn mortally wounded. He died the next day at Leipzig. After the imperialists had recovered their batteries on the high road, they were finally driven out by the valor of the Swedish infantry. But nearly the whole of the Yellow Regiment was destroyed in the process. Late in the evening, after making a last attempt to rally his yielding troops, Wallenstein ordered a retreat to be sounded, and Leipzig was reached in the course of the night. He had left 6,000 dead on the field, the Swedes 4,000. The stern judgment afterwards held by Wallenstein at Prague, when he magisterially distributed capital and other punishments, as well as large pecuniary rewards, seems to indicate that he had no choice but to retreat. Yet, though the Swedes held their ground, they ventured on no pursuit. Both sides thought fit to claim the victory, and a Te Deum was celebrated at Vienna. The exultation, however, both here and at Madrid, where the death of the King of Sweden was enacted on a stage accustomed to present to its spectators miracles and visitations of divine providence, was due to a single incident in the battle, rather than to its general result. The death of Gustavus Adolphus, at the height of his fame and almost at the height of his power, when still in the prime of his life, 
he was not yet thirty-nine years of age, and full of aspirations which, marvelous as his career had been, were still unsatisfied, struck the world with awe and was fitly moralized by Cardinal Richelieu, the man who best knew how to turn the event to political account. The full significance of the removal of such a personality from the very midst of the scene of military as well as that of political action, it would be almost impossible to overestimate. He was great, not only because of what he achieved, but of what he set himself to accomplish. Oxenscherna may have been warranted in asserting that his master intended to be emperor of Scandinavia and to rule over an empire comprising all the Baltic lands. He certainly meant Sweden to be made impregnably strong, and left free to hold to the faith which she had chosen. Thus, as the simple triplet on the th stone at Breitenfeld averes, he saved religious liberty for the world. He did so consciously, and not as a mere consequence of his political designs. To the fulfillment of his purpose, he brought the gifts of a born ruler of men, as well as those of a great general and a great statesman. Cast in heroic mold, of commanding stature and fair-haired, Ray Doro. He was a Swede every inch of him. Affable, free of speech, full of wrath if discipline were broken or disaster provoked, he was the comrade of his soldiers, by whose side he fought and prayed. He was at the same time a master of military detail. His reforms were grounded on experience, and his tactics inspired by the presence of victory. He had been carefully trained in the art of government, and besides being able to speak eight languages, and interested in letters and learning, he was versed in the administrative business of his own country, and capable of understanding the political systems of other lands. He was an adept in negotiation. He was proof against the diplomatic insinuations of Wallenstein, and met as an equal the statecraft of Richelieu. His occasional political miscalculations and his strategic mistakes, not always easily distinguishable from one another, were almost invariably redeemed by his courage and resource. But the foundation of his strength lay in his unfaltering conviction that his cause was that of his country and one of which God had charged him with a defense. End of section 24「Section 25 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 4, The Thirty Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7. Wallenstein and Bernard of Weimar, 1632 to 1635, by A. W. Ward, Part 1. 1. Wallenstein's End, 1632 to 1634. During the winter months which followed on the Battle of Lützen, neither of the hosts which contended for victory there maintained possession of Saxony were engaged in important operations beyond its borders. While Wallenstein, after evacuating the electorate, set up his winter quarters at Prague, and there collected the forces with which in May he joined Gaius in Silesia, the Swedish army broke up again into several divisions. That commanded by Bernard of Weimar after clearing Saxony of hulks and other imperialist soldiery, passed into Thuringia and Franconia. In March, Bernard pushed forward as far as the river Altmühl in the Ansbach territory, and, after a brush with the redoubtable Bavarian cavalry general, Johann von Wirth, united his forces south of Donauwirth with those of Horn who had, in the last month of 1632, conquered nearly the whole of Elsace. The expectant character of these movements on the one and the other side 
is explained by the fact that Lützen had virtually been a drawn battle. But in the summer of 1633, they came more or less to a standstill. Wallenstein's by his own calculated inaction, Bernard of Weimar's because of an agitation, it can hardly be called a mutiny, in the Swedish army, which was only with some difficulty repressed. Broadly speaking, we may regard this standstill as reflecting the doubts and difficulties which, after the death of the great king, pressed upon some of the chief combatants. The Swedes, though resolved not to break off except on their own terms the struggle of which their king had, first and last, so clearly defined the ends, could no longer exercise over its progress the controlling influence proper to his mighty personality. Gustavus Adolphus was succeeded on the Swedish throne by his daughter Christina, a child of six years of age, and, so long as she remained in tutelage, the government, as will be shown in a later chapter, was practically carried on by a small committee directed by the strong will of the Chancellor, Axel Oxenschierna. The widow of Gustavus, Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, was not included among the regents and guardians. Although the system of government during the minority of the, quote, elected queen, a designation partly intended to repress any pretensions on the part of the Polish Vassas, was not approved by the Swedish Diet till January 1634, Oxenschierna secured a twelve month earlier the confirmation of his commission as legate of the crown, with full powers in the Holy Roman Empire and as regarding all Swedish armies. Thus there was preserved to these armies in Germany that unity of control which had given them so inestimable an advantage over their adversaries, and to which it had been the constant purpose of Gustavus to subject the military affairs of his German allies. To his position of trust, for which it might be difficult to find a parallel, Oxenschierna brought, besides a perfect knowledge of his late master's mind, the insight and judgment of a great statesman. He proved, indeed, unable to solve the perennial problem of a working control of the military executive by the civil authority. Beneath his methodical ways and a phlegmatic temperament that provoked the wit of the young queen, there burnt a flame of patriotic ambition and incorruptible loyalty, to which a series of eminent commanders proved responsive. But the union of military and political leadership and the enthusiasm which the great king's personality had communicated to the Swedish armies and nation had perforce become things of the past. Though the relaxation of the bond between the Swedes and the chief Protestant princes was in agreement with the usual policy of John George of Saxony, a warlike impulse had momentarily seized upon him, due, it would seem, to a visionary scheme of securing the Bohemian crown to his son and namesake. The unlucky Frederick, who had so long worn the empty title of King of Bohemia, had died at Mainz on November 29, 1632, still awaiting, though with drooping hopes, his restoration to his Palatine inheritance, now, with the exception of Heidelberg, reconquered from the foe. But neither Oxenschierna, who had arrived in Dresden on Christmas Day, nor the military chiefs of the Swedish armies, fell in with John George's design. He was all the more unwilling to yield to the Chancellor's demand that the entire body of Protestant estates should be placed under the direction of Sweden, and adhered to his view that Saxony was the proper head. At Berlin, whither Oxenschierna next repaired, he found George William in a more yielding mood. He was well aware at whose expense Sweden would in any treaty of peace seek to obtain her satisfaction, and was naturally anxious to conciliate the Chancellor. The project of a marriage between George William's heir, afterwards the great elector, and Queen Christina had not yet been laid aside, 
But soon after this, George William showed signs of falling back into line with Saxony, and committed the command of his troops in Silesia, where old Count Tern had been made Swedish commissioner, to Arnim, now a Saxon field marshal, February to March. John George hereupon began once more to incline to think of concluding peace without Sweden. Though nothing as yet came of the idea, he was encouraged in it both by Wallenstein's former agent Spar and by Christian IV of Denmark, who eagerly proffered a not wholly disinterested mediation. In January 1633, Oxenstierna had divided the main Swedish army giving the command of the larger half to Duke George of Lundberg, who, with Knipshausen under him, occupied the Weser lands, and that of the smaller to Bernard of Weimar, to the dissatisfaction of his elder brother, Duke William. Oxenscherna was well aware of the difficulty which must beset any attempt to secure the adhesion of the Protestant states at large to an alliance directed by Sweden, against the wishes of Saxony, so long as Brandenburg remained lukewarm and most of the lower Saxon estates only wished for a safe neutrality. Sweden's one trustworthy friend was Landgrave William of Hesse Castle, and his troops were needed for the defense of his own territory. Perceiving that in the present instance the half was greater than the whole, Oxenscherna therefore fell back upon those portions of the empire the Franconian, the Schwabian, and the two Rhenish circles, which had been placed under his direct control by King Gustavus. United with these estates by means of a separate alliance under her own direction, Sweden must endeavor to carry on the war side by side with another combination of estates under Saxon leadership, and perhaps in time the weaker might be absorbed by the stronger body. The alliance concluded at Heilbronn, Ulm having seemed too remote a place of meeting, on April 23, 1633, was accordingly one of those compromises which deserve to be regarded as great political achievements because they avert paralysis. In order to reach a conclusion, Oxenscherna consented to important sacrifices, and, though Sweden obtained the direction of the alliance, especially in military affairs, a federal council was established, of which seven members were to be nominated by the estates of the four circles, and only three by Sweden. The functions of this council were to be consultative rather than executive, but it was likely to find many opportunities for interference. These chances were not ignored by Richelieu, who, desirous as he was of securing the continuance of hostilities between Sweden and the House of Austria, jealously watched Sweden's intervention in what he regarded as the French sphere of influence on the Rhine. While, therefore, the conclusions of the Heilbronn alliance was furthered by the French ambassador at the convention, Menas de Paz, Marquis de Fouquier, who had, in 1633, been sent on an extraordinary mission to the emperor and the Catholic and Protestant estates of the empire, his efforts were also directed to the diminution within that alliance of the dominant influence of Sweden. For the rest, the annual war contributions of the four circles were fixed at no less a sum than $2,500,000, and before the convention separated, it resolved on the restoration of the Palatinate to Frederick's heir, Charles Louis. Frederick's brother, Louis Philip, undertook the administration of the country, to which, after the easy recapture of Heidelberg, May 24, 1633, prosperity began to return. Oxenscherna's rapid conclusion of the Heilbronn alliance, however much it left to be desired from the Swedish point of view, had successfully isolated the elector of Saxony especially after the elector of Brandenburg had come into the new league. But the chancellor could not shut his eyes to the fact that his achievement was quite as advantageous to France as it was to Sweden. Richelieu, for reasons explained elsewhere, and because he wished to prepare his ground before proceeding to action, 
continued to defer any direct French intervention in the German war. In 1631, the Peace of Cherasco, which secured an open way into Italy for France, had enabled him to devote a closer attention to her relations with the empire. Its rights or claims over Lorraine he treated with contempt. But when, in obliging Duke Charles to conclude the disastrous and humiliating Treaty of Liverdun, June 1632, Richelieu imposed upon him as one of its conditions neutrality during the continuance of the German War. He saw that the course of the, that war would furnish him with opportunities of mixing up the question of Lorraine with that of Alsace, now almost entirely in Swedish hands. And he was therefore most desirous that the war should continue. His action towards the spiritual electors on the left bank of the Rhine has already been noted in a previous chapter. On the approach of Gustavus, and the occupation of Mainz, the electors of Cologne and Trier had appealed to France for the protection of their neutrality, and, though this appeal had remained unanswered, the quick-witted Philip Christopher of Trier had admitted French garrisons both into the fortress of Ehrenbreitstein, opposite his residence of Koblenz, and into Trier itself, previously occupied by Spanish troops. The footing thus gained by France she was unlikely to relinquish to either friend or foe. Thus, after the death of Gustavus, Richelieu's most pressing interest was to keep together the offensive alliance against the House of Austria, now once more in close cooperation with Spain, and to preclude the possibility of the withdrawal of the Swedish army, which had been actually threatened by Oxenstierna. On the other hand, Richelieu was ready to take immediate advantage of the removal of Gustavus himself, before whose commanding personality his own indomitable will had found itself obliged to bend. Hence, the twofold activity of Fouquier at Heilbronn in favor of the compact concluded there, while at the same time the hands of Oxenstierna were bound as far as possible by a renewal of the Franco-Swedish alliance on terms essentially the same as those of the Treaty of Barvalde, and renewing the promise of a French subsidy, April 19, 1633. Inasmuch as the Heilbronn alliance placed all the military forces of the West under Swedish control, it was upon the commanders of those forces that the mantle of the conquering Gustavus may be said to have fallen. After their junction near Donauwert, April 1633, Horn and Bernard of Weimar alternately held the chief command, neither of them consenting to regard himself as the subordinate of the other, and Oxenstierna being desirous of offending neither. Though both had high qualities as commanders, the want of unity in their councils made itself at times disadvantageously felt in the course of the next campaigns. Gustav Carlsen, Horn, Count of Bjornberg, who sprang from a family of high distinction in the Swedish service, had, after taking a prominent part in the Polish war during Gustavus' German campaigns, held the position of the King's Field Marshal, Lieutenant General. He had materially contributed to the victory of Breitenfeld, and had subsequently been named Director of the Würzburg Principality. He was a commander of much circumspection, learned in the theory as well as experienced in the practice of war, and a strict disciplinarian. Within the last months of 1632, he had conquered the whole of Alsace, with the exception of Hagenau. In the personality of Bernard of Weimar, there was something which more nearly resembled that of the great king, whose last battle he had fought to a conclusion. From his Ernestine ancestors, he had inherited a passionate disposition, which in one of his brothers, the unhappy John Frederick, swerved into madness, but in Bernard was disciplined into a noble ardor. His own statement, that from his youth upwards his thoughts had been bent upon doing service to God and his beloved country, was no mere profession. His intellectual tastes, he was a lover of books, 
and his modest simplicity invested him with a chivalrous charm. In the field, he was all eagerness for battle. Unfortunately for himself, he was, like Duke George of Lundberg, who commanded in the Lower Saxon Circle and its vicinity, only a younger brother in a princely house, a position which, while it aroused in him a strong dynastic ambition, left him unable to meet on an independent footing the great powers whose support was indispensable to the cause of Protestantism and of German liberty. Once more, then, the Swedish army stood at the gate of Bavaria, and once more Maximilian was soliciting the aid of Wallenstein, who remained immovable in Bohemia. The Swedish forces seemed to have numbered about 18,000 men, and if, as Bernard expected, Wallenstein marched to offer them battle, he could not be met without Saxon assistance. But before long a new difficulty arose, the inner history of which remains to some extent obscure. Since the Swedish army had landed at Usedom, it had changed in its composition and to some extent in its character. Losses, made good by reinforcements of which only a fraction was derived from Sweden, while they mainly consisted of soldiery levied near and far, and in all the regions of the empire through which the troops had passed during their ceaseless marches and countermarches, had changed the very texture of the army. The disproportion between Swedes and soldiers of other nationalities was much greater than before, more especially in the divisions detached from the force commanded by the king in person. As has already been seen, the principle of making war pay for itself had been more and more fully adopted by Gustavus. But even during his lifetime, notwithstanding the heavy contributions exacted and requisitions made, and, when they had been received, the French subsidies, it had been found impossible to provide the full pay of the soldiery, especially in the detached divisions. The king had thus fallen into debt with his troops, but more especially with the colonels who commanded, and had frequently themselves levied regiments, advancing sums of their pay in the expectation of being duly repaid with interest. Here and there in the conquered territories, especially in Franconia, some of the officers had been compensated by the grant of or promise of landed estates. For many reasons, the death of the king inevitably impaired the cohesion and the general discipline of the army. During the winter of 1632 to 1633, the commanding officers took to levying contributions on their own account, while the soldiers seized the goods and chattels of the inhabitants and committed all kinds of depredations and other excesses. The general discontent grew apace, and when it was found that the Convention of Heilbronn, on which great hopes had been placed, was more anxious for the reformation of the army than for its contentment, the accumulated dissatisfaction burst forth. A remonstrance was drawn up by two officers of the Franconian army, one of them the Colonel Mitzlaff, who had commanded the remnants of Mansfeld's troops in Silesia, and had then passed into the Danish, and then into the Swedish, service. Quite in the style of the English agitators of a rather later date, this document insisted on the payment within four months of the outstanding balances, failing which, instead of continuing to fight the enemy, the officers and troops would establish themselves as a corpus in the conquered lands and hold these in pledge for their pay. The paper was numerously signed by the officers, but there is no trace of an organized mutiny among the common soldiery. The attitude of Horn and Bernard of Weimar toward this agitation is obscure. While they protested against the menaces of the officers, they found themselves willing to advocate the claims preferred, and, while Horn insisted on carrying the remonstrance in its crude and unamended form to Heilbronn, Renard, who was certainly to benefit by the movement, and who, as Puffendorf hints, may helped to have set it on foot, wrote in support of the demands. <laughs> 
Ochsenschirner, in his turn, was so much impressed by the gravity of the situation that he persuaded the estates at Heilbronn, before separating, to agree to the principle of a month's immediate pay to the troops, and resolved upon bestowing estates in the conquered lands as Swedish crown fiefs upon the, their chief commanders, Bernard in particular, in return for their undertaking to satisfy the claims of officers and men. On these lines, the grievances of the army were settled in the course of the summer and autumn of 1633. Bernard, who during Horn's absence had employed the troops in seizing the bishopric of Eichstätt, which they were freely allowed to loot, in May held an interview with Oxenschirna at Frankfurt to arrange his share, the lion's share, of the settlement. About the middle of June, the document was signed in which the Crown of Sweden, by its own authority and without the concurrence of any of the estates of the empire, created Bernard, Duke of Franconia, in his own right. Bernard, who had hitherto held no independent position of his own, had long desired a hereditary principality, and some promise of the kind may have been made to him by Gustavus Adolphus. His further wish to become, not only, as he did now, a member of the Heilbronn Alliance, but also the commander-in-chief of its forces, was frustrated by the jealousy of Horn, and perhaps also by the foresight of Oxenschirna. The new duchy of Franconia included, in substance, only those parts of the Franconian circle which had formed the seas of Würzburg and Bamberg. And even here, the crown of Sweden reserved to itself the fortresses of Würzburg and Königshofen. Bernard was not declared an immediate prince of the empire. The comparison between his dukedom and Wallenstein's in Mecklenburg is therefore imperfect. On the contrary, he had to renounce all connection with the empire and declare himself explicitly a vassal of the crown of Sweden, to whom, in the event of his dying, Without male issue, the duchy was to escheat. In this new character, Bernard, with Oxenschirna, made his appearance at an assembly of the chief princes of the Heilbronn Alliance, held later in June 1633 at Heidelberg. The capital of the Palatinate, the last place in it held by the imperialists, had on May 24 capitulated to Count Palatine Christian of Birkenfeld. The assembly agreed to levy in all the lands included in the alliance a 10% tax on the produce of all fields and vineyards, and, the means being thus provided, a settlement was arranged here and completed at Frankfurt, July, which at last put an end to the critical condition of affairs in the army. Bernard's absence from the army was prolonged during July, while he was taking possession of his new duchy and establishing his brother Ernest there as regent. In the meantime, Horn held the command without making much progress, though in the course of the month he took Pappenheim and then Neumarkt, near Landschut, having advanced from Donauwert with his main force. He was beginning to lose all control over his troops. Villages were destroyed, the peasantry was maltreated, the officers neglected their soldiery, and the men, provided with sham passes, roamed over the country in quest of plunder. The old discipline had fallen out of gear, and the Swedish name was beginning to be associated in the minds of the German population with the worst horrors of war. But Bernard's return was still delayed, this time by intrigues between his brother Duke William and John George of Saxony. At last, Bernard induced William to allow part of his troops to reinforce the army of the Danube, which he rejoined early in August, and which now seems to have reached a total of 12,000 horse and nearly as many foot. Commissaries of the Swedish crown had already arrived at Augsburg, while, with some demur, the officers and men accepted a month's pay from the Heilbronn Alliance, the commanders of regiments, consented to accept in satisfaction of their claims grants of land which, though guaranteed by the Swedish crown, purported to be bestowed as hereditary fiefs of the empire, 
grantees had to pay the war contributions already fixed or to be eventually imposed by the alliance and bound themselves to depend on Oxenstierna as legate of the Swedish crown. The value of the lands thus granted in the southwest was estimated at over four millions of dollars. The army, having thus been contented, and measures taken to prevent further excesses, August to September, it once more became possible to contemplate offensive operations on a larger scale. Although the division of the Supreme Command boded ill for the maintenance of the requisite unity of design, the general condition of affairs was favorable to the allies of Heilbronn. Alsace had been almost entirely conquered by Horn. In August, Christian of Birkenfeld defeated the Duke of Lorraine at Pfaffenhofen when advancing to defend Hagenau and Elsass, over which he had certain rights. The favorable opportunity for reopening hostilities against Lorraine was at once seized by France, under whose protection the elector of Trier had now openly placed himself. Frederick Henry of Orange had taken Rheinberg, and in Switzerland also French influence was active. The whole line of the Rhine was thus held by the United Provinces, France, and Sweden, and the alliance between the latter two powers was nearer than ever to becoming an alliance in the field. While the Austrian possessions in Alsace were thus in hostile hands, Spain too had every reason for breaking the existing control of the line of the Rhine. The peace negotiations opened in 1632 between her and the United Provinces had led to no result, and as the days of the Infanta Isabel Clara Eugenia drew to a close, the hopes of a Pacific settlement dwindled. Philip IV had some time since resolved on sending his youngest brother Ferdinand, who, though Archbishop of Toledo and a cardinal, was full of secular ambition into the Spanish Netherlands, where he was in time to succeed the Archduchess as governor. As the Dutch were masters of the sea, the Cardinal Infant would, when the time came, have to proceed to the provinces by land, and the Spanish government proposed to clear the way for him by means of a force of 24,000 men to be levied in Italy. They were to be commanded by the Duke of Feria, governor of Milan, who had already seen some experience of the German war. It will be seen how this Spanish expedition, even while still remote, excited the jealousy of Wallenstein, and how his displeasure was intensified by the emperor's consenting, against the tenor of the agreement between them, to place Aldringer and his force at the disposal of Maximilian of Bavaria for the defense of his electorate. Bernard had steadily kept in view an attack upon Ratisbon, but in his return to Donauwert, he found that Horn had already departed with part of the army to lay siege to Constance. In the middle of September, Feria actually appeared at Innsbruck, though with a force of only 8,000 foot and 1,200 horse, and not in very good case. But he managed to effect his junction with Aldringer and to relieve Constance and Breisach before Horn and Bernard had united their forces. In October, the two armies lay close to each other, near the Lake of Constance, neither side caring to risk a battle, when, direct hostilities having at last broken out between Wallenstein's troops and Arnim's Saxo-Swedish forces in Silesia, Oxenschirna instructed Bernard to create a diversion in their favor by invading either Bavaria or Bohemia and leaving Horn to deal with Feria and Aldringer. Bernard could thus at last carry out his long-cherished design against Ratisbon. Disregarding the successful operations by Johann von Wirth and the insecure condition of his own duchy of Franconia, Bernard, with characteristic impetuosity, now moved direct upon his goal. Starting with 10,000 men from Donauwert, he executed a rapid march between the Skilla of Ingolstadt and the Charybdis of Eckstedt to the Altmühl, and thence direct upon Ratisbon. In vain, at the last moment, Maximilian applied for aid to Feria and Aldringer, 
they were too far away. To Gaius, who had succeeded Hulk, and whom Wallenstein would not allow to move from the Bohemian frontier. And to Wallenstein himself, who had no intention of coming to a Lea Elector's aid. Ratisbon was garrisoned by 2,000 Bavarian troops under Colonel Troibres. But notwithstanding a powerful and active Catholic clergy, the sympathies of the majority of the citizens, and a minority of the town council, were Protestant, and with Maximilian the city had a long-standing quarrel. Ratisbon, which lay on the right bank of the Danube, was completely blocked by Bernard. Johann van Wert's horse were kept at a distance, and the bombardment, begun on November 10, 1633, having after two days' intermission been resumed with great vigor on the 13th, the garrison capitulated on the following day. It was allowed free departure with the honors of war, but the majority of the garrison proposed to come over to Bernard. Hereupon, he held his entry into Ratisbon amidst the rejoicing of the population. And on November 16, the anniversary of the Battle of Lützen, a solemn Protestant service was held in the cathedral. No excesses dishonored Bernard of Weimar's brilliant achievement, which at once made him the hero of the Protestant West. Not only had he succeeded while others, at Constance and at Breisach, had failed, but he had carried out a difficult design with dazzling promptitude. And while the bulwark of Bavaria had fallen, the line of the Danube, the road to Vienna itself, lay open before him. In the meantime, the bishop and the Catholic clergy of Ratisbon were heavily fined, while the latter were for the most part expelled and their domains sequestrated. The burghers were organized for defense, and the free and imperial city, so intimately associated with many notable vicissitudes in the history of the empire, was enrolled in the Heilbronn Alliance. Ratisbon, then, had not been relieved by Wallenstein, and no coals of fire had been heaped by him on the head of Maximilian of Bavaria for the action of the Diet held in that city three years before. How is the quiescence of Wallenstein, if quiescence it was, during the twelve months which had elapsed since the Battle of Lützen to be explained? For him, too, the situation had been changed by that battle and the death of Gustavus Adolphus. Hitherto he had committed no disloyal act, and had in all probability entertained no definitely disloyal intentions. His general scheme of policy had been to aid the emperor in his restoring the imperial authority and in bringing about a settlement which, while leaving that authority unimpaired, should be acceptable to the Protestant princes and include conditions favorable to his personal interests. No side, however, trusted him, because he was identified with no party or interest, because he was at any time ready to exchange combination for combination, and because, as his occasional abrupt and passionate utterances indicate, the outlines of his successive schemes were apt to lose themselves in the mists of a vague and boundless ambition. His withdrawal into Bohemia after the Battle of Lützen was hardly reconcilable with his official announcement of a complete imperialist victory, and his prestige as a general suffered in consequence. Indeed, there was gossip among the courtiers at Vienna as to his being superseded in the command. Fortunately for him, Bernard of Weimar had declined to follow the imperialist army, still numerically the stronger, into Bohemia. Thus, Wallenstein had time for augmenting his army at Prague and restoring its efficiency. In the campaigns of 1633, he seems to have intended to play a vigorous part, both by putting an end to the alliance between Saxony and Sweden, and by saving Breisach, and if possible recovering the Austrian lands in Elsass, a task which he had no intention of leaving the Spaniards to accomplish. Franconia and Bavaria, as well as the Weserlands, he proposed to leave more or less to themselves. Still, being unable to place in the field an army so preponderant in strength as to ensure success, and habitually preferring diplomatic to military measures in the first instance, he continued to keep in view the alternative of peace. 
He was probably quite sincere in telling Count Wartensleben, whom Christian IV of Denmark had sent to push negotiations for peace between Vienna and Dresden, quote, that he was growing old, was plagued by bad health and in want of rest, that he was quite satisfied with his present position, and that from the continuance of war he could look for no increase of reputation, rather for the contrary. Unquote. The emperor was duly informed of Wallenstein's views, and peace negotiations with Saxony and Brandenburg ensued, turning on the withdrawal of the Edict of Restitution and the Catholic interpretation of the Reservatum Ecclesiasticum on the rights of the Bohemian Protestants and on the restoration of the Elector Frederick's son in part, at least, of the Palatinate. The emperor would not hear of any concessions in Bohemia, but the negotiations continued with Wallenstein's cognizance and general approval, and it was well understood that in the meantime he would not molest Saxony, if her troops in return left Bohemia untouched. In all this, there was nothing either disloyal or illogical, but now there came into the web a strand of intrigue of which the importance cannot be mistaken. The involutions of Wallenstein's course of action and the motives which determined it often defy analysis. But there are certain connecting threads which, if the story is to be understood at all, must be throughout kept in view. Wallenstein, however wide the range of his statesmanship, was at all times sensible of the ties of nationality, family history, the associations of descent, and early life. He was born a Bohemian noble and bred an Utraquist. The leaders of the Bohemian insurrection, who after the catastrophe of the White Hill had become exiles from their country, had never abandoned the hope of re-establishing the ancient Bohemian constitution in church and state under an elected king of their own choice. As the star of this or that Protestant leader had been in the ascendant, his possible claims had been considered. Bethlen Gaber was thought of at one time, and even Mansfeld at another. Wallenstein's position differed widely from theirs. But he was a Bohemian magnate, and of Catholic intolerance at least there had never been any trace in his conduct. This had not been overlooked by the Swedes in their negotiations with Wallenstein, both before and after the death of Gustavus Adolphus. The Swedish troops in Silesia were in the main officered by Bohemian Protestant exiles, with Count Thurn at their head as royal commissary, and Bohemian agents in plenty were at hand to take part in secret negotiations, from Major General Bubna to Sezima Rezin, who in the end turned crown witness against Wallenstein and contributed more than any man to make the record of his last years a perplexing tangle of truth and fiction. Of a different type was Count William Kinski, a Bohemian noble who had contrived to preserve his ample estates from confiscation, but was obliged to reside at Dresden, the ordinary place of refuge for his exiled compatriots. He was brother-in-law to Count Adam Erdman Tritschka, another Bohemian noble, who had himself married a younger sister of Wallenstein's second wife, commanded a regiment under him, and enjoyed his confidence. Kinski kept himself closely informed of all Wallenstein's movements, and was consulted by Fouquier when, after influencing the deliberations at Heilbronn, April 1633, he paid a visit to Dresden. End of section 25section 26 of the cambridge modern history volume 4 the 30 years war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 7 wallenstein and bernard of weimar 1632 to 1635 by a w ward Part two. By the middle of May, and probably earlier, 
The Bohemian malcontents were in communication with Nikolai, the Swedish resident at Dresden, as to the revived project of placing Wallenstein on the Bohemian throne, which, on being reported to Oxenscherna, received his general approval. Hereupon, Kinski furnished Nikolai with a list of the commanders fully trusted by Wallenstein. Whether or not this list, in which both Hulk and Gaius figured, had been obtained at first hand, Wallenstein about this time actually had an interview with Bubna at Gitchen. It seems certain that Wallenstein here made no declaration as to his intentions with regard to the Bohemian crown, and that his present object was to become enabled by a junction between Turn's army and his own to dictate peace. There was, as yet, no question of his abandoning the emperor, but he obviously meant to leave both Saxony and Bavaria out in the cold. Oxenscherna, though he had no intention of binding himself, was prepared to carry on negotiations, like Gustavus Adolphus before him, in furtherance of the Bohemian project. But in the meantime, matters had assumed a different aspect in Silesia. Here, with the opening of the summer of 1633, some military action had become unavoidable, and in May, Wallenstein began operations against the combined army of Saxons, Brandenburgers, and Swedes. Their commander, Arnim, had, as has been seen, always advocated an accommodation with the emperor, and was practically the head of the peace party at the Saxon court. But Wallenstein had a special reason for desiring not to prolong the campaign which he had just begun. Official news had reached him from Vienna that Feria, instead of merely passing through the western borderlands of the empire, was to be instructed to operate there against the French, and that Aldringer was to be placed under his supreme command. Thus, not only was Spain to control Alsace, but Wallenstein's own position as generalissimo of all imperialist and Spanish troops in the empire was to be impaired. Early in June, when a decisive battle was supposed to be imminent between Wallenstein and Arnim, a fortnight's truce was agreed upon between them, to the bitter disappointment of the Bohemians. Fouquier, who had been intriguing to secure the Saxon army for France, began to fear that Wallenstein intended to attack Bavaria, and Richelieu, as well as Oxenscherna, came to the conclusion that any agreement with Wallenstein must be conditional upon his open abandonment of the emperor. But, although in the concessions which he offered as to the Palatinate Wallenstein went beyond the emperor's wishes, and although he placed no restraint upon his cavils against the Jesuits and their religious policy, the negotiations which he carried on with Arnim during the truce had the emperor's distinct sanction. Had they been successful, Wallenstein might possibly have, in the end, without either France and Bavaria or Spain, have dictated a peace which would have brought back the empire to a condition of things resembling that before 1618. But, though Brandenburg was willing, John George of Saxony, who hoped with the aid of Denmark to settle matters in his own way at a composition meeting to be summoned to Breslau, was not to be persuaded. When, after the truce had come to an end, Wallenstein, notwithstanding his superiority in numbers, went on negotiating with Arnim, July, the court of Vienna no longer heeded protests made by him against Feria's march. If, therefore, Wallenstein still meant to impose a pacific settlement at the head of an overpowering military force, he had no time to lose. Hulk's renewed raid into the Voigtland, the southwestern part of the Saxon electorate, which was even more savage than the first, and in the course of which he contrived to frighten the Leipzigers out of their wits, seems to have been intended by his chief to prevent a Saxon invasion of Bohemia, and it was only his fear of Bernard of Weimar's marching against him at the elector of Saxony's request that caused Hulk to withdraw his army, which was suffering terribly from the plague. On his way back to Bohemia, Hulk, who had not yet completed his fortieth year, fell a victim to the disease at Adorf, September 19, 
and the most faithful of Wallenstein's lieutenants was inopportunely lost to the commander-in-chief, to whom in his own phrase he belonged. His place was ill-supplied by Gaius. On September 19, Arnim, as to the course of whose latest negotiations with Wallenstein nothing is known, reached Gelnhausen, near Hanau, whither Oxenschirna had come from Frankfurt to meet him. Arnim's account to the Swedish Chancellor of Wallenstein's view of the situation was that the Emperor had always aimed at a separate peace with Saxony and her German allies, but this Sweden could not allow Saxony to accept. On the other hand, Wallenstein himself would not submit to a repetition, with Spanish aid, of the Ratisbon proceedings of 1630. He was not quite sure of all his officers, but had already removed some whom he could not trust. If Sweden would support him, he would break with the emperor, lead his army after uniting it to the Swedish force from Silesia into Bohemia, and invade Austria. France, with whose ambassador Arnim avoided contact at Gelnhausen, was to be induced by Sweden to resume the offensive against Spain in Italy. Although the complement and crown of these vast designs, the accession of Wallenstein to the Bohemian throne, remained as yet unmentioned, they suggest the inspiration of Thurn and his Bohemian fellow partisans, and, indeed, they breathe the spirit of Anhalt and of the early years of the war. They were received with approval by Oxenschirna, though with his usual caution he, for the present, made no change in his course of action. The Swedish diplomatists at Dresden and Berlin mistrusted Wallenstein, and Bernard of Weimar shrewdly questioned whether his control over his army was such that he could induce it to abandon the emperor. But Arnim, though even he had his doubts, persuaded the electors of Saxony and Brandenburg to unite their armies in Silesia with Wallenstein's. The armies under Arnim's command were to meet for a general muster on October 11, and he had pointed out to Oxenschirna that a junction of the Saxons and Brandenburgers with Wallenstein's troops would not signify a rupture between Saxony and Sweden. But just before the intended juncture, Duval, who, under turn, commanded the Swedish force in Silesia, refused to move without direct instructions from the Chancellor or from Stettin. And Arnim found to his dismay and indignation that Wallenstein himself had taken up a new attitude, and one in the circumstances more incomprehensible than ever. He now refused to join the Saxons and Brandenburgers unless their common action were directed against the Swedes, or if Duke Francis Albert of Lauenburg's report of a passionate altercation between him and Wallenstein is authentic, against the enemies of the empire, the Swedes and the Bavarians, October. The reasons for this extraordinary change are unknown. Not long before this, September, Wallenstein must have received a memorandum, written in Kinski's hand at the dictation of Fouquier, in which he was urged to make common cause with the emperor's foes, now stronger than ever, thanks to the League of Heilbronn, and with their aid to place the crown of Bohemia upon his head. As about this time he seems to have positively declined to enter into any dealings with France, so he drew back from alliance with Sweden and the immediate rupture with the Emperor. He was, in short, not prepared to sacrifice the strength of his personal position by attaching himself to either of the foreign powers and enabling them to pursue their own ambitious policy. Yet how could he, without the alliance of one or both of them, force the emperor to a peace which would either satisfy the Protestants or meet his personal ends. By seeking to play a double game, he was accomplishing nothing, and at the same time making himself so generally distrusted that, as Irmer well puts it, when at last he determined to break with the emperor, not one of the emperor's adversaries would credit his intention. Arnim, having refused Wallenstein's demand that the Saxons should march with him to the Rhine, a movement which in any case would hardly have been executed so late in the year, negotiations between them were entirely broken off. But Wallenstein still seems to have cherished hopes of bringing about a peace with Saxony and Brandenburg, from which the Swedes should be excluded. 
and to this end resolved on driving them from Silesia. In October, the Swedish camp at Steinau capitulated to him. A large proportion of the 6,000 troops, according to the easy fashion of the age, accepting service under his standard. Count Thurn, who had been taken prisoner, was liberated by Ballenstein without ransom, and his long political career was now virtually at an end. Liegnitz and Glogau followed suit, and very soon Silesia was clear of all Swedish soldiery. Wallenstein, instead of taking heed of the sore straits of his old adversary, the Elector of Bavaria, hereupon proceeded to put pressure upon Brandenburg and Saxony. His forces invaded Brandenburg, where Frankfurt on the Oder and other places speedily surrendered, and he then advanced into Lusatia, as far as Görlitz and Bautzen, while in the rear of Arnim, whose army had withdrawn to the neighborhood of Dresden, Gaius approached with the force formerly commanded by Hulk, November. The effect of these successes was undoubtedly great. Once more, it seemed as if Wallenstein were about to become the arbiter of northern Germany, and as if his desire of bringing about an equitable political and religious peace for the empire at large were after all to be realized. Victory was the best assurance of the fidelity of his army, and, with this assured, his dictatorship must become irresistible. But at this point, when it was too late to save Ratisbon from the approach of Bernard of Weimar, the emperor joined in solicitations with Maximilian of Bavaria, and Wallenstein gave way. Leaving Gaius with 4,000 men at light merits, he started on November 18 with the bulk of his army to meet Bernard of Weimar, whose advance upon Ratisbon he had insisted upon disbelieving. Undeceived by the news of its fall, he hoped for a moment either to retake it or, by intercepting Bernard's march along the line of the Danube upon Passau, to prevent him from invading Upper Austria and even menacing Vienna. Ordering Baron de Suisse to post himself with a couple of regiments in Upper Austria, Wallenstein directed his own march upon the Upper Palatinate, where he halted at Fürth, in an angle between the Bohemian and Bavarian frontiers, in order to take Cham, about ten miles further south, where lay a small Swedish garrison. End of November. Bernard of Weimar, delighted to have drawn Wallenstein at last, and believing that Gaius, with his whole division, had reinforced the garrison of Passau, was retracing his steps in order to relieve Cham, when the astounding news reached him that Wallenstein had given up the investment of Cham and led his army back into Bohemia. The immediate reason for this movement, one of the most perplexing of all the shifts and turns in Wallenstein's career, seems to have been that, with Arnim advancing on the Oder and the Swedish Marshal Kniphausen advancing from the Weser, he feared for his own rear. Moreover, the season was certainly far advanced. Bernard, on learning that Wallenstein had returned to Bohemia, himself fell back upon Ratisbon. When, hereupon, Feria and Aldringer approached to carry out the protection of Bavaria, which Wallenstein had abandoned, Horn, instead of uniting with Bernard against them, maneuvered separately in the rear of Feria's advance. In the end, the Spanish Bavarian forces took up their winter quarters to the southwest of the Great Lakes, which themselves lie southwest of Munich and Horn led his own force into southern Schwabia. The line of the Danube still remained in Bernard's hands. It was while thus holding the, their ground, with the western section of their adversaries between their own two armies, that the Swedes received the news of the catastrophe of Wallenstein. At Vienna, the indignation aroused against Wallenstein by his retreat had passed all bounds, the partisans of Bavaria and Spain were up in arms against him, and his decision to let his army winter in the emperor's own lands instead of in Franconia and Thuringia. Even Eggenberg, hitherto Wallenstein's best friend at court, declared, Amicus Socrates, Amicus Plato, Amicior autum religio et patria. The emperor himself, complaining that he seemed to have another sovereign by his side, issued an order 
bidding Wallenstein return at once into Bavaria, and refused point-blank his request that the defense of the electorate should be committed to Aldringer with the part of Feria's troops. At the same time, Suisse was instructed to move back towards the inn. Finally, two imperial councillors, Trautmannsdorf and Questenberg, were sent to Wallenstein in his camp at Pilsen to impress upon him the emperor's categorical commands. Wallenstein could not but recognize that a crisis had been reached in his relations with the emperor and the imperial government. With Count Schlick, the president of the Hofkriegsrat, he had for some time been on unfriendly terms, and he had another influential adversary in Bern von Stadion, the Grand Master of the German Order. Together with Eggenberg, Bishop Anton of Vienna was passing into the ranks of his opponents, who continued to be urged on by the Jesuits, and in particular by the Emperor's Walloon confessor, Father Lamarmain. Maximilian of Bavaria was well served by his ambassador Richel, whose correspondence with his master supplies much information as to the course of things at Vienna. All these agencies, as Wallenstein knew, were at work to break down his absolute authority as commander-in-chief, on which the whole strength of his position and political influence depended. But most formidable of all was the influence of Spain, represented at Vienna by Castaneda, and from October 1633 also by Oñate, whose efforts were systematically directed towards bringing about a joint action between the two Habsburg courts not less intimate and more effective than that which he had negotiated at the beginning of the war. The circumstances of the times were propitious, for an heir had recently, September 8th, been born to the young King Ferdinand of Hungary and his Spanish consort Maria Anna, and the dynastic interests of the two lines seemed more closely blended than ever. But Wallenstein had persistently withstood the proposal of levying an army in the empire to fight on the Rhine under Spanish direction, and he would not even listen to the young king's wish to hold a command in the imperial forces. The policy of Spain ran directly counter to Wallenstein's, while the latter aimed at an equitable peace in the empire, the former was wholly directed to uniting Austria with Spain in the war against France. The commander in such a war could not be Wallenstein, who was, among many other things, accused of having entered into treasonable correspondence with Richelieu. The Bavarian ambassador had already suggested to the emperor that the obnoxious general should be removed from the stream command. Oñate now threatened that unless this were done, the Spanish subsidies would be stopped, and at the same time, no doubt, the private pensions paid under Olivares' reckless system of expenditure, not only to the king of Hungary, who was wholly in the Spanish interest, but also to other personages of note. Before the close of the year, the emperor sent secret communications to Gaius, Aldringer, and some of the commanders in Moravia, but the purport of these remains unknown. It seems to have been while Trautmannsdorf and Questenberg were still awaiting Wallenstein's answer at Pilsen that the young king of Hungary's confessor, Father Quiroga, one of the Capuchin diplomatists, proposed to the commander-in-chief, by way of testing his intentions, that he should send a division of 6,000 horse to Alsace to accompany the Cardinal Anfant on his march to the Netherlands. In Pilsen, rumors were rife that Wallenstein intended to resign his command, Indeed, he had talked in this vein to Quiroga, though probably only by way of a ruse. He had, in any case, made up his mind to yield neither to the unwarranted orders of the emperor nor to Quiroga's insulting suggestion. Acting strictly within his rights, he sent explicit orders to Suisse not to move. Then, on January 11, 1634, he, notwithstanding Trautmannsdorf's protests, called together a council of war consisting of his principal commanders. About fifty attended, including Piccolomini, Gaius and Aldringer were not at Pilsen, and Field Marshal Illo laid the imperial demands before the meeting on Wallenstein's behalf, and stating his intentions, as matters stood, to resign. The commanders declared the imperial demands impracticable, and sent two successive deputations to Wallenstein, entreating him to remain. On January 12, he consented, and on the same day, at a banquet given by Illo, a resolution, Schluss, 
of inviolable fidelity to him was signed by the commanders in the midst of a drunken uproar. According to Añate, a clause in the copy of this resolution first shown to the officers, which limited their oath of fidelity by the words, quote, so long as he remains in the emperor's service, unquote, was struck out by Wallenstein with his own hand. Clearly, the resolution would have been of little use to him had the clause remained in it. Basing his refusal on this resolution, and on the fact that the safety of the emperor and his house depended on the preservation of the army, Wallenstein apprised the imperial commissioners that the winter quarters of his troops must be mainly in Bohemia, Silesia, Moravia, and Upper Austria. The resolution of the commanders was circulated for further signatures in Austria and Silesia, and also sent to Dresden, for the idea of a peace with the Protestant electors, which so late as December had still found favor at Vienna, was still uppermost with Wallenstein. During January he was, through Kinski, whom the emperor had now allowed to reside on his Bohemian estates, and then through other agencies, and to some extent with the emperor's cognizance, seeking to reopen direct negotiations with Arnim, who in his turn had persuaded both the electors to seek a pacific settlement through Wallenstein if it could not be obtained direct through the emperor. But Wallenstein was at the same time seeking through his secret agents to ascertain from Oxenscherna and Fouquier what sacrifices would content Sweden and France respectively in the event of a pacification. As yet he had formed no design of treason, or of cooperation with Sweden, and still less with France, but he clearly meant to force the emperor's hand. While thus the Protestant electors, and even the cautious Oxenscherna, continued to recognize Wallenstein's importance for a possible settlement, and Richelieu's agent had not ceased to hold out to him the prospect of the Bohemian crown, his own position was gradually being undermined. We cannot say how and to what extent the fidelity of Gaius, Piccolomini, and Aldringer to their chief had already been tampered with before the final step was taken, but it can hardly have been a surprise to Gaius. Before the end of the year, 1633, the emperor had appointed a secret commission to consult about the measures to be taken against Wallenstein. It consisted of Eggenberg, Trautmannsdorf, and the bishop of Vienna. Onyate, who had made up his mind that everything depended upon not allowing Wallenstein to leap the ditch, i.e., settled the problem by his own action, was, with the king of Hungary, admitted to the sittings of the commission, and hinted at the most expeditious way out of the difficulty. The news of the Pilsen resolution, by which Wallenstein had hoped to safeguard his position, finally made it untenable. On January 24, a patent, perhaps post-dated, was drawn up, which deposed Wallenstein and appointed the king of Hungary commander-in-chief of the imperial armies, while absolving all superior and inferior officers from their obedience to Wallenstein and assigning independent commands to Gaius and Aldringer. The patent also referred to the dismissal and penal prosecution of two of Wallenstein's chief officers, Trichka and Illo being those intended, and named Piccolomini and Coloredo as field marshals. This patent was not as yet made public, but on February 3rd and 4th it was communicated through Valmarode to Piccolomini and Aldringer, and doubtless also to Gaius. These men had no doubt been in some measure prepared for what was to follow. But it was not till they were made acquainted with the patent, and with the verbal instructions brought by Valmarode, that they began to look the situation in the face. Piccolomini, coolly proposing to arrest or kill Arnim and Francis Albert if they should come to negotiate at Pilsen. Still, Though the necessary measures seemed to have been left by the anxious emperor to the generals, there was much hesitation on their part, due partly to the belief that the army as a whole would adhere to Wallenstein, partly to a faint hope that Wallenstein might peaceably throw up the command. Aldringer, having paid a visit to Vienna, had been informed there, through Agnate, that the imperial instructions were to seize Wallenstein dead or alive, the three generals formed a secret plan to arrest him at Pilsen. But the design broke down, and Aldringer preferred not to re-enter the town. On February 13, Gaius, and on the 17th, Piccolomini, took their departure, leaving behind them a general order declaring Wallenstein's command and those of Trichka and Illo vacant 
and referring the commanding officers of the army to themselves and Aldringer for directions. After their departure, this order was transmitted to the commanding officers, a copy having been already on the 15th sent to the garrison at Prague. On February 18, a second patent was issued from Vienna, although, like the first, it did not bear the imperial signature, denouncing the resolution of the commanders at Pilsen as a plot against the emperor, confirming the deposition of the late commander-in-chief as guilty of a design to seize and despoil the emperor and his house of their hereditary kingdoms and crowns, and to extirpate the house of Austria. At the same time, a commission was secretly appointed for the confiscation of all the estates of Wallenstein, Illo, and Trischka. Two days later, a second resolution was signed by the commanders at Pilsen, who, this time, however, numbered not more than thirty. One of the generals, Diodati, had already taken his departure without orders. This resolution was in response to Wallenstein's promise to relieve them of their commands should he, which had never entered into his mind, undertake aught against the emperor, and to his declaration that he desired to secure himself against the machinations of his adversaries. It promised that the signatories, should he remain with the army, would hold out by him to the last. Wallenstein sent word of this resolution to Vienna, intending himself to march on Prague, there carry through the negotiations with Arnim, and conclude peace with Saxony. He believed himself still strong enough to force the emperor to do his bidding, but sought to keep open a door of retreat by a series of messages of which one, offering to resign the command if no force were used against him, was actually delivered to Ferdinand by the duke's cousin Maximilian von Wallenstein. At the same time, he sent Francis Albert of Lauenburg to Bernard of Weimar at Ratisbon, requesting the Swedish general to move a few thousand horse to the Bohemian frontier. But while he was thus seeking to safeguard himself front and rear, the ground crumbled away under his feet. On February 24, 1634, the whole of Wallenstein's army was to have assembled on the White Hill at Prague, there, on conditions which still remain untold, to dictate peace. Before that day arrived, if an insignificant movement in Wallenstein's favor in Silesia be left out of the account, the whole of that army had fallen away from him, with the exception of Illo's and Trichka's regiments. The garrison of Prague, upon which troops had been concentrated even before the issue of the patent, set the example by renouncing its obedience. The commanding officers, returning to their various stations from Pilsen, heard the news, and the defection set in. At Pilsen, Wallenstein announced to the officers around him that he proposed to muster all his forces at Laon, near the Saxon frontier, and bade them meet him in person at Eger, whither he was about to proceed. Fresh messages were sent to Bernard of Weimar, who received these overtures very coolly, both suspecting their authenticity and doubting the fidelity of Wallenstein's troops. Nor did he advance upon Bohemia till all was over. On February 24, Wallenstein held his entry into Eger, Trichka's and Illo's regiments pitching their tents round the place. Baffled and abandoned, Wallenstein deceived himself even as to the fidelity of those upon whom his personal security at Eger depended. The chief officers of the fortress, Gordon and Leslie, were two Protestant Scotchmen, whose sense of military honor seems to have revolted against the arguments pressed on them by Trichka and Illo. At a banquet given by Gordon to the officers, Kinski, Trichka, and Illo were massacred. After a last hesitation whether it would suffice to arrest the traitor-in-chief, it was resolved to kill him. And some of Butler's Irish dragoons, with their Captain Devereux in command, accomplished the deed. February 25th. Francis Albert of Lauenburg, returning from his bootless errand to Bernard of Weimar, was taken prisoner. So were Colonel von Schlieff, who had been sent to warn Wallenstein's faithful adherent General von Schafgotsch in Silesia, with Schafgotsch himself, and Wallenstein's Chancellor Eltz. All the threads of the great politician's intrigues were severed, and the whole of his mighty army had fallen away from the famous commander who had created it. He died as an outlawed traitor. No personality occupies a place in the history of the Thirty Years' War at once so characteristic of that war, and so unique in itself as that of Wallenstein. But his greatness, if such it was, 
lies not in his achievements, either as a creator or as a leader of armies, though this general without victories both crushed Mansfeld and foiled Gustavus, nor does it lie in his consummate insight and capacity as a politician, who could use all circumstances and all conjunctures, and would not permit himself to be used by any of his fellow players in the game. It lies rather in the innermost purposes of his statesmanship, and above all in his supreme ambition to become the pacificator of the empire, in the interests of that empire as a whole, and to liberate it both from the encroachments of the foreigner and from the internal dominion of the reaction. Herein he showed a far-sightedness due to the inspiration of a grand self-reliance rather than to communings with the stars. The peace of Prague, as will be seen, differed from the settlement which Wallenstein would have concluded on behalf of, or even without, the emperor. But he was fully justified as against that emperor and his Spanish and Bavarian allies by the treaties with France and Sweden enforced at Münster and Osnabrück and of which the bitterness remained with the empire for many generations. Moreover, the gain for religious freedom secured by the peace which ended the war could not have been achieved had Wallenstein's sword, when the issues of the conflict so largely depended upon it, been thrown into the scale of an uncompromising intolerance. End of section 26